William Morrow and Harper Audio present City on Fire, a novel by Don Winslow, performed by Ari Fliakos. Then at last, I saw it all, all Ilium settling into her embers. Virgil, the Aeneid, Book Two. Part One Pasco Ferries Clambake, Goshen Beach, Rhode Island, August 1986. Take your meal now. We prepare for combat. Homer, the Iliad. Book Two. One. Danny Ryan watches the woman come out of the water like a vision emerging from his dreams of the sea. Except she's real, and she's going to be trouble. Women that beautiful usually are. Danny knows that. What he doesn't know is just how much trouble she's really going to be. If he knew that, knew everything that was going to happen, he might have walked into the water and held her head under until she stopped moving. But he doesn't know that. So, the bright sun striking his face, Danny sits on the sand out in front of Pasco's beach house and checks her out from behind the cover of his sunglasses. Blonde hair, deep blue eyes, and a body that the black bikini does more to accentuate than conceal. Her stomach is taut and flat, her legs muscled and sleek. You don't see her 15 years from now with wide hips and a big ass from the potatoes in the Sunday gravy. The woman comes out of the water, her skin glistening with sunshine and salt. Terry Ryan digs an elbow into her husband's ribs. What? Danny asks, all mock innocent. I see you checking her out, Terry says. They're all checking her out. Him, Pat and Jimmy, and the wives too, Sheila, Angie, and Terry. Can't say I blame you, Terry says. That rack. Nice talk, Danny says. Yeah, with what you are thinking? Terry asks. I ain't thinking nothing. I got you nothing for you right here, Terry says, moving her right hand up and down. She sits up on her towel to get a better view of the woman. If I had boobs like that, I'd wear a bikini too. Terry's wearing a one-piece black number. Danny thinks she looks good in it. I like your boobs, Danny says. Good answer. Danny watches the beautiful woman as she picks up a towel and dries herself off. She must put in a lot of time at the gym, he thinks. Takes care of herself. He bet she works in sales. Something pricey. Luxury cars or maybe real estate or investments. What guy is going to say no to her, try to bargain her down, look cheap in front of her? Isn't going to happen. Danny watches her walk away. Like a dream you wake up from and you don't want to wake up, it's such a good dream. Not that he got much sleep last night, and now he's tired. They hit a truckload of Armani suits, him and Pat and Jimmy McNeese way the hell up in Western Mass., Piece of cake, an inside job Peter Moretti set them up with. The driver was clued in. Everyone did the dance so no one got hurt. But still, it was a long drive, and they got back to the shore just as the sun was coming up. That's okay, Terry says, lying back on her towel. You let it get you all hot and bothered for me. Terry knows her husband loves her. And anyway, Danny Ryan is faithful like a dog. He don't have it in him to cheat. She don't mind he looks at other women as long as he brings it home to her. A lot of married guys, they need some strange every once in a while, but Danny don't. Even if he did, he'd feel too guilty. They've even joked about it. You'd confess to the priest, Terry said. You'd confess to me. You'd probably take an ad out in the paper to confess. She's right, Danny thinks, as he reaches over and strokes Terry's thigh with the back of his index finger signaling that she's right about something else, that he is hot and bothered, that it's time to go back to the cottage. Terry brushes his hand away, but not too hard. 
She's horny too, feeling the sun, the warm sand on her skin, and the sexual energy brought by the new woman. It's in the air, they both feel it. Something else too. Restlessness? Danny wonders. Discontent? Like this sexy woman comes out of the sea and suddenly they're not quite satisfied with their lives. I'm not, Danny thinks. Every August they come down from Dogtown to Goshen Beach because that's what their fathers did and they don't know to do anything else. Danny and Terry, Jimmy and Angie Mack, Pat and Sheila Murphy, Liam Murphy with his girl of the moment. They rent the little cottages across the road from the beach, so close to each other you can hear your neighbors sneeze or lean out the window to borrow something for the kitchen. But that's what makes it fun, the closeness. None of them would know what to do with solitude. They grew up in the same Providence neighborhood their parents did, went to school there, are still there, see each other almost every day and go down to Goshen on vacation together. Dogtown by the sea, they call it. Danny always thinks the ocean should be to the east, but knows that the beach actually faces south and runs in a gentle arc west about a mile to Mashinook Point, where some larger houses perch precariously on a low bluff above the rocks. To the south, 14 miles out in the open ocean, sits Block Island, visible on most clear days. During the summer season, ferries run all day and into the night from the docks at Gilead, the fishing village just across the channel. Danny, he used to go out to Block Island all the time, not on the ferry, but back before he was married when he was working the fishing boats. Sometimes, if Dick Souza was in a good mood, they'd pull into New Harbor and grab a beer before making the run home. Those were good days, going after the swordfish with Dick, and Danny misses them. Misses the little cottage he rented behind Aunt Betty's clam shack, even though it was drafty and colder than shit in the winter. Mrs. walking down to the bar at the Harbor Inn to have a drink with the fishermen and listen to their stories, learn their wisdom. Misses the physical work that made him feel strong and clean. He was 19 and strong and clean, and now he ain't none of those things. A layer of fat has grown around his middle, and he ain't sure he could throw a harpoon or haul in a net. You look at Danny now, in his late 20s. His broad shoulders make him appear a little shorter than his six feet and his thick brown hair, tinged with red, gives him a low forehead that makes him look a little less smart than he really is. Danny sits on the sand and looks at the water with a yearning. The most he does now is go in and have a swim or body surf if there are any waves, which is unusual in August unless there's a hurricane brewing. Danny misses the ocean when he's not here. It gets in your blood, like you got salt water running through you. The fishermen Danny knows love the sea and hate it, say it's like a cruel woman who hurts you over and over again, but you keep going back to her anyway. Sometimes he thinks maybe he should go back to fishing, but there's no money in it. Not anymore, with all the government regulations and the Japanese and Russian factory ships sitting 13 miles off the coast and taking up all the cod and the tuna and the flounder and the government don't do shit about them. Just keeps its thumb on the local guy because it can. So now Danny just comes down from Providence in August with the rest of the gang. Mornings they get up late, eat breakfast in their cottages, then cross the road and spend the day gathered on the beach in front of Pasco's place, one of about a dozen clabbered houses set on concrete pylons near the breakwater on the east end of Goshen Beach. They set up beach chairs or just lie on towels and the women sip wine coolers and read magazines and chat while the men drink beer or throw in a fishing line. There's always a nice little crowd there, Pasco and his wife and kids and grandkids, and the whole Moretti crew, Peter and Paul Moretti, Sal Antonucci, Tony Romano, Chris Palumbo, and wives and kids. Always a lot of people dropping by, coming in and out, having a good time. Rainy days, they sit in the cottages and do jigsaw puzzles, play cards, take naps, shoot the shit, listen to the Sox broadcasters jaw their way through the rain delay, or maybe drive into the main town two miles inland and see a movie, or get an ice cream, or pick up some groceries. Nights, they barbecue on the strips of lawn between the cottages, 
usually pooling their resources, grill hamburgers and hot dogs. Or maybe during the day, one of the guys walks over to the docks to see what's fresh, and that night they grill tuna or bluefish or boil some lobsters. Other nights, they walk down to Dave's dock, sit at a table out on the big deck that overlooks Gilead across the narrow bay. Dave's doesn't have a liquor license, so they bring their own bottles of wine and beer, and Danny loves sitting out there watching the fishing boats, the lobster men, or the Block Island Ferry come in as he eats chowder and fish and chips and greasy clam cakes. It's pretty and peaceful out there as the sun softens and the water glows in the dusk. Some nights they just walk home after dinner, gather in each other's cottages for more cards and conversations. Other times maybe they drive over to Mashinock Point, where there's a bar, the Spindrift. Sit and have a few drinks and listen to some local bar band. Maybe dance a little, maybe not. But usually the whole gang ends up there and it's always a lot of laughs until closing time. If they feel more ambitious, they pile into cars and drive over to Gilead, 50 yards by water but 14 miles by road, where there are some larger bars that almost pass for clubs and where the Moretti's don't expect and never receive a drink bill. Then they go home to their cottages and Danny and Terry either pass out or mess around and then pass out and wake up late and do it all over again. I need some more loche, Terry says now, handing him the tube. Danny sits up, squeezes a glob of the suntan lotion onto his hands and starts to work it onto her freckled shoulders. Terry burns easy with that Irish skin. Black hair, violet eyes, and skin like a porcelain teacup. The Ryans are darker skinned, and Danny's old man, Marty, says that's because they got Spanish blood in them. From when that armada sank back there, some of them Spanish sailors made it to shore and did the deed. They're all black Irish anyway, northerners like most of the mix who landed in Providence. Hard men from the stony soil and constant defeat of Donegal. Except, Danny thinks, the Murphys are doing pretty good for themselves now. Then he feels guilty thinking that, because Pat Murphy's been his best friend since they were in diapers, not to mention now their brothers-in-law. Sheila Murphy lifts her arms, yawns, and says, I'm gonna go back, take a shower, do my nails, girly stuff. She gets up from her blanket and brushes the sand off her legs. Angie gets up too. Like Pat is the leader of the men, Sheila is the boss of the wives. They take their cues from her. She looks down at Pat and asks, You coming? Danny looks at Pat and they both smile. The couples are all going back to have sex and no one's even being subtle about it. The cottages are going to be busy places this afternoon. Danny's sad that summer is coming to an end. He always is. The end of summer means the end of the long, slow days. The lingering sunsets, the rented beach cottages, the beers, the fun, the laughs, the clam bakes. It's back to Providence. Back to the docks, back to work. Home to their little apartment on the top floor of a gabled three-decker in the city, one of the thousands of old tenement buildings that went up all over New England in the height of the mill and factory days, when they were needed to provide cheap housing for the Italian, Jewish, and Irish workers. The mills and factories are mostly gone, but the three-story houses survive and still have a little of the lower-class reputation about them. Danny and Terry have a small living room, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom with a small porch out the back and windows on every side, which is nice. It ain't much. Danny hopes to buy them a real house someday. But it's enough for now, and it ain't so bad. Mrs. Costigan on the floor below is a quiet old lady, and the owner, Mr. Riley, lives on the ground floor, so he keeps everything pretty shipshape. Still in all, Danny thinks about getting out of there. Maybe out of Providence altogether. Maybe we should move someplace where it's summer all the time, he said to Terry just the night before. Like where? she asked. California, maybe? She laughed at him. California? We got no family in California. I got a second cousin or something in San Diego. That's not really family, Terry says. Yeah, maybe that's the point, Danny thinks now. Maybe it would be good to go somewhere they don't have all those obligations. The birthday parties, the first communions, the mandatory Sunday dinners. But he knows it won't happen. Terry is too attached to her large family, and his old man needs him. 
Nobody ever leaves Dogtown. Or if they do, they come back. Danny did. Now he wants to go back to the cottage. He wants to get laid, and then he wants a nap. Danny could use a little sleep, feel fresh for Pasco Ferry's clam bake. Two. Terry's in no mood for preliminaries. She walks into the little bedroom, closes the drapes, and pulls the bedspread down. Then she peels off her bathing suit and lets it drop on the floor. Usually she showers when she gets back from the beach so she don't get sand and salt in the bed. Usually makes Danny do the same, but now she don't care. She digs her thumbs into the waistband of his swimming trunks, smiles and says, Yeah, you worked up from that bitch on the beach. You too. Maybe I'm bi, she teases. Oh, feel you when I said that. Feel you. I want you in me. Terry comes quickly. She usually does. She used to be embarrassed by it, thought it made her a whore. But later, when she talked to Sheila and Angie, they told her how lucky she was. Now she jacks her hips, works hard to make him come, and says, Don't think about her. I'm not. I won't. Tell me when you're going to. It's a ritual. Every time since they first did it, she wants to know when he's about to come. And now when he feels it building, he tells her, and she asks, as she always does, Is it good? Is it good? So good. She holds him tight until his thrusting stops, then leaves her hands on his back, and Danny feels when her body gets sleepy and heavy, and he rolls off. He sleeps for just a few minutes and then wakes up and lies beside her. He loves her like life. And not like some people think because she's John Murphy's daughter. John Murphy is an Irish king, like the O'Neills in the old country. Holds court in the back room of the Glockamora pub like it's Tara. He's been the boss of Dogtown since Danny's dad, Marty, fell into the bottom of the bottle and the Murphy family took over from the Ryans. Yeah, Danny thinks. I could have been Pat or Liam, except I'm not. Instead of being a prince, Danny is some kind of minor duke or something. He always gets picked in the shape-ups without having to pay off the dock bosses, and Pat sees that other kind of work comes his way from time to time. Longshoremen borrow from the Murphys to pay off the bosses and can't catch up, or they put the paycheck on a basketball game that goes the wrong way. Then Danny, who's a strapping lad in the words of John Murphy, pays them a visit. He tries to do it at the bar or on the street so as not to embarrass them in front of their families, upset their wives, scare their kids. But there are times when he has to go to their homes, and Daddy hates that. Usually a word to the wise is enough, and they work out some kind of payment plan. But some of them are just plain deadbeats and booze hounds who drink up the payments and the rent, and then Danny has to rough them up a little. He isn't a leg breaker, though. That stuff rarely happens anyway. A man with a broken stick can't work, and a man who can't work can't make any kind of payment at all, not on the vig, never mind the principal. So Danny might hurt them, but he doesn't hurt them bad. So he picks up some extra coin that way, and then there's the cargo he helps walk off the dock, and the trucks that he and Pat and Jimmy Mack sometimes take on the dark road from Boston to Providence. They work with the Morettis on those jobs, getting the word and the nod from the brothers and then taking the trucks down, the tax-free cigarettes going into the Moretti vending machines, the booze going to Moretti-protected clubs or the Glock or other bars in Dogtown. Suits like they took last night get sold out the trunks of cars in Dogtown, and the Morettis get their cut. Everybody wins except the insurance companies, and fuck them. They charge you up the ass anyway and then raise your rates if you have an accident. So Danny makes a living, but nothing like the Murphys, who get points from the dock bosses, the no-show wharf jobs, the loan shark ops, the gambling and the kickbacks that come from the 10th Ward, which includes Dogtown. Danny gets some crumbs from all that, but he don't sit at the big table in the back room with the Murphys. It's embarrassing. Even Peter Moretti said something to him about it. They were walking down the beach together the other day when Peter said, no offense, Danny, but as your friend, I can't help but wonder. Wonder what, Peter? With you marrying the daughter and all, Peter said. We all figured you'd get a little boost up, you know what I mean? 
Danny felt the heat rise to his cheeks. Thinking about the Moretti crew sitting around the vending machine office on Federal Hill, playing cards, sipping espressos, shooting the shit. Danny didn't like it his name came up, especially not about this. He didn't know what to say to Peter. Truth was, he'd figured he'd get a boost too, but it hadn't happened. He expected his father-in-law to have taken him into the back room of the Glock for a chat, put his arm around him and given him a piece of the street action, a card game, a seat at the table, something. I don't like the push, Danny finally said. Peter nodded and looked past Danny out at the horizon, where Block Island seemed to float like a low cloud. Don't get me wrong, I love Pat like a brother, but I don't know, sometimes I think the Murphys... Well, you know, because it used to be the Ryans, didn't it? Maybe they're afraid to move you up. You might have thoughts of restoring the old dynasty. And if you and Terry have a boy, a Murphy and a Ryan, I mean, come on. I just want to make a living. Don't we all? Peter laughed, and he let it drop. Danny knew that Peter was making onions. He liked Peter, considered him a friend. But Peter was going to be Peter, and Danny had to admit there was some truth to what Peter said. He'd thought it too, that old man Murphy was shutting him out because he was afraid of the Ryan name. Danny don't mind it so much with Pat, a good guy and a hard worker who runs the docks well and doesn't lord it over anyone. Pat's a natural leader, and Danny, well, if he's being honest with himself, is a natural follower. He don't want to lead the family, take his father's place. He loves Pat and would follow him to hell with a squirt gun. Kids from Dogtown, they've been together forever. Him and Pat and Jimmy. St. Brendan's Elementary, then St. Brendan's High School. They played hockey together, got slaughtered by the French-Canadian kids from Mount St. Charles. They played basketball together, got slaughtered by the black kids at Southie. Didn't matter they got slaughtered. They played tough and didn't back down from nobody. They ate most suppers together, sometimes at Jimmy's, mostly at Pat's. Pat's mom, Catherine, would call them to the table like they were one person. Pat, Danny, Jimmy! Down the street across the little backyards. Pat, Danny, Jimmy, supper! When there was no food at home because Marty was too drunk to get it together, Danny would sit at the big Murphy table and have pot roast and boiled potatoes, spaghetti and meatballs, always fish and chips on Friday, even after the Pope said it was okay to eat meat. With no real family of his own, Danny was that anomaly, an Irish-only child. He loved the sprawling Murphy household. There was Pat and Liam, Cassie, and of course, Terry. And they took Danny in like he was family. He wasn't exactly an orphan, Danny, but a near thing, what with his mother running off when he was just a baby and his father pretty much ignoring him because all he could see in him was her. As Martin Ryan fell deeper into the bitterness in the bottle, he was hardly a fit father for the boy, who more and more took refuge on the streets with Pat and Jimmy and at the Murphy house, where there was laughter and smiles and rarely any yelling, except when the sisters fought for the bathroom. Danny was a lonely boy, Catherine Murphy always thought. A lonely, sad boy, and who could blame him? So if he was at the house a bit more than was normal, she was happy to give him a smile and a mother's hug, some cookies and a peanut butter sandwich. And as he grew up and his interest in Terry became obvious, well, Danny Ryan was a nice boy from the neighborhood, and Terry could do worse. John Murphy wasn't so sure. He's got that blood. What blood? His wife asked, although she knew. That Ryan blood, Murphy answered. It's cursed. Stop being foolish, Catherine said. When Marty was well. She didn't finish the thought, because when Marty was well, he, not John, had run Dogtown, and her husband didn't like the thought that he owed his rise to Martin Ryan's fall. So John wasn't all that unhappy when Danny graduated high school and moved down to South County to be a fisherman, of all the goddamn things. But if that's what the kid wanted to do... That's what he wanted to do, even though he didn't understand that jobs on the boats were hard to get, and he only got his place on the swordfish boat because its owner thought the Celtics were a lock at home against the Lakers, and they weren't. So if the owner wanted to keep his boat, young Danny Ryan was going to be on board. 
No reason for Danny to know that, though. Why ruin it for the kid? Pat, he didn't understand Danny's move either. What are you doing this for? He asked. I don't know, Danny said. I want to try something different. Work outdoors. The docks aren't outdoors? Yeah, they are, Danny thought. But they weren't the ocean, and he meant what he said. He wanted something different from Dogtown. He knew the life he was looking at. Get his union card, work on the docks, pick up some spare change as muscle for the Murphys. Friday nights at the P. Bruins hockey games, Saturday nights at the Glock, Sunday dinner at John's table. He wanted something more, different anyway. Wanted to make his own way in the world. Do clean, hard work, have his own money, his own place, not owe nobody nothing. Sure, he'd miss Pat and Jimmy, but Gilead was what, half an hour, 40 minute drive, and they'd be coming down in August anyway. So he got himself a job on the swordfish boat. Total fucking doofus at first, no clue what he was doing. And Dick, he must have yelled himself hoarse trying to teach Danny what to do, what not to do. Called Danny every name in the book. And for a good year, Danny thought his first name was Dammit. But he learned. Became a decent hand and overcame the prejudice most of the old guys had that no one who didn't come from at least three generations of fishermen could work a boat. And he freaking loved it. Got his drafty little cottage, learned to cook. Well, anyway, bacon and eggs, clam chowder, chili. Earned his salary, drank with the men. Summers he worked on the swordfish charter. Winters he caught on with the boats that went out for the ground fish. The cod, the haddock, the flounder. Whatever they could net. Whatever the Russians or the Japs didn't get and the government would still let them have. Summers were fun, winters a bitch. The sky gray, the ocean black, and the only word that could describe Gilead in the winter was bleak. The wind would come through his cottage like it had an invitation, and nights he'd wear a heavy hooded sweatshirt to bed. When the boats could get out in the winter, the ocean would make every effort to kill you, and when you couldn't get out, the sheer tedium would take its shot. Nothing to do but drink, watch your belly grow and your wallet shrink. Look out your window at the fog like you was living inside an aspirin bottle. Maybe watch some TV, go back to bed, or put on your toque, jam your hands inside your peacoat, and walk down to the docks to look at your boat sitting there as miserable as you were. Go to the bar, sit around and bitch with the other guys. Sundays you had the Patriots anyway. You weren't unhappy enough already. But those days they could go out, Jesus Christ, it was cold, colder than a witch's tit. Even with so many layers of clothes on, you looked like the freaking Michelin man. Thermal long johns and long sleeve shirt, thick wool socks, a wool sweater, a sweatshirt and a down jacket, thick gloves and he was still cold. Out at the dock by four in the morning, chopping ice off the moorings and the gears while Dick or Chip Whaley or Ben Browning or whoever he was working for tried to get the engine to turn over. Then it was through the channel and out through the harbor of refuge, the white caps splashing on the icy rocks of the breakwater, then out through the west gap or the east gap, depending on where the fish were. Sometimes they'd be out three or four days at a time, sometimes a week if they hit it good. And like the rest of them, Danny would catch two or three hour naps between watches or putting the nets out and hauling them back in, dumping the catch into the holds going below to clutch a steaming hot cup of bitter coffee in his shivering hands or bolt down a bowl of chili or chowder. In the morning, it was always bacon and eggs and toast, as much as he could eat because the captains never stinted on the food. A man working that hard has to eat. On the trips when they were lucky enough to hit their quota, whoever was captain would say they were headed in, and that was a glorious feeling, that you'd done your job and been rewarded, and there'd be a fat check with your share of the full hold reflected in it, and the men would go back to their wives and girlfriends proud that they could put food on the table, go out to a movie and dinner. Other times, the bad times, the nets would come up light or even empty, and it seemed like there wasn't a fish in the whole dark Atlantic Ocean, and the boat would skulk back into port with a feeling of shame pervading the whole crew as if they'd done something wrong as if they weren't good enough. And the wives and the girlfriends knew to step lightly because their men would be angry and ashamed and feel not quite like men. And the mortgages and rents might not get paid 
and the repairs the car needed would have to wait. And that happened more and more. Summers, though. Summers were wonderful. Summers, Danny was on the swordfish boat, light and fast, on blue seas, under blue skies, chasing the game fish. And Danny's post was right on the bow because he was a good harpooner. And Dick, he could find swordfish like he was one of them, a freaking legend out of that port. Sometimes they'd take clients out to sport fish, rich guys who could afford to charter a boat and a crew, and they'd go after the swords and the tuna with poles and lines. And then it was mostly Danny's job to cut bait and make sure the clients had cold beers. And they had some pretty famous people on that boat, but Danny will never forget the time that Ted Williams, Ted freaking Williams came on and was a good guy and tipped Danny a hundred when they were done. Other times they went out to catch the swords to sell at the fish markets and then it was all business. Danny standing on the bow with his harpoon and when they hit a bunch of swords, Danny would throw the spear, which was attached to a heavy buoy that would wear the sword down. And sometimes they'd have five or six swords tied up before they went back to fight the tired fish onto the boat. And those were goddamn wonderful days because they'd come in by dusk and celebrate and drink and party. And then Danny would fall face first into bed, happily exhausted, and get up to do it again the next day. Good times. It was one of those summers, one of those Augusts, when the Dogtown crew was down at the beach and Danny joined them for drinks and hot dogs and burgers and saw that Terry was something more than Pat's little sister. Her hair was black like a winter sea and her eyes weren't blue. Danny swore they were violet. And her little body had slimmed in some places but filled out in others. Back then, she didn't have money for perfume and her mother wouldn't have let her buy it anyway. So she dabbed vanilla extract behind her ears and now Danny jokes he can still get hard from a sugar cookie. He remembers the first time they'd felt each other, clasped each other behind some sand dunes. Hot, wet kisses, her tongue a busy surprise flicking in and out of his mouth. He was so happy when she let him undo two buttons on her white blouse, slip his hand inside, cop a feel. A few weeks later, one of those hot, humid August nights, parked in his car at the beach, he unsnapped her jeans and she surprised him again by lifting her hips to let his hand inside, and he felt her underneath her plain white cotton panties, and her tongue quickened on his and she held him tighter and said, do that, yes, do that. Another night he was rubbing her and she stiffened and whimpered and he realized that she had come. He was so hard it hurt, and then he felt her small hand unzip his jeans and she dug around inside unsure and inept. But then she grabbed him and stroked him and he came inside his shorts and had to pull his shirt over his jeans to hide the dark spot before they went back to join the gang sitting around outside the cottage. Danny was in love. But Terry, she didn't want to be no fisherman's girlfriend, no fisherman's wife. I can't live all the way down here, she said. It's a half hour, Danny said. 45 minutes. Terry said. She was so attached to her family, her friends, her hairdresser, her church, her block, her neighborhood. Terry was a dogtown girl and always would be. And Goshen was okay for a few weeks in the summer, but she could never live there, especially with Danny gone for nights at a time and her worried whether he was coming back. And it was true, Danny knew, that boyfriends and husbands died out there, slipped off the deck into the icy water, got their brains beat out when a net boom swung wildly in the wind, or drank themselves to death when the fishing was bad. And there was no money in it. Not for a deckhand, anyway. If you owned a boat, maybe you strung a couple of good seasons together, but even most of the boat owners were hurting now with the fish playing out. Terry grew up comfortable in the Murphy house and didn't see herself being a poor fish wife, as she called it. Daddy can get you a union card, she said, and a job at the port. The port of Providence, that is, not Gilead. The docks swinging a hook. Good money, good union job, and then who knew? A move up with the Murphys. Maybe a desk job as a union official, something like that. And a taste of Murphy's other businesses. What he would have had anyway if his father hadn't drunk it away his old man getting so sloshed so often that he became a liability, and the guys worked him out of the top job and then out altogether. 
For old time's sake, kicked him enough to live on, and that was about it. There was a day when Danny was just a little kid that the name Marty Ryan struck fear. Now it just provoked pity. Danny didn't want it anyway. Didn't want nothing to do with the rackets, the loan sharking, the gambling, the hijacks, the union. Problem was, he did want Terry. She was funny and smart and listened to him without taking any of his bullshit. But she wouldn't give it up without them being at least engaged. And his take from the boats wasn't enough for a diamond, never mind a marriage. So Danny took the card and went back to Dogtown. First person he told about wanting to propose to Terry was Pat. You gonna give her a ring? Pat asked. When I get enough money for something decent, go see Solly Weiss. Weiss had a jewelry store in downtown Providence. I was thinking Zales, Danny said. And pay bust out retail? Pat said. You go see Solly, tell him you're with us, who it's for, he'll make you a price. Not for nothing was the unofficial state motto, I know a guy. I don't want to give Terry a diamond fell off a truck, Danny said. Pat laughed. They're not stolen. Jesus, what kind of brother you think I am? We look after Solly. You ever heard of him getting robbed? No. Why do you think that is? Pat asked. Look, if you're shy, I'll go in with you. So they went in and saw Solly, and he sold Danny a full carat princess cut diamond at cost with layaway payments, no interest. What did I tell you? Pat asked as they left the store. This is how it works, huh? This is how it works. Pat said. Now you have to go to the old man, though, and I'm not going in with you. Danny found John Murphy at the Glock, where else, and asked for a minute of his time. John took him into the back, sat down at his booth, and just looked at him. He wasn't going to make it easy. I came to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, Danny said, feeling like a dork and also scared shitless. John wanted Danny Ryan for a son-in-law like he wanted flaming hemorrhoids, but Catherine had already warned him that this was likely to happen, and that if he wanted a happy household, he had better give his permission. I'll find us somebody else, John had said. She doesn't want somebody else, Catherine said. And let's get this done before she walks down the aisle in a moo-moo. Did he knock her up? Not yet, Catherine said. They're not even sleeping together, if you believe Terry, but... So John went through the dance with Danny. How do you intend to support my daughter? How the hell do you think, Danny thought. You got me my card, my job at the docks, some stuff on the side. I'm a hard worker, Danny said, and I love your daughter. John gave him the whole love isn't enough speech, but eventually gave his blessing. And that night, Danny took Terry out to a nice dinner at George's, and she pretended to be surprised when he got down on one knee and popped the question, even though she had told her brother to make sure that Danny was clued in as to getting a good ring without going into debt. The wedding was elaborate, as befitted a daughter of John Murphy. Not Italian elaborate, they didn't go as far as all that, but all the Italians were there and came with envelopes. Pasco Ferry and his wife, the Moretti brothers, Sal Antonucci, his wife, and Chris Palumbo. All the important Irish of Dogtown were there. Even Marty showed up for the full wedding mass at St. Mary's and the reception later at the Biltmore. John sprang for all that, but not for the honeymoon. So Danny and Terry went all the way across the Blackstone Bridge to Newport for a three-day weekend. No one was happier than Pat when Danny and Terry got married. We've always been brothers, Pat said at the rehearsal dinner. Now it's official. Yeah, it was official, so Terry finally gave it up. Enthusiastically, energetically, Danny had had nothing to complain about. Still doesn't. Five years into their marriage and the sex is still good. Only problem is she hasn't gotten pregnant yet, and everybody feels it's perfectly okay to constantly ask her about it, and he knows it hurts her. Danny, he's in no hurry to have a kid, doesn't know if he wants one at all. That's because you were raised by wolves, Terry said to him once. Which isn't true, Danny thinks. Wolves stay. Now he looks at the little alarm clock on top of the old dresser and sees it's time for the meeting at the spindrift before Pasco's clam bake. 
The Saturday night of every Labor Day weekend, Pasco Ferry throws a party and invites everybody. You could be just walking past Pasco on the beach in front of his house, notice the hole he's digging, and he'll invite you. He doesn't care. He'll spend all day digging that hole and laying the coals, and then he'll go get the clams and quahogs fresh out the water. Sometimes Danny goes with him, stands ankle deep in the warm mud of the tidal ponds and digs with the long-handled clam rake. It's slow work pulling that rake out of the bottom, digging through the mud and the tongs with your fingers to find the shellfish, and then dumping them into the bucket floating in the inner tube that Pasco ties to his belt with a frayed length of old laundry line. Pasco works steady like a machine, stripped down to the waist, his Mediterranean skin tanned a deep brown, 60-something years old and his muscles still hard and ropey, his pectorals just starting to sag. The man runs all of southern New England, but he's happy as hell standing under the sun in the mud, working like an old paisan. Yeah, but how many guys has this old paisan had clipped? Danny wonders sometimes, watching him work so peaceful and content. Or done himself. Local lore has it that Pasco personally did Joey Bonham, Remy Lachance, the McMahon brothers from Boston. Late night whiskey talk with Peter and Paul whispered that Pasco was no gunman, but did his work with a wire or a knife so close he could smell the sweat. Some days, Pasco and Danny would go to Almax, buy some chicken thighs, then drive over to Narrow River, where Pasco would tie a long piece of string onto the chicken, toss it out into the water, and then pull it back real slow. What would happen was a blue crab would fasten its claws onto the meat and not let go until Pasco pulled it right into the net that Danny held for him. Lesson for you, Pasco said once as they watched the crab thrash in the bucket trying to get out. Then he tied another piece of chicken and repeated the process until they had a bucket full of crabs to boil that night. Lesson, don't hold on to something's going to pull you into a trap. If you're going to let go, let go early. Better yet, don't take the bait at all. Three. Danny and Liam hop into Pat's Camry and drive five minutes over to Mashinook Point. So what are we meeting about? Pat asks his brother. The Moretti's are taxing the spindrift, Liam says, reminding him. It's their territory, Pat says. Not the drift, Liam answers. It's grandfathered. This is true, Danny thinks as he looks out the window. The rest of the places on the shore kick to the Italians, but the spindrift has been Irish since his father's time. He knows the place well, used to get drunk there when he worked the boats, sometimes went in to listen to the local blues bands they'd book on weekends in the summer. The owner, Tim Carroll, is a friend. They drive past cornfields, and Danny's always amazed that this land hasn't been developed. The same family has owned it for 300 years, and they're stubborn, those swamp Yankees. Would rather grow sweet corn than sell the land and retire rich. But Danny's grateful for it. It's nice there, farms right up to the ocean. So what? Pat asks Liam. Tim came to you? It's a violation of protocol. If Tim has a beef, he should go to John, or at least Pat, not the younger brother, not Liam. He didn't come to me, Liam says, a little defensive. I was having a beer, we got talking. There's so many little peninsulas and tidal marshes along the shore, Danny thinks. You gotta drive inland then along the coast, then back toward the sea to get to any particular place. Quicker if they drain the marshes and build some roads, but that's Connecticut, not Rhode Island. Rhode Island likes things difficult, hard to find. The other unofficial state motto, if you were supposed to know, you'd know. So it takes a few minutes to drive to the Spindrift, when they could have just walked up the beach, but they go by road past the cornfields and then the little grocery store, the hot dog stand, the laundromat, the ice cream stand. As they make the curve that takes them back along the ocean, there's a trailer park on their left and then the bar. They park out in front. You walk through the door, you know this ain't no money machine. It's an old clabber joint pounded by salt air and winter winds for 60 some odd years, and it's a wonder it's still standing. One good blow, Danny thinks, could knock it down and hurricane season is coming up. 
Tim Carroll is standing behind the bar, jerking a brew for a tourist. Skinny Tim Carroll, Danny thinks. A pound wouldn't stick to him with glue. Tim's, what, 33 now, and he already looks like the responsibility of running the place since his old man died is aging him. He wipes his hands on his apron and comes out from behind the bar. Peter and Paul are already here, he says, jerking his chin out toward the deck. Chris Palumbo's with him. So what's the problem, Tim? Pat asks. They come in tugging their cuffs, Tim says. They're here about every afternoon, drinking pitches they don't pay for, ordering sandwiches, burgers. You seen the price of beef lately? Buns? Yeah, okay. Now they want an envelope too? Tim says. I got basically 10, 11 weeks of summer to make money. The rest of the year I'm fucked. A few locals and fishermen nursing their beers for two hours at a time? No offense, Danny. Danny shakes his head like forget it. They walk through an open slider out onto a deck precariously cantilevered above some rocks the state put in to try to prevent the whole building from sliding into the ocean. From out there, Danny can see the whole southern shoreline, from the lighthouse at Gilead down to Watch Hill. It's beautiful. The Moretti brothers sit at a white plastic table next to the railing that Chris Palumbo's got his feet up on. Peter Moretti looks like your classic wise guy. Thick, slicked back black hair, black shirt rolled up at the sleeves to show off the Rolex, designer jeans over loafers. Paulie Moretti is a skinny guinea, maybe 5'7", with caramel skin, his light brown hair highlighted and permed into tight curls. Permed, Danny thinks, which is the style now, but nothing Danny can get down with. Danny thinks Paulie's always looked a little Puerto Rican, although he ain't gonna say it. Chris Palumbo's something else. Red hair like he came from freaking Galway, but otherwise he's as Italian as Sunday gravy. Danny remembers what old Bernie Hughes said about him. Never trust the red-headed wop. They're the worst of the breed. Yeah, Peter is smart, but as smart as he is, Chris is smarter. Peter don't make a move without him. And if Peter does make the big step up, Chris will be his consigliere, no question. The Irish guys pull up chairs as a waitress brings two pitchers and sets them on the table. The men pour their beers, then Peter turns to Tim. You went running to the Murphys? I didn't run, Tim says. I just was telling Liam. We're all friends here, Pat says, not wanting to get into the protocol of who told what to whom. We're all friends here, Peter says, but business is business. Liam says, this place doesn't pay tax, never has, never will. Tim's father and my father? His father is gone, Peter says, then looks at Tim. May you rest, no disrespect. But the arrangement passed with him. It's grandfathered, Pat says. Peter says, they're tax exempt forever because 30 years ago some bog tried to boil the potato in here? Pete, come on, Pat says. Chris kicks in. Who do you think got the works department to put this rock in? The place doesn't turn into a raft, your huckleberry fucking fin? That's 30, 40 grand of material, never mind the labor. Pat laughs. What, you paid it? We arranged it, Chris says. I didn't hear Tim crying then. Tim says, I already use your food supplier. What they charge me for meat? I could do a lot better someplace else. It's true, Danny thinks. The Moretti's are already making money out of this place, what with the vending machines and kickbacks from the wholesalers, never mind the freebies. And the last time you had a health inspector really go through your kitchen, Chris says, will be the first time. Then don't eat my fucking food, all right? Peter leans across the table toward Pat. All we're saying is that we've had expenses related to the place lately, and we think Tim should contribute a little. Are we being that unreasonable? I can't give you what I don't have. Tim whines. I don't have the money, Peter. Peter shrugs. Maybe we can work something out. Here it comes, Danny thinks. The demand for a tax was just to come along. The Morettis know that Tim don't have it. That was just to open the door for what they really want. What do you have in mind? Pat asks. One of our people, Peter says, went to do a little transaction in the men's room here last week and Tim here got heavy with him. He was dealing coke, Tim says. 
You laid hands on him, Polly says. You physically threw him out. Yeah, and I will again, Polly, Tim says. If my old man knew that was going on in this place. Danny remembers an argument that Pat and Liam had about Liam's trips to Miami. He goes down there on what he calls fornications. Danny has his suspicions about Liam's Miami runs. So does Pat. Danny was there when Pat cornered Liam and said, Hand to God, Liam, if y'all bring him back anything from Florida besides herpes. Liam laughed. What, you mean coke? Yeah, I mean coke. Lot of money and blow, bro. Lot of jail time, too, Pat said. Lot of freaking heat from the feds and locals. We don't need that. Yes, Godfather, Liam said. He went into his Brando imitation. We'll lose our judges, our politicians. I'm not kidding here, baby brother. Don't get your panties in a wad, Liam said. I'm not moving any coke, for Christ's sakes. See that you don't. Jesus, enough. Now Danny remembers that conversation and has to wonder what the fuck they're really talking about here. Look, Peter jumps in. Maybe we can cut a little slack on the payments if Tim would be a little flexible on this other thing. Why this place? Pat asks. In the winter, it's nothing but fishermen. Fishermen don't do coke? Polly asks. Don't kid yourself. The worse the fishing is, the more they need. The better the fishing is, the more they want. Danny don't like the remark. Hard to make a living, support your family. Guys take a little consolation where they can find it. Used to be booze, now it's blow. Well, it's still booze, but now it's blow too. I'm just saying there are other places you could do that business, Pat insists. It's true, Danny thinks. He knows at least five joints up the coast where you can score coke. You can't shake your dick at the urinal those places you don't hit a narc, Peter says. I thought we were all friends here. A friend denies a friend a favor? It's a big goddamn ask, Tim says. I could lose my liquor license. Shit, they could confiscate the place. Pat puts his hand out to silence him. Danny recognizes the gesture. Seen it a hundred times from old man Murphy. Must be genetic. Who do you have selling down here? Pat asks. You know Rocco Giannetti? Danny knows him. Slick 20-something, drives a freaking BMW. Now Danny knows how he makes the payments, the insurance. Rocco is showy, Pat says. Loud, he attracts attention. What, your human resources now? Paulie asks. Peter asks, you'd prefer someone else? I'd prefer a grown-up, Pat says. We can do that, Peter answers. How about Chris here? There it is, Danny thinks. That was the play all along, to set Chris Palumbo up to sell coke in here. And it wasn't the Moretti's idea, it was Chris's. The red-haired guinea probably got the Moretti's all jacked up about the tax, then suggested the coke deal as a compromise. He'll make on the blow, then kick up to Peter and Paul. Pat makes his ruling. Twice a week during the off-season. Nothing during the summer. Chris can meet his buyer inside, but he goes out to his car to move the dope. Nothing bigger than an ounce, ever. We can't do business in the summer? Polly complains. What is that? We don't have to give you anything, Liam says. The fuck you? Okay, Peter says, shutting his little brother up. Tim, you good with this? Pat asks. I guess. He's reluctant, and Danny don't blame him. But what are you going to do? It's the way of the world. Their world, anyway. Pat didn't give away nothing that the Morettis couldn't just take. It just makes good sense to be gracious about something you can't prevent. Besides, Pat is looking to the future. Pasco has been talking about retiring. Mashinook in the summer, Florida in the winter. Someone is going to step up to take the number one job, and Peter Moretti might be the guy. He's young, but already a captain and big earner. And if Moretti Sr. wasn't doing 20 in the adult correctional institutions... He'd be the man, so Peter feels it's his due. Pat Murphy knows down the line he's going to be doing business with Peter and wants to keep a good relationship. You'll square this with Pasco? Pat asks Peter. We don't need to burden him with this, Peter answers. A beat of silence, and then they all burst out laughing. 
What the hell, they're feeling their oats and their strength and their youth, knowing they're taking over the world. Can do things without the old guys knowing, without their okay. Not that it isn't serious fucking business, dealing dope in Pasco's backyard without him knowing. It was just funny the way Peter said it is all. And for a few moments there, they're all friends. All boys having a laugh, putting one over. And Peter, Pat says, lay off the burgers a little, huh? You worried about my waistline? Pay for a sandwich, you cheap prick. That starts them laughing again. It's good, Danny thinks, being young in the sweet days of summer. But driving back, Danny can't shake the feeling that Liam just set himself up to deal coke with the Moretti brothers. Four. Danny gets back. Terry sends him right out again. Take the groceries to your father's, she says. She went to stop and shop in the morning, got groceries for them and Marty, too. Picked up Marty's bacon, eggs, coffee, milk, bread, his Luckies, his Bushmills, his Sam Adams, his Hormel corn beef hash, his lotto tickets. Now she has it all sitting out in two plastic bags for Danny to deliver. It's only fair, Danny thinks. She did the shopping. Stood in line Labor Day weekend everyone buying stuff for their cookouts. Danny picks up the bags and heads over to Marty's, just up the gravel street, a cottage the old man insists on renting year-round. He knocks on the screen door, doesn't wait for an answer, and nudges it open with his foot. It's me! Marty's sitting in his chair, where he always is, sucking down a Lucky and a beer, listening to the socks on the radio. Ned Egan sits on the couch by the window, you usually don't have to look too far from Marty to find Ned. You'll bring my Hormel? Marty asks. When does Terry forget your Hormel? Danny asks, setting the bags down on the kitchen counter. Hi, Ned. Danny? I thought maybe you shopped, Marty says. Ned gets up and starts to unpack the groceries, put them away on the shelves in the refrigerator. Ned's in his 40s, has a body like a fire hydrant, still lifts weights every other day. When he reaches up to put the cans away, the 38 in his shoulder holster shows. You want to get to Marty, you got to get through Ned, and no one is going to get through Ned. Marty Ryan's not important enough anymore that anyone wants to kill him, but Ned ain't taking chances. Anyway, Danny's glad his old man has company, someone to heat up his hash for him, bitch about the socks with. You get my scratches? Marty asks. Marty plays the lotto like he has an in with St. Jude. Usually he just wins a little beer money, but once he won $100 and that keeps him at it. He's sure he's going to hit the lottery or something, and Danny wonders what Marty would do with a few million dollars if he did. Skinny, bitter old man sitting in that chair in the same red plaid shirt that Terry gave him, what, three Christmases ago? Buttoned up to the neck with a slice of the white t-shirt showing. Baggy, dirty old khaki trousers that Terry can talk him out of maybe once a month to wash. White socks, sandals. Marty Ryan. Martin Ryan. A goddamn legend. When Big Bill Donovan came up from New York and told the Providence boys they were joining the New York branch of the ILA, it was Marty Ryan, just a kid then, who sent him packing. Marty and John Murphy back in the day. We stared New York down and it was New York that blinked. So we have our own union and our own docks, Danny knows. A few years later, Albert Anastasia himself came up, tried to pull the same shit. Marty told him, we got our own guineas here. It was true. Young Pasquale Ferry was standing right beside them. They worked it out, Marty and John and the Italians. The Irish kept the docks, the Italians took the trucking, and both unions were run from Providence. Marty and John told the outsiders that local meant just that, local. We didn't leave Ireland to be a colony of anybody's anymore. So for years, nothing came into Providence that didn't come through Marty Ryan, John Murphy, or Pasco Ferry. By truck or boat didn't matter. They had their joke about the bite they took, called it the Paul Revere. One if by land, two if by sea. The stuff that walked off those boats and trucks fed Dogtown for decades. 
Not just the dock workers or drivers, either. Guys who worked in the factories, making costume jewelry, tools, and just enough to cover the rent. They knew they could buy their kids a new pair of sneakers from the back door of the Glockamora. They could get canned goods, booze, cigarettes without paying retail to make the rich Yankees richer. Later, when the factories moved south and the buckle on the rust belt got tighter, guys couldn't cover the rent and those backdoor sales were a matter of survival. Men who would have put a bullet in their heads before they took food stamps would go to Marty to find out what had come off the trucks and the boats that week. Cans of soup, cans of tuna, cans of stew grew legs and walked off the docks onto family tables. That was Marty back when his neck was thick from swinging his longshoreman's hook in his fists, back when he had his pride. You going to the clam bake, right? Danny asks him now. I don't know. You should come, Danny says. Get out, it will do you good. Friday nights, Terry usually manages to drag Marty down to Dave's for fish and chips. Marty's had fish and chips every Friday night since Danny can remember a break in his otherwise steady diet of bacon and eggs, corned beef hash, and booze. I don't know, Marty says. Ned don't say anything. Ned rarely does. One hard case, Ned Egan. When he was a kid at St. Michael's, the priests and nuns beat him half to death trying to straighten him out. The sister would make Ned stretch his hand out on the desk, then slam the edge of a ruler down on his fingers, and he'd just look at her and smile. He'd get home, his old man would see the welt on his hand and figure that Ned had done something to piss off the sister, so he'd lay Ned down on the bed and bring a razor strap down on the backs of his legs until Ned cried. Problem was, Ned wouldn't cry, and his old man wouldn't give up. Those days, no one had heard of child protective services. It wasn't even a concept, so Ned took some ferocious beatings. He'd go to school the next morning with blood leaking through the backs of his pants legs, which would stick to the seat of his chair whenever he went to get up. The teachers learned not to call him to the blackboard those days so as not to embarrass the boy. When Ned was 14, his old man picked up the strap and told him to lie down, but Ned swung on him instead, put him on the floor, then ran out and tried to join the Merchant Marine. They laughed at him and told him to come back in four years. So Ned lived on the streets for a while, until Marty Ryan had a cot put in the storage closet at the Glock. Let the lads sweep up the place for a bowl of lamb stew or shepherd's pie or whatever was left over at night. One afternoon, Ned's old man came into the pub with a ball bat in his hand and announced he was going to teach his no-good son a lesson he'd never forget. Marty was sitting in his booth and quietly said, Billy Egan? Unless that lesson is how to hit a curveball, I'd suggest you turn around and walk back through that door. I'm a bit short of cash now to have a mass set for you. Ned's old man turned milk white and walked back through the door. He knew just what Ryan was telling him, and he never stepped into the Glock again. The day he was 16, Ned quit school, went down to the docks where Mr. Ryan got him his union card. Ned started swinging the hook, made a decent wage, got himself a little apartment on Smith Street and brought his own groceries. His father would see him in the neighborhood. He'd cross the street. His mother wrote him a letter when the old man died. Ned didn't write back. Far as he was concerned, Marty Ryan was his father. Now Danny says to his dad, I'll drive you over there. Ned can bring me. I'll drive you, Danny repeats. Marty's in his mid-sixties, but he acts more like he's in his eighties. What the cigs and booze and bitterness will do to you, Danny figures. To Marty, anyway. Danny remembers him lashing out, screaming, You're just like your mother. You got that bitch's blood. In that quiet clarity before passing out, Marty muttered, I didn't even know I had you. I went to Vegas, had a fling with a broad I met at a bar. A year later, she shows up with a kid. You, tells me, here, here's your son. I'm not cut out to be a mother. Only truth ever came out of a lying mouth. Truth also that Marty loved her, kept her picture under his bed. Danny found it there one time, looking for Playboy magazines. Tall, statuesque showgirl with red hair, green eyes, long legs, big tits. 
It was only later during one of Marty's drunken diatribes, this time show and tell, Danny realized it was his mother. It was hard to believe, though, that his old man had ever nailed a woman like that. You looked at Marty Ryan, you didn't see a ladies' man. Old Pasco set Danny straight on that score, though. They were out digging clams and Pasco said, Your father back in his day was one good-looking kid. Marty came to the party, hide your women. Danny knows his father still has the picture. Five. When they get to Pasco's, there's already a house full. People everywhere, the women moving around the kitchen like a well-practiced drill team. Mary Ferry presiding over the whole thing. Danny gets Marty into a chair and then goes back and finds Terry helping out in the kitchen. Where'd you go this afternoon anyway, she asks. I woke up, you weren't there. Business, Terry says. Over beers? A couple pitches is all. She looks at her brother. How much did Liam have? He's okay. He looks a little too okay, Terry says. Keep an eye on him, all right? Danny says he will, but he resents it a little. Everyone always has to keep an eye on Liam. Pat's been doing it his whole life. Even on the ice, it was well known that if you took a run at Liam, Pat was going to drop the gloves. This goes all the way back even before Liam was born, Danny figures. One drunken night, Pat told him the story of how Catherine's pregnancy with Liam was supposed to be difficult, maybe even life-threatening for her. And John, devout Catholic that he is, wanted her to abort the baby. But Catherine wouldn't do it, and the baby, Liam, was born a couple of months premature, less than three pounds wasn't expected to live, and was declared dead twice. So pampering Liam, looking out for Liam, bailing Liam out from the consequences of whatever shitty thing he did is a Murphy family habit. Danny looks over where Liam is charming Mary Ferry and sees that he has that flush high on his cheeks and that amused at everything too cool for school smile on his face. Jimmy and Angie here? Danny asks. Outside, Terry answers. You want a drink? I'd take a beer. Danny goes to a big steel bucket on the floor full of ice and pulls out two cold beers. Then he sees Cassandra, tall, wavy, red hair, those startling dark brown eyes. She smiles at Danny and he feels awkward, the two beers in his hand. Hi, Danny. Cassie, hi, Danny says. I didn't know you were home from... Treatment, she says. You can say it, Danny. It was like her, what, second or even third time in rehab or the psych ward? Cassie is the unlikely black sheep of the Murphy family, and John barely bothers to hide his shame of her. She was the angel once, daddy's little girl. Terry once admitted to Danny that she was jealous of her big sister. A fine singer of the old folk music, a dancer who won awards at Cayley. But then she started drinking, and then it was grass, and then it was all kinds of dope. She was on the street for a while after the Murphys went the tough love route and kicked her out of the house. And then Danny heard she'd agreed to go back to this place in Connecticut. Danbury, someplace like that. She looks good now, though. Clear eyes, her skin glowing. One of those beers for me, Danny? She asks. Jesus, Cassie, don't even joke. He and Cassie were always close. Maybe it was because each of them was something of an outsider in their family, and so they were natural allies. No, I can joke, she says. I just can't drink. Probably a good idea, huh? At least that's what they say at the meetings, Cassie says. Yeah, you go to the meetings? 90 and 90. Anyone who lives in an Irish neighborhood knows what that means. 90 AA meetings in 90 days. Good for you, Cassie, Danny says. Yeah, good for me, she says. She always liked Danny. There was something soft in him, something hurt. Small wonder him being Marty's kid. You'd better get back to Terry before her beer gets warm. Right. Danny takes the beer back to Terry and says, Cassie is here. Yeah? I mean, should she be? Danny asks. With all the drinking and everything? She has to learn to deal with real life sometime, Terry says, taking the beer from him. Besides, no one here is going to let her drink. Mary Ferry is teasing Liam about not having a date for the party. This is a first, she's saying. Usually it's some model from New York or an actress, always the prettiest girl. 
I decided to play the field tonight, Liam says. It's a small field, Terry kicks in. Almost everyone is married now, starting in on families. The clam bakes, even among the younger generation, have taken on a decidedly domestic flavor, a little boring for Liam. I'll just have to do my best, Liam says. You should get married, Mary tells him. Forget all these models and actresses. You want me to find you a nice Italian girl? You do that to a nice Italian girl? Terry asks. My sister, Liam says. Thanks. Liam's a sweetie, Mary says. He just needs the right woman. He had the right woman, Terry says, and he blew it. Danny knows she's referring to Liam's ex-girlfriend, Karen. A trauma nurse at Rhode Island Hospital, she had it all. Beauty, brains, and a good heart. They all really liked her. And she really loved Liam, but he had to fuck it up by fucking around. Liam is Kennedy handsome, curly black hair, striking brown eyes. He's cut a sexual swath through Rhode Island, not so easy to do in a mostly Catholic state where most girls have older brothers. The right woman? Liam asks. But you're already taken, Mary. The joke is that Liam didn't kiss the Blarney Stone. It kissed him. Kissed him, Danny thinks. It fucking blew him. Listen to him. Mary says, pleased. She looks at Terry and suggests, maybe Tina Baco? Maybe, Terry says and glances at Danny. They both know that Liam took Tina down to Atlantic City for a weekend and boffed her 18 ways to Sunday. At least that's what Tina told Terry. Liam was great in bed, a few laughs, but as a husband, forget it. You're the prettiest woman here, Liam says to Mary. You should leave Pasco, run away with me. Make yourself useful, Mary says, and go ask my husband if the food is ready yet. I'll go with you, Danny says. They walk out onto the beach where Pat's helping Pasco dig the clams out from the pit, and Peter and Polly and their crew are standing there watching them. Sal Antonucci's there. Danny don't like him. Sal has his own crew now doing some serious work for the Morettis. One of his guys, Tony Romano, is standing with him, grinning at Danny like an ape. Sal and Tony did time together in the joint and they're like brothers. Spent literally years passing weights back and forth and now they're muscle-bound guidos. Thing of it is, Sal is a stone killer. He's moved up with the Morettis because he does their wet work for them. Tall, heavy-muscled, broad-faced like a slab of marble. Blue eyes, cold as a January morning. Sal smiles at Danny and asks, How's it hanging? Down to my ankle, Sally, Danny says, because he knows Antonucci don't like being called Sally, and for some reason Danny likes to annoy him, or maybe has to show he's not afraid of him. Danny looks over at Romano. Tony? Tony nods. Pretty much what Tony does because he's dumber than a rock. What Tony's got going for him are his friendship with Sal, his muscles, and his looks. Thick, curly black hair, sculpted face, lithe body, he could be one of those male models hawking cologne or Calvin Klein underwear or whatever in the magazines. I'd do him, Cassie told Danny once, if he'd just bang me silly and keep his mouth shut. Cassie talks a big game, Danny thinks, but to his knowledge, she's never been with anyone. Danny nods back at Tony. This is what passes his conversation with Romano and moves on to say hello to Jimmy and Angie, but then he doesn't. Because he sees, walking up the beach, that woman. The goddess who came out of the sea. Six. She's with Polly Moretti. I'd like you to meet my girlfriend, Pam, Polly says. Who knew, Danny thinks. Who knew that Polly could pull a girl like this? Every guinea's dream of a white woman, and it would have to be a freaking Pam. Not a Sheila, a Mary, a Teresa, a Pam. Nice to meet you all, Pam says. She's friendly, but a little reserved. Who wouldn't be, Danny thinks, meeting this group for the first time, and not at all stuck up like Danny thought she'd be when he saw her coming out of the water. But she has a voice like sex, low and a little gravelly. They all feel it even the women, and it triggers a little tremor through the group. How do you all know Paul? 
Pam asks, making conversation. She's smart, Danny thinks, including them all but connecting it around to Polly, as if she's trying to say, I'm not after your men, I'm not a threat to you, I'm one of you, really. Beautiful women have their burdens too, he realizes. Other women's jealousy is one of them. Our families have known each other since Noah's Ark, Danny says, feeling a little shy. She has a man's white shirt on over her jeans. Danny wonders if it's Polly's, if she put it on after they made love because it was handy or because she just thought she looked good in it, which she does. Polly puts his arm around her shoulder. This is mine, she's mine. How did you meet Polly? Liam asks in this tone like he can't believe it could happen in the first place. At a bar, she says with a self-deprecating smile. And she pronounces it bar with an R, not ba like the locals. And even that is sexy. I was out with some coworkers and there was Paul. Paul, Danny hears, not Pauly, Paul. He hasn't heard Pauly called Paul since, well, ever. Where did you move here from? Terry asks Pam. She's starting to get the low down, Danny thinks. The wives will pounce on Pam like fresh meat and get her whole life story. It's so rare a guy other than Liam brings anyone new. They've all known each other forever and never even dated outside their own high school. They know each other's stories too well and they're the same frickin' story anyway. Connecticut, Pam said. I do real estate, and Rhode Island seemed to offer more opportunities. Another first, Danny thought. Someone using opportunities and Rhode Island in the same sentence. Pasco, Danny remembers to say. Mary's asking about the food. Tell her she can start serving the pasta, Pasco says without looking up from what he's doing. Nice to meet you, Pam, Liam says. On the way back to the house, Danny says, no. What? Liam asks. He knows. Just no. First woman Paulie's ever dated who didn't have a mustache, Liam says. Don't go busting balls, Pat tells his little brother. Since when do I bust balls? Since always, Pat says. It's true, Danny thinks. Liam likes his jokes and always gets away with them. He especially likes getting under Paulie's skin, probably because it's so easy to do. And Danny feels like he did when he first saw her come out of the water. She's going to be trouble. Women that beautiful usually are. Seven. Christ, the food, Danny thinks. The clams, the quahogs, the crabs, the huge pots of spaghetti and gravy, stuffed peppers and sweet Italian sausage. The joke is that the Irish are never, ever allowed to cook. But one time Martin wrapped a potato in tinfoil and had Danny secretly buried in the coals. And when Pasco dug the clams out, he found that spud and yelled, Marty, you old mick! God, how they eat. The food never stops. After the shellfish and the pasta, the sausage and the peppers, the women bring out big boxes of the sweet little Italian cookies from Cantonella's Bakery in Knightsville. Only Cantonella's cookies will do. Someone was always designated to stop in Cranston on the way down from the city and pick up those cookies. First time Danny made the Cantonella's run, the boxes of cookies were on the counter waiting for him. But when Danny reached for his wallet, the girl looked at him like he was pulling a gun. Lou Cantonella came out from the back, waving his arms like a football referee, signaling an incomplete pass. Danny felt a little bad about it when he was loading the boxes into his trunk. But then again, he knew that Lou never had to worry about the store being robbed, deliveries not arriving on time, health inspectors jamming him up on some bullshit violation, or the city deciding it needed to put parking meters on the street outside his stores. And whenever one of the Italians got married, Lou Cantonella always provided the cake, and the father of the bride paid bust-out retail, because that was a daughter's wedding and it was a matter of honor to pay. How sweet those cookies are against the strong, bitter espresso. And how good the hot coffee feels going down as the fog comes in and the night gets colder. Mary always keeps extra sweatshirts in the house. Big, thick sweatshirts worn pale by use and sun. And Danny goes in to get one for Terry and decides he might as well take a piss while he's at it. 
Opens the bathroom door, and there's Polly, Pam, and freaking Liam in there, bending over lines of coke on the counter. They look at him like guilty kids, and Liam says, Oops. We forgot to lock the door, Polly explains unnecessarily. And Danny's like, what are you, out of your freaking minds, doing blow in Pasco Ferry's house? Apparently so, because Liam finishes snorting a line and holds the rolled up dollar bill to Danny. I'm good, Danny says. Wipe your noses off before you come back outside, for Christ's sakes. He forgets about taking a whiz, finds a sweatshirt for Terry, and goes back outside and helps her get into it. Thanks, baby, she says, and leans back against him. Someone has brought a mandolin out and is playing while Pasco sings a sweet, sad ballad in Italian. His voice comes out of the fog like it drifted across the Atlantic from Napoli, an old song from an old country that washes up on this new world shore like driftwood. Video mare quante bello spira tanto sentimento. Com tu a chi tiene mente, cascitato o fai sunna. Guarda gu a histu giardino, siente, si estisciure arance. Nu profumo a cusi fino, dinto a core si ne va. Pasco finishes the song and it's very quiet. He says, Your turn, Marty. Nah, Marty says. It's a ritual. Marty demurs. Pasco insists. Then Marty lets himself be persuaded into singing. While this goes on, the three come back from the bathroom. Pam in a sweatshirt now, still looking sexy as hell. She and Polly sit down together. Liam comes to the opposite side of the fire and plops down next to Danny and Terry. Then Marty sings the parting glass in his quavering voice. Of all the money e'er I had, I spent it in good company. And all the harm I've ever done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I've done for want of wit, to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. How they had fought each other, these two immigrant tribes, for a place to put their feet. The Irish in Dogtown, the Italians on Federal Hill, toeholds carved out of grudging New England granite. The old Yankees hated the slick mix in greasy guineas, the bog trotters and dagos who came to ruin their pristine Protestant city with their Catholic saints and their candles, bleeding effigies and incense-swinging priests their smelly food and smellier bodies, their incontinent breeding. First, it was the Irish, back around the Civil War, who filled the tenements outside the slaughter yards that teemed with packs of feral mutts prowling for offal and giving the neighborhood its name, Dogtown. The men worked the slaughterhouses, the quarries, the tool factories, making fortunes for the old Yankee families, then marched off to die in the war, and those who came back came back determined to claim a piece of the city. They came out of Dogtown and took the firehouses and the police precincts. Then they organized the wards and voted themselves into political, if not economic, power, satisfied to run the city if they couldn't own it. Around the turn of the century, the Italians came, from Naples or somewhere in Mezzogiorno, and fought the Irish two sets of slaves battling each other for the crumbs off the master's plate until they finally figured out that together they had the numbers to take the whole table. They carved the city up like a roast beef, but were smart enough to leave the old Yankees sufficient slices to keep them fat and happy. Oh, all the comrades ere I had, they're sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts ere I had, they'd wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I gently rise and softly call, Good night and joy be with you all. One night at the clam bake, Danny saw Pasco Ferry reach out and touch Marty's hand, and they both started laughing. Sitting there, full of food and wine, wrapped in the warmth of their friends and families, their children and grandchildren, they just laughed. And Danny wondered about the things they had seen, the things they had done to share that clam bake on the beach. Pasco seemed to see the question in Danny's eyes, and unbidden said, 
We didn't outfight the old Yankees. He paused to make sure that the children were in bed and the women were in the house and then continued. We outloved them. We took our women to bed and made babies. It was true. What had made them poor, small houses crowded with hungry mouths, had made them rich. What had ostensibly made them weak had made them powerful. Looking at him now, it makes Danny sad. Liam interrupts his reverie. What's she doing with that little grease ball? Danny doesn't have to ask who he's talking about. He's looking across the fire at Pam, who's leaning against Polly. Even with the hood of a sweatshirt covering most of her hair, she looks beautiful in the firelight. Leave it alone. I'll leave it alone, Liam says. Marty finishes his song. If I had money enough to spend and leisure time to sit a while, there is a fair maid in this town that sorely has my heart beguiled. Her rosy cheeks and ruby lips, I own she has my heart in thrall. Then fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. It gets quiet then. Mary and some of the women start picking things up and bringing them back into the house and other people just sit and look into the fire or start drifting off. Danny nudges Terry. Let's go down the beach. Trying to look inconspicuous, but feeling self-conscious, Danny gets up and he and Terry sneak down the beach until the fog hides them. He pulls her down and unsnaps her jeans. Twice in one day? Terry asks. Some kind of record. The baby ain't gonna make itself. He doesn't last long. And what with all the sun all day and the sex and the booze, they fall asleep. She was 14 years old. Cassie was in bed reading a book, having fled from her parents' party downstairs, when Uncle Pasco opened the door and slipped into her room. I came upstairs to use the bathroom, he said, and I saw your light on. I was tired of the party. I don't blame you. Pasco said, a bunch of old farts, nothing to interest a pretty girl like you. You are a pretty girl, you know that, don't you? I don't know, she said, suddenly feeling sick to her stomach. Yes, you do, Pasco said. You know you are pretty and you know how to use it, I've watched you. He shut the door behind him. Cassie can still smell him. Fifteen years later, sitting on the beach by the embers of the fire, her arms wrapped around herself. She can still smell Pasco's cologne, the cigar smoke on his clothes, the red wine on his breath as he moved toward her on the bed, leaned over, took her chin in his hand, tilted her face up, and kissed her. She can still feel his tongue swirl in her mouth, the spit from his mouth seep into hers. Don't, she said, please. He answered by running his hand up the inside of her blouse. Nice, he said. No, she said. I don't want this. Yes, you do. You just don't know you do. Please, Uncle Pasco. His hands reached under her jeans. I'll tell, she said. No one will believe you, Pasco said. And if they did, what will they do? Do you know who I am? Do you know what would happen to your father, your brothers, if they came after me? You know what would happen because you're a smart girl. She knew. Fourteen years old, she was wise to the ways of their world. She knew who her father was, who Pasco Ferry was, what would happen. So when he pulled her jeans down and then climbed on top of her, she stayed silent. Stays silent still. It wasn't long after that she started to steal sips from the bottles her parents kept in the bar or found guys to buy for her. Then it was grass, then it was heroin, because heroin gave her distance from that night, made it seem like just a bad dream. When her mother asked her why and her father screamed at her and called her a junkie and a disgrace, she held her tongue and never told because she was afraid that they wouldn't believe her and more afraid that they would. She never wanted to be touched by a man again, and never has. Danny's out cold when he hears the shouting down the beach. Pam's voice, 
not so deep, but still throaty. He grabbed me. Danny looks up and sees her, pretty drunk, staggering in the deep sand, coming toward him, walking back toward the fire that's dim now. He zips his fly, gets up, and still groggy asks, What's the matter? What's going on? It's like a weird, bad dream. He grabbed me. That son of a bitch grabbed my boob. Now Danny sees Liam walking up behind her, this stupid grin on his face, his hands spread in mock innocence. It was an accident, a misunderstanding. Shit, Liam. Terry's on her feet now. She wraps Pam in her arms and Pam starts crying. It's all right, it's all right. Terry looks at Danny like, aren't you going to do something? Then Danny hears people running toward them, and then Polly and Peter, Pat and Sal Antonucci and Tony come running out of the fog. Danny grabs Liam by the elbow. Come on, get out of here. Liam jerks his arm away. It's no big deal. I just brushed against the tit is all. Misunderstanding. We need to get you out of here. Where were you? Polly asks Pam. I've been looking all over. I went for a walk, she says, to clear my head. That son of a bitch must have followed me. She points at Liam. Did he hurt you? Polly asks. He grabbed my breast. The fuck, Liam? Peter yells. Sal starts to move in. That's Sal, Danny thinks. He takes care of things for the Morettis. Pat steps between them. Take it easy. A mistake, Liam smirks. I was trying to find my way in the fog. I reached out and... Tit. Oops. Shut your stupid mouth, Pat snaps. Danny grabs Liam, holds him tight this time, and pulls him away because Polly is going ape shit. I'll kick your fucking ass, Polly yells. I'll fucking kill you, you motherfucker. Liam yells, you'll try, asshole. Danny cuffs him on the side of the head. Shut up. Liam breaks away and runs down the beach away from them. Danny starts to chase him, but Jimmy Mack is there now, grabs hold of Danny and says, let him go. Jimmy looks as Irish as corned beef. Curly red hair, pale skin with freckles, a face as open as a book. He's stocky, leaning toward chubby. And Danny knows sometimes his softness makes people think he's weak. It's a big mistake. Jimmy's a gearhead, maybe the best wheelman in New England. What he can't do with a car can't be done. He'll get you in and he'll get you out. But he's more than that. You get into a beef, you want Jimmy with you. He'll go with his hands, with a knife, or with a gun, that's what it takes. Angie bosses him around like he's a cocker spaniel, but that's because he loves her and he lets her. Jimmy Mack has balls. So Danny doesn't fight him. He watches Liam disappear into the fog. Pat walks up to Polly and Pam. I'm sorry, I apologize for my brother. He's an asshole, Polly says. I can't disagree. What he did is not acceptable, Peter says. He's drunk. No excuse. No, it's not, Pat says. I'll talk with him. We'll deal with it. Can we get her in out of the cold? Terry asks. The poor girl is shaking. He didn't do anything more to you, did he? Polly asks her. No, he just touched my breast. They take Pam back to their cottage because they don't want to wake up Pasco and Mary with this. Terry gets her settled down, even laughing a little bit, and then Polly takes her back to his place. Your fucking brother. Danny says when they've all left, I swear. Terry, she looks sad. I can't help feeling bad for him. What for? It's his way of getting attention, Terry says. It's not easy being Pat's younger brother. Pat the hockey star, Pat the basketball star, Pat the star student, the star son. His whole life Liam's been in Pat's shadow. Now dad relies more and more on Pat in the business. That will be Pat's. Liam just wants something that's his, you know? But Pam isn't his, Danny thinks. That's the problem. There's going to be hell to pay for this. What'll they want? Money, Danny says. At the end of the day, the Morettis always want the money. Liam Murphy stumbles around in the fog feeling gloriously sorry for himself. Everybody's mad at him and they shouldn't be. Okay, he thinks, I had a little too much to drink and I felt a tit. It's not like I raped her or anything for Christ's sakes. He plops down in the sand, drains the last of his beer, and throws the empty can into the water. I'm going to catch it tomorrow, he thinks. I'll get it from Pat, from my old man, from all the wives, 
not to mention Pasco and Mary Ferry and the Moretti brothers. I'm going to spend the next two days going around apologizing to everybody, including, of course, Pam, and we'll have to eat a healthy ration of shit. Maybe I should just go down to Florida until this blows over. Anyway, it's tomorrow's problem. He pushes himself up off the sand to go back to his cottage, sleep this off, deal with the hangover, and then figure it out. He walks up the beach and is almost to the road when he sees four figures in the fog. Peter, Polly, Sal, and Tony. Hello, motherfucker, Polly says. He raises the baseball bat. Liam smiles and says, I guess the coke deal's off, huh? Polly swings the bat. Danny's been asleep maybe an hour, hour and a half when he hears the screen door bang. What the hell, he thinks. Danny rolls out of bed and gets his jeans and a shirt on and goes to the door. Liam lies on the stoop, one hand stretched up toward the door handle. There's blood all over him. Jesus Christ, Danny says. Then he yells, Pat, Jimmy, come here, quick. They get Liam into the back seat and Jimmy Mack drives like a bat out of hell up Goshen Beach Road and onto Route 1 to South County Hospital. It takes a long 10 minutes and they aren't sure Liam is going to make it. He goes into convulsions, his body jerking and racking while Pat struggles to hold him still. The doctor isn't sure Liam is going to live either. His skull is fractured, there's swelling on the brain. He has two broken ribs and maybe internal injuries, something about a ruptured spleen. What the hell happened to him? The doc asks. He's young, a junior guy on staff to pull this shift, and he's shook up. Nobody tells him anything, even though they know goddamn well what happened. Paulie, Peter, Sal, and Tony went looking for Liam, found him on the beach, and beat the wicked piss out of him. They got carried away. Liam had something coming to him, no question. They should have slapped him around a little, but not this. The nurses roll Liam into the operating room. Long goddamn night in that hospital, pacing around the waiting room, drinking coffee, waiting for word. I swear if he dies, Pat says. Don't think like that, Danny says. They go through the usual bullshit. He's a fighter, he's young, he's strong. Terry gets there with her parents. John Murphy has seen a lot in his life, but he hasn't seen a son die. What the hell happened? He asks Pat like it's his fault, like he should have been looking after his brother and didn't. Pat tells him, you shouldn't let him drink, Pat's mother says to him. You know that. The waiting room is crowded. The Murphys, Danny and Terry, Jimmy and Angie, Pat and Sheila, Cassie. It's Sheila does most of the talking with the doctors, comes back with the reports that there's nothing to report, except that it's touch and go. Down at the coffee machine, Cassie says to Danny, don't go all Irish on this. If you go after the Morettis, there'll be a war and then someone will get killed. Danny don't say anything. First things first, they have to see what happens, but if Liam dies, there's going to be no restraining Pat. He'll drop the gloves. Pasco Ferry knows that too. Peter Moretti is smart enough to go over first thing in the morning and tell him what happened, because the old man doesn't like surprises and Peter doesn't want him to get the story from the Murphys first. Pasco ain't happy. Takes in the story, thinks about it for a long minute, then looks over his coffee cup and says, Now you come for permission? No, you come for permission before you do something. If you had, I wouldn't have given it. Polly starts to say, What Liam Murphy did, you wanted to be a man? Pasco says, You should have gone after him one-on-one -on -one with your fists, not with three other guys and a bat. Now you just look weak. Weak? I bash his fucking head in. One of my guests, Pasco yells, at my party, in front of my house. I should put you in the bed next to him. Peter says, you're right, Pasco, of course. We should have waited. Now we have to make this right, Pasco says. Make it right how? Peter asks, you're going to pay after medical bills. Bullshit, Polly yells. Do you want to repeat that, young Polly? Pasco leans slightly over the table and looks at him. Polly drops his eyes. He knows the next word out of his mouth could put him in a landfill. 
Pasco is furious. Everything we spend years putting together, keeping together is going to fall apart over a piece of ass? If this horny Irish fuck taps out, I'll have to give John something, maybe even Paulie Moretti, or go to war with him. And if I do that, I might lose a whole wing of the family. Hard to know how Paulie's old man will react from inside the ACI. Hard to know which way the Antonucci's and Palumbo's of the world would go. I don't know, maybe John would settle for one of them. If I go to war against John, I'll win. But at what cost in blood and money? Fuck these hotheads. Be grateful it's half, Pasco says. And then you go to church, light a candle, and pray this kid don't die. They put Liam in an ambulance and haul him up to Rhode Island Hospital in Providence because South County can't do the surgery needed to relieve the pressure on his brain. He's still unconscious and the doctors won't say if he's going to make it or not. Liam's ex-girlfriend Karen comes out into the waiting room and hugs Cassie. I'm sorry, I can't work on him, I'm too close. I understand, Cassie says. They have good people in there though, Karen says. The best, I'll keep you informed, I promise. She looks shook, sad, Danny thinks. Christ, she still loves him. Thank you. The wives close rank. Sheila, Terry, and Angie look after Catherine Murphy, go for coffees, bring back trays of food, make the phone calls that need to be made. Jimmy Mack takes Danny aside. I say we hit them now. Danny says, we have to wait. If Liam makes it, we're looking at one scenario. If he doesn't, we're looking at another. We at least owe them a beating, Jimmy says. Let's wait to see what we owe them. He stops talking because two men walk in and Danny lamps them as cops, detectives, right away. They walk up to Danny and one says, Detective Carey, South Kingston Police. Are you Daniel Ryan? Yeah. You found the victim? He came to my door. Did he tell you who did this to him? Carey asks. No, Danny says. He passed out. He's been unconscious since. Do you have any idea who might have done this to him? No, Danny says. You all come down from Providence, right? Carrie asks. Rent places in Goshen? That's right. You're friends with Pasco Ferry. So this cop knows exactly who we are, Danny thinks. He knows the score, that no one is going to tell him shit, and we'll handle this internally. I know Pasco, yeah. We're going to go talk to him too, Carrie says. I doubt he knows anything. Carrie smirks. Me too. Pasco has a good relationship with the local cops. Gary hands Danny his card. If you think of anything you may have forgotten, give me a call. I'll keep a good thought about your friend. Thanks, Danny says. Hey, don't bother the family. They don't know anything either. Gary walks away and Danny steps over to a trash can and tosses the card. That's when he sees Chris Palumbo get off the elevator. Shit, Danny says. He and Jimmy walk over to head him off. Maybe not the best time, Chris, Danny says, wondering who sent him, whether it was Peter Moretti or Pasco. Or maybe Chris came on his own boot to see if there's any information he can use for himself. Jesus, Danny, Chris says. This is terrible, a terrible thing. Yeah. How did this get so out of hand, Chris says. Ask your buddies, Jimmy says. Chris holds up his hands. I had nothing to fucking do with this. They had asked me first, I would have told them go through channels. Too bad they didn't ask you then, Danny says. Look, Chris says, I know everyone's pretty raw right now. You think? Danny asks. But we all need to keep cool heads, Chris says. Let's get Liam out of the woods, then we can... Get out of here, Chris, Danny says. Nothing personal, but no one wants to see anyone from the Moretti family right now. Jesus, Pat sees you here? I get it, Chris says. I'm gone. Do me a favor, though. If the right moment comes up, give my respect. Yeah, okay. Goodbye, Chris. See you. Palumbo gets back in the elevator. The ball's on that guy, Jimmy says. He's covering his ass, Danny says. He's probably on his way over to Federal Hill now to tell the Morettis they did the right thing. And to tell them Liam's still alive. Liam makes it through surgery, which Karen tells them is a big deal, but he's not out of the woods yet. 
It's two more long days before they're ready to say that Liam is going to make it. Loses his spleen and needs plastic surgery to repair the broken orbital bone under his eye. But his brain is okay. Well, as okay as Liam's brain can be, Danny thinks. He and Pat go to talk to Pasco. They find him on the beach in front of his house, two poles in the water, baited for stripers. What Liam did wasn't right, Pasco says before Pat can get a word out. Pat says, but he didn't deserve that. They beat him half to death, Danny says. He almost died. He touched the maid guy's woman, Pasco says, adjusting the tension on one of the lines. If that girl and Paulie were married, Paulie would have been within his rights to kill your brother. Liam was drunk, Pat said. We all were. Pasco shrugs. Drunk or sober, Liam had disrespected Paulie Moretti in a very personal way. The beating got out of hand, no question, but the Murphy kid had taken his chances. I came here out of respect, Pat says. I came here to ask your permission. To do what? Pasco asks. Give Paulie a beating? Peter and Sal and Tony too? You think even if I gave the nod, you can take all four of them? I think we can, Pat says. Pasco smiles. Pat Danny Jimmy. Just fists, I swear, Pat says. Where do you think you are, high school? Pasco asks. Let it go. Your brother is alive, God bless. I made Paulie cover the bills, let it pass. What does your father say? I haven't talked to him about it. When you do, Pasco says, he'll tell you what I'm telling you and what I told Peter and Paulie. We worked too hard to put this thing together. I'm not going to let it fall apart because your brother got drunk and felt some tete. Young men are stupid and their balls are too full. Pasco remembers when it was that way with him, and the old bulls had to teach him what was what. Now he has to be the teacher. He turns and looks at these two young Irish bucks, all on fire with indignation and the hunger for revenge. They have to learn. Vengeance is an expensive luxury, too expensive in this case. Too rich for their blood, anyway. He says, take your brother home. Be glad you're not at his wake. Danny knows that if they hit back at the Moretti brothers or Sal, it will be a personal affront to Pasco Ferry. Then Pasco would approve a hit on them. They're going to get away with it, Pat says as they drive away and head back up to Providence. Looks like it, Danny says. It sucks, but there it is. End of story. Eight. Except it isn't. It might all have died down and blown over like a summer squall. But a week later, Danny goes to visit Liam in the hospital. And when he gets up to the room, she's there. Pam. Smiling, looking gorgeous in a white summer dress, holding Liam's hand and he's smiling back, weakly but bravely. Danny, he don't know what to say, but Liam says, Danny, I think you know Pam. You think I know Pam, you dumb fuck? You think I know Pam? Sure, yeah, hi. Hi, Danny. Like this is just another day at the frickin' beach. She yaps on about some real estate shit or something, but Danny ain't hearing none of it. His head is whirling. Finally, he hears her say, Well, I'd better be on my way. Thanks for coming by, Liam says. Pam leans down and kisses him on the cheek. Danny follows her out into the corridor. No disrespect, he says. But Pam, what the hell? He apologized to me, Pam says. He was very sweet. And what Polly did to him was wrong. The hell you think Polly would do to him now? Danny asks, his temper rising. He saw you here with him, holding his hand? I'm not with Polly anymore, Pam says. He's an animal. Fucking A, he's an animal, Danny thinks. An animal, don't begin to describe it. What he's gonna do when he hears about this. Does Paulie know? Does he know what? She answers, really cool, like Danny has no business asking her questions. That you're dumping him. He calls, she says. I don't call back. Jesus, Pam. It's my life, she says. Yeah, it is and it isn't, Danny thinks. 
It's your life, but it's all our lives you're fucking with, and you have to get that. You're not stupid. Pam says, anyway, I feel a little guilty. Like maybe some of it was my fault, what happened. I was kind of drunk. Maybe I let him on. And he didn't really hurt me. Maybe I was just being, you know, a drama queen. Yeah, now you think this, Pam? She shrugs one pretty bare shoulder and walks away. Right past Pat, coming down the hall with a coffee cabinet for Liam. Pat takes one look at her, walks into Liam's room, hands him the milkshake and says, You dumb shit. Liam's smile is phony. She just came to apologize for what happened. Yeah, well, you tell her you forgive her, Pat says, and that's that. Big brother, Liam says, you don't tell me what's what. You've already caused enough trouble. And what have you done about it? Liam asks. Nothing. It's not that simple. Whatever you say. Fuck you, Liam, Pat says. Yeah, fuck me. You stay away from that girl. Yeah. Except a week later, when Liam is taking the wheelchair ride out of the hospital, it's Pam pushing the chair. Pam who drives him home. Pam who moves in with him. Okay, Danny thinks maybe Liam is really in love with her, but maybe it's a giant fuck you to Paulie Moretti. Like, look who really won the fight. You may have beat me up, but look whose bed she's in now. Look who's tapping your girl. It's freaking genius, really. Liam can't physically hit back at Paulie, so he gets back at him in the worst way, slicing his balls clean off, turning him into a cornuto. Every bar, every club he goes in, Paulie hears about it. His goombas walk right up to the edge with him. Hey, whatever happened to that Pam chick? Did I see your old squeeze out the other night? Who did I see her with? Can't remember. Dangerous shit, but irresistible. I mean, you have to bust balls, right? Who the fuck knew that Paulie really loved her? That she wasn't just arm candy, a walking status symbol? Who knew that as he confessed to his brother in the small hours of a dark morning, Pamela ripped his heart out? Now the slow burn is on up Federal Hill. The Moretti's fume, the embers of their resentment stoked by the whispered jokes, the sly, sny looks, the sight of Pam out with Liam Murphy. Providence is a small town in a small state. You can't go anywhere without seeing someone you know. Someone who knows you, somebody who knows somebody. It's going to happen, Danny knows. It just needs a spark. Dumbass Brendan Handrigan touches it off. Handrigan is a minor player, like Danny, a collector for the Murphy Loan Shark operations. Early October, he and Danny are sitting in a bar after doing a job, tossing a few back, and Brendan says, Liam's cock is like the Starship Enterprise, boldly going where no man has gone before. A good two inches past Paulie anyway, what I hear. Jesus, Brennan, Danny says. Because Frankie Vecchio hears it. Frankie's a soldier in the Moretti crew. He's sitting at the next table with a couple of his guys, hears it and looks over. You'll keep your fucking mouth shut if you know what's good for you. Yeah, well, Brendan Handrigan never knew what was good for him. If he had, he might have graduated high school or gone into the Navy or something. Now he makes some lame response about it being a free country, but finishes his drink and leaves the bar. You should tell your friend there to button his lip, Frankie V tells Danny. He don't mean no harm, Danny says. It was a stupid joke the kind guys make to each other a dozen times a day. Back in the good times, before the clam bake, they'd laugh about it. But that was before, and now feelings are raw. And Liam has stolen Paulie's woman, and it isn't funny. Frankie V can't freaking wait to find Paulie and tell him. He goes hustling over to the American Vending Machine office, an old two-story white building on Atwell's Avenue that doubles as the Moretti family base and a social club, and tattles like a girl. Paulie goes predictably apeshit. We gotta do something about this, he says to his brother. Liam Murphy groping his girl at a party is one thing. Taking her away is another. And now the whole town is clowning him? A dipshit like Brendan Handrigan thinks it's okay to run his mouth? I mean, where's it going to end, Peter? Peter gets it. People start to disrespect you in one area of your life, it leaks into others. 
Pretty soon they don't want to make payments. They don't think they need to do what they're told. They think maybe they can step into your spot. With the move up Peter wants to make, he can't let his little brother look like a douchebag. He has other reasons, too. Peter is a little bit of a philosopher. He believes that no problem comes without an opportunity. What do you want to do? You know what I want to do. But Pasco Ferry tells them no. Standing in the little kitchen area, he stirs the chowder that's been simmering on the stove since early morning. Real Rhode Island chowder, with clear broth, not that milky baby puke they throw at you up in Boston. He turns and looks deliberately at Polly Moretti. If you hit John Murphy's son, we'll be in a war that won't end until we kill every Mick in Rhode Island. Okay with me, Polly says. Is that right? Pasco asks. It's okay with you some of our own people get killed in the process? Our businesses are disrupted? Okay with you we lose cops and politicians when we start littering the state with bodies? This stronza is worth all that? Some joke about your little peche is worth all that? It isn't, Pasco thinks as he turns his eyes to Peter. But the Murphy-controlled docks are, aren't they, Peter? To you, though, not to me. I fought my wars. Polly says, if my father was in charge, but he isn't, Pasco says. If you want to go to the ACI and ask him what you should do, be my guest. He's going to tell you the same thing. You can't clip Liam Murphy over this. They disrespected us, Peter says. We can't just do nothing. Did I say do nothing? Pasco asks. He sips the chowder, then adds a little pepper. The doctor has told him no pepper. But what do doctors really know? Nine. Danny finishes his chop suey and wipes up the gravy with bread. The old Chinese joints, they still serve slices of white bread with the chop suey because their mostly guaylo customers don't want to waste good gravy. Brendan is doing the same thing. The two of them came to get the $3 lunch special before going to visit this deadbeat over on Hope Street. The irony isn't lost on Danny that a degenerate gambler lives on Hope Street. Where the hell else would he live? Let's go do this, Brendan says. Danny nods. Ain't neither of them too happy about it. It's never fun going to break a guy down. He wipes his lips on the paper napkin, gets up, pushes back his chair, and follows Brendan onto Eddy Street. At first he thinks it's tomato sauce on his shirt, but he remembers he had Chinese, not Italian. Then he sees Brendan crumple to the sidewalk. Big mouth motherfucker, Paulie says, and he shoots Brendan two more times in the stomach. Then he steps back into a car and Frankie V drives him away. Danny can't fucking believe it's happening. He's never seen anyone shot before. Brendan is crying, trying to hold himself inside himself. God, Danny, help me, Jesus. He bleeds out right there in front of Danny, right there on Eddie Street in the cliched broad daylight. Everybody sees everything and nobody sees nothing. That's what John Murphy tells Danny that night in the back room of the Glockamora pub in Dogtown. It's your classic Irish-American joint, done in dark wood with a few tables and deep booths. The tricolor flag on the wall, Irish music in the jukebox, faded photos of Republican martyrs on the wall, posters reminding you not to forget the men behind the wire. You go in there to be Irish, Danny thinks, as if you're not already, as if you can get away from it anywhere anyway. Saturday nights they have live music, some musicians from Ireland or some Americans who just think they are. Fiddles and tin whistles and banjos and guitars, and it's a little too come all ye for Danny's taste. The kitchen serves up lamb stew and shepherd's pie, fish and chips and a decent burger, and you often have three generations in the place at the same time. Nostalgic, Danny thinks, for a life we never led. But the Glock has been the headquarters of the Irish mob since the turn of the century, and it isn't going to change even though Dogtown is dying. Fewer of the Irish, the Jews, the Chinese, more blacks, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans. In a way, it's a good thing because more of the Irish have moved to the better parts of the city or the suburbs. 
They left the docks and the factories to become doctors and lawyers and businessmen. The old men, they hold on because the neighborhood is like an old chair they've grown used to. They're sitting in the back room now, the inner sanctum where John Murphy holds court, him and his cronies, sipping their whiskey and plotting. Conspiracies that go nowhere, Danny thinks. Dreams that are stillborn. John Murphy is the king of an empire that died a long time ago. The light of a long dead star. The old men crouch around that booth like leprechauns and advise that they have no choice now. There is no gray area now. This time they have to hit back. Pat agrees. His dad doesn't. That's what Moretti wants us to do, John says. He taps the tips of his fingers against the side of his head. Use your brains. Do you really think that Peter gives a damn about your brother stealing Paulie's girlfriend? All he cares about is money. He'd sell his sisters to a Chinese cat house if he thought there was a dollar in it. Your idiot brother just gave him an excuse is all for a provocation. What do you mean? Pat asks his father. As long as Pasco is the boss, John says, we'll have peace. Unless you do something stupid, that is. But Pasco is moving on soon, and the Moretti's are just looking for an excuse to start a war. You want to hand that to them, wrapped up in a pretty bow, do you? They want the docks, Bernie Hughes pipes up. Tall, skinny, saturnine, hair as white and wispy as the cotton in an aspirin bottle. Bernie is an accountant, John's money man, Marty's before that. He sees nothing but the bottom line. Peter wants to move up into Pasco's empty chair, but to do that he needs to show he can be a big earner and make everybody a lot of money. But he's maxed out on his own businesses. The vending machines, the protection, the gambling, the drugs and needs a fresh source of income. That would be our source of income, Pat. That Peter is smart, John says, and Chris Palumbo is smarter. If we give them a war, they'll take the docks. We can't stop them. They have too many men and too much money. They'd have done it already. It's only Pasco holding them back. If we answer for Handrigan, Pasco will have no choice but to bring his entire family against us. He'll bring in Boston if he has to in Hartford. Maybe even New York. So we have to just take this? Pat says. Bernie Hughes says what John doesn't want to. Look, we all know it should have been Liam who got shot. Pasco Ferry stayed Paulie's hand from that, but had to give him something, so they let him do Andrigan. It can end there. Fuck that, Danny says. I'm telling the cops what I saw. Brendan's blood is still spattered on his shirt. That's not our way, John says. Fuck that Amerta bullshit, Danny says. I don't owe those wops nothing. What do you owe us, John asks. The question hangs there. Finally, Pat says, your family, Danny. Am I? Danny asks. How many times have you broken bread at my table, John asks. How many times did I put food in your mouth when your own father... Enough, Dad, Pat says. I gave you my daughter, for Christ's sakes, John thunders. My daughter! And this is the first time, Danny thinks, the first time you've brought me into the back room to sit with the men, with the family. But he don't say that. That night, two Providence homicide detectives bring Danny into the interrogation room. It stinks of cigarette smoke and fear. They sit him down at the table and start in. You were with Andrigan when he got shot, O'Neill says. He's your classic veteran Irish cop. Broad face, no splintered with red veins, cheeks going to fat, dead eyes. Yeah, who shot him? Didn't see. Shit, Viola says. You got his blood all over you, I heard. Viola's the younger partner. Thinner, darker, black hair slicked straight back, a nose like a ferret. Didn't see anything, Danny says. Danny knows they're just going through the motions, and the last thing in the world they want is for him to speak the name Paulie Moretti. The fix is in. They do the dance for an hour and then kick him out. Danny goes home. Terry is waiting. What did you tell them? She asks. He looks at her like she's a total fucking idiot. She's John Murphy's daughter. She knows what he told them. 10.
John Murphy drives down to the shore and meets Pasco in the parking lot of Stop and Shop. He gets out of his own car and slides into Pasco's. It breaks my heart, Pasco says, that this started at my party. The young are hard-headed. They think with their dicks, Pasco says. Hey, were we any different? Murphy laughs. No. I'm sorry about Liam, Pasco says. If they had come to me first. Pasco is fed up with all this. What he wants to do in his old age is sit on the beach, dig cohogs, catch crabs, take siestas, play with his grandkids. He's made his money, made his bones, now he wants life in the sunshine. Spend summers at his beach house, a few weeks in January and February down in Pompano. You won't respond to this last thing? Pasco asks. It's over as far as we're concerned, John says. A good deal for him. Poor, dumb, insignificant Brendan Handrigan takes the bullet in place of his son. But what about the Moretti brothers? Are they ready to let this go? Pasco says. It would help if Liam would stop seeing that woman. I'll talk to him. Danny is there for the talk. After Sunday roast beef at the Murphys. They're out on the lawn, him and Pat and Liam and the old man, having a couple beers while the women clean up, and Murphy says, This girl, she's out of your life. Says who? Liam asks. The Morettis? Among other people. Who? Liam asks, an edge coming into his voice. Pasco Ferry? What the fuck? Watch your mouth. They tell us who we can love now? Liam asks. Who we can't? Tell you what, Dad, why don't we just pull down our pants and let them fuck us in the ass? In your mother's house on a Sunday. There are thousands of women out there, Pat argues. Why her? I love her. More than your own family? Pat asks. Love someone else, Murphy says. She's not for you. I love her, Dad. Pat grabs him by the collar and shoves him against the old oak tree. You selfish prick. We're going to put Brendan Handrigan in the ground and all you think about is yourself. Let him go, Pat, Murphy orders. Pat releases his grip. She's out of your life, Liam, Murphy says. End of story. Looking at Liam's face, Danny wonders. The funeral is wicked sad. Brendan didn't have a lot of friends, no wife, no girl. His father died when Brendan was, what, 12? So there's just two sisters and the mother. The whole Murphy clan and associates show up, though. Murphy didn't have to tell them, either. Respect is respect. But Liam isn't there. Where the hell is my brother? Terry whispers to Danny as they walk down the aisle, slide into the pew to kneel. He'll come, Danny says. But he isn't so sure. Liam's probably ashamed to show his face, knows that this is partly his fault, and maybe it's best he don't. Maybe better for Brendan's family. The mother, she comes up to Danny on the church steps after the mass, her red face twisted with grief. You didn't see nothing, Danny Ryan? She asks. You didn't see nothing? Danny don't know what to say. She turns away from him and her daughters lead her to the car for the ride out to the cemetery. It's okay, Terry says. No, it's not, Danny answers. They drive out to Swamp Point for the burial. Stand around the graveside in their black suits and dresses, like crows, Danny thinks, listening to the priest drone on. Then the bagpipe starts in. They wake Brendan at the Glockamora. Brendan's mother is resentful as hell at the Murphys, but not so resentful she don't let them lay out the spread. What's she going to do? She don't have any money, and it's the least the Murphys could do after her son took a bullet for theirs. So there's a spread laid out, open bar, of course, and people stand around trying to think of good things to say about Brendan until the liquor kicks in, and the food, and it winds down into just another party. Then Liam walks in. With Pam. Classic, in-your-face, fuck-the-world-I-do-what-I-want Liam Murphy. You believe this? Jimmy Mac asks. He's a pisser, Danny says. Cassie, she's wryly amused, watches this scene unfold and says, Oh, this is going to be good. 
The whole place gets quiet as Liam leads Pam to a table, holds out a chair for her, and then sits down. He looks like he's getting off on the drama, but Pam doesn't. She looks damned uncomfortable. As well she should, Danny thinks, with Brendan Handrigan just laid into the ground. Up at the bar, Sheila Murphy's jaw gapes like it's broken. Then she swivels on her stool and turns her back. Pam visibly flinches, leans over and whispers something to Liam, who shakes his head, then gets up and walks over to the bar to order. Stands right next to Pat and Sheila. Pat, Sheila, he says. But his eyes are like, you got anything to say? He orders a walker black for himself and a glass of white wine for Pam, waits while Bobby the bartender pours the drinks, and then he walks back to his table with this fuck you smile on his face. He sets the glass of wine in front of Pam, sits back down, and then looks around the room to see if anyone wants to challenge him. No one does. Which, Danny knows, isn't going to work for Liam. So Liam stands up, taps on his glass for attention, and announces... I just want everyone here to know that Pam and I went to Las Vegas and got married. So everyone, raise a glass to Mr. and Mrs. Liam Murphy. Jesus, Danny murmurs. Amazing, says Cassie. Terry shakes her head. Bobby walks out from behind the bar and scoots into the back room. Now the shit's going to hit, Jimmy Mack observes. Truly. The door to the back room opens and John Murphy comes out, Pat right behind him. Showtime, Cassie says. Danny's waiting for Murphy to ask his son to step into the back for a private word and then for Liam to come back and take Pam out of there, but that's not what happens. What happens is Murphy leans over, kisses Pam on the cheek and says, Welcome to the family. Jesus shit, Cassie says. Pat comes over and sits next to Danny. Pat, what the hell? Danny asks. Pat shrugs. Old man Murphy reaches over and takes Pam's hand. This is going to end badly, Cassie says. Danny thinks it's one of her cynical jokes, but then turns and sees that her eyes aren't laughing. They're serious. Serious and sad. Like she sees something, the rest of them don't. 11. Pam Murphy, nay Davies, never thought she'd honeymoon in a rundown house in the country. Then again, she never thought she'd marry an Irish guy from Providence, Rhode Island. Greenwich, Connecticut is only 150 miles from Providence, but it might as well be on the other side of the world. A leafy, old money, high wasp bedroom community of New York Greenwich couldn't be more different from blue-collar Irish-Italian Providence, and Pam couldn't have had an upbringing more different from her husband, Liam Murphy's. Her father was a stockbroker, not a gangster. He took the train into the city every weekday morning, was home for 6.30 cocktails and 7.15 dinner every night. Her mother was a Connecticut matron, a genuine beauty often described by admiring friends as swan-like, who spent her days on charitable committees, gardening clubs, daughters of the American Revolution activities, and vodka tonics. Pam's big brothers, Bradley and Patton, lettered in lacrosse and hockey at their private boarding schools. Carefully made gentlemen's bees and nothing higher, sailed Long Island Sound, and were protective of their little sister. Not that she required much protection. Not from boys, anyway. She wasn't an especially pretty child. Going into middle school, the kindest description of her was plain. If her mother was indeed a swan, Pam was the ugly duckling, and she felt her mother's poorly hidden disappointment keenly. Pam resisted all efforts to pretty her up, the makeup, the dresses, the dance lessons to improve her grace and posture, preferring to stay in her room and read. After Montessori Elementary School, she was shipped off to Miss Porter's school in Farmington, whose alumni included, in addition to her mother, Barbara Hutton, Gloria Vanderbilt, and Jackie Kennedy Onassis. She certainly wasn't the richest girl there, nor the poorest, but somewhere in the lower middle. The cruelty of that age gifted her with acne and the inevitable comparisons to a pizza. 
The sadism of schoolgirls knows no bounds. They attacked her for her complexion, her awkwardness, her lack of interest in boys. Word was joyfully passed that she was a lesbian, that she harbored secret crushes on several of the prettier girls who had, of course, summarily spurned her. If I was going to the Y, one of her alleged targets said, sticking her tongue between her index and middle fingers, I'd go to a much prettier Y. Her freshman year, she fled home almost every weekend, holed up in her room, variously crying, reading her books, and dreading Sunday nights when her parents would drive her back to Farmington, lecturing all the while on the importance of making friends and participating in the social life of the school. Pam didn't tell them about the taunts. She was too ashamed. Pam thought about running away from school, running away from home, killing herself. Something happened between Pam's sophomore and junior years. She blossomed. The family had a summer home in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, 25 minutes but still a world away from Goshen, and Pam got up one morning ready for another day of hiding beneath a sunbonnet at the beach club. It would be an exaggeration to say that it happened overnight, but it seemed to have happened overnight. Looking into the mirror to scrub her face, she saw skin that was almost clear, as if some compassionate goddess had come during the night and stripped her of her shame. The summer seemed to do the rest. Over the next few weeks, the sun turned her skin a clear tan, baked her body into fine marble, bleached her mousy hair to a golden blonde, her eyes an oceanic blue. One rainy morning that wasn't a beach day, Pam asked her mother if they could go shopping. Not for books, for clothes. Janet Davies was ecstatic. She finally had a daughter. They went shopping, first in Watch Hill, then over in Newport, later on Fifth Avenue. Davies complained about the credit card bills, but was secretly pleased, happy for both his wife and daughter. It would be easier now. It wasn't. What had been a mother's pity became a mother's jealousy. As Pam transformed into a young woman of exceptional loveliness, friends, family, even people sitting at tables next to theirs in restaurants started to remark on Pam's beauty and charm. The swan began to see the wrinkles in her own elegant neck and compare them unfavorably to her signet's alabaster skin. The mother withdrew. Not physically, Janet was always there physically, but she removed herself emotionally. Had she been asked, she would have denied it indignantly. She probably didn't realize it herself. Mirrors reveal so little. But she left her daughter to undergo and try to comprehend the unanticipated metamorphosis. Pam learned the wrong lesson. That if she was suddenly, for the first time in her life, valued for her beauty, her beauty was her only value. So when the best-looking boy at Hotchkiss spotted her at a mixer and moved in fast, Pam was as defenseless as an orphaned fawn and found herself in a Farmington motel room looking over his shoulder at a cheap painting of a sailboat. The funny thing was, Trey Sherburn actually fell in love with her. What 18-year-old man-boy wouldn't have? Robert Spencer Sherburn III wasn't as much a predator as he was a romantic, and in the morning he wanted to drive to New Hampshire, where for some reason he thought he could marry a 16-year-old girl he didn't yet know was pregnant. Pam was ready to go. She was in love. They didn't make it to New Hampshire. They didn't even make it to the parking lot. Pam's two brothers, acting on tips from friends, tracked them to the motel in the morning, beat the shit out of Trey, and hauled their sister back to Greenwich to face the collective family shame. At first, Dad wanted to prosecute Trey for statutory rape, but Mom wanted to spare her daughter the public disgrace. Our name's in the newspapers, darling. The Davieses and the Sherburns worked it out as their families had been doing since the freaking Mayflower, quietly and discreetly. The Davieses didn't press rape charges against Trey. The Sherburns didn't have the brothers charged with aggravated assault. Trey did a gap year on a service project in Tanzania, and Pam went off to New Mexico for a discreet abortion. Pam came back to finish Miss Porter's, then went to Trinity College, 
where she majored in business administration with a minor in classics and sorority parties. If she ever thought of Trey or their unborn child, it was neither deeply nor for long. She had learned from her mother the fine art of burying a warm heart under a glacial field of ice. After college, she got a job with a high-end real estate firm in Westport and did very well, spending weekends at the family house in Watch Hill. Watch Hill is either New England money so old it needs a walker to circulate, or new New York money, meaning the families have owned homes there for less than 200 years. Westerly is a granite quarry town settled by Italian immigrant stonemasons who made beautiful churches and big Sunday dinners. In Watch Hill, money works for people, and in Westerly, people work for money. If people in Watch Hill go to Westerly, it's usually for pizza, but Pam went slumming there one night at a local bar where Paulie Moretti started flirting with her because why not take a shot? Pam flirted back because, well, other than an actual black guy or a Puerto Rican, who could she date that would piss her parents off more than an Italian? Even a Jewish guy would have been preferable, and sleeping with Pauli Moretti was Pam's revolt against her utter waspishness. Not that she ever brought him home to meet mom and dad. That would have been a total disaster. Her revolt was secret, satisfying only to herself. A fling, an adventure before settling down with Donald or Roger or Tad or whoever. So when Polly invited her to a clam bake, not in Watch Hill, but in the more blue-collar reaches of Goshen, she was glad to go. Because by this time, she had figured out that he was actually in the mafia, which added a frisson of danger. Then Liam Murphy grabbed her breast. Then Polly showed what a mafia guy is really like. Then she went to the hospital to apologize, and... There was the Irish version of Trey the best-looking boy in the mob. Charming. Hurt. Vulnerable. She felt the ice melting. Next thing she knew, she was in a Las Vegas wedding chapel marrying Liam Murphy without the least idea of the ramifications. Now tucked away in a crappy safe house 10 miles from anything, with a husband who a lot of people want to kill and who responds to it by drinking half the day and all night. She's starting to learn. 12. The prison sits off Route 95. Rhode Island's central thoroughfare, like a constant reminder of what can happen to you if you slip on the banana peel. You can't go from Warwick to Cranston to Providence without seeing it, and maybe that's the idea. It's old, built in 1878. The central section is gray stone with a tin cupola. The newer side buildings are red brick. A high fence topped with coils of barbed wire surrounds the complex. When Danny was in elementary school, they used to take the kids on field trips to the ACI to scare the shit out of them. But it usually backfired because a lot of the kids in Danny's school used the occasion to visit relatives. Now the Moretti brothers sit across a table from their father in the visiting room at the ACI. Jackie Moretti's hair is still thick, but it's gone white in the joint. He's still a strong man, though, neck like a bull's, big sloping shoulders. No one is going to mess with him in here, even if he wasn't connected. Most people in there could tell you Jackie Moretti's stories. How he was all of 19 when he first got wet, on a two-bit booster who didn't want to pay his street tax. How he did his first stretch on a Grand Theft Auto and didn't give up no one. Not his partners, not the chop shop, not nobody. How he got made by taking out two guys from New Haven who thought Eastern Connecticut should belong to them and not Pasco Ferry. Or how about the degenerate gambler who thought Jackie was an asshole he didn't have to pay. And Jackie ripped him out of the lobby of the High Life Fronton in Newport took him out into the parking lot, opened his car door, and asked him which hand he used to take out his wallet. What? The terrified guy asked. When you go to buy a highlight ticket, which hand do you use to take out your wallet? My right. Jackie made him stick his right hand into the car door and then kicked it shut. Then with the guy's hand still in the door, he drove the car around the parking lot. 
After that, Jackie was an up-and-comer, a meat-eater, an earner who got his own crew, put more money on the street, did bank jobs and truck hijackings. But mostly they tell the story about Jackie and Rocky Ferraro. Pasco had put out a ban on selling or using heroin because it brought down so much heat from the feds. Rocky Ferraro, one of Jackie's crew, ignored it on both counts, first selling to the Moolies in South Providence and then starting to use his own product. It was a problem, and Jackie said he'd take care of it. He and one of his guys picked Rocky up one night to go to a Reds hockey game, except they never made it there. Jackie pulled over, then pulled his gun, stuck it in Rocky's mouth, and pulled the trigger several times. What made the story extraordinary was that Rocky was Jackie's half-brother. Which made the next Thanksgiving dinner, well, awkward and also apparently really offended both the judge and the jury when, six years later, Jackie's guy flipped and put him in the jackpot for the murder. He embarrassed the family, Jackie said at his sentencing hearing. So you killed your own brother? The judge said. Half-brother, Jackie said. What, maybe I should have only half killed him? The judge maxed him out. Even then, Jackie had a chance to save himself. The feds offered him the complete package, immunity, the program, the whole nine yards, to go rat on Pasco Ferry. But Jackie told them they could line up and suck his dick. So now a series of punks perform that service for him as he resides in the north wing of the old stone house, plays cards, and cooks pasta for the guys on Sundays. Now the guard stands far off and keeps his back turned. Ain't supposed to, but there's no CO in Rhode Island dumb enough to crowd the Moretti's on visiting day. The guards have to live in the state. They have brothers and cousins out there, and a very nice contribution gets made every year into the Widows and Orphans Fund. Jackie sucks on his cigarette. He's got emphysema, but he knows he ain't ever coming out of this place anyway, so what the fuck? He looks at Paulie. You ain't the only guy ever got dumped. Sack up, get a new girl, move on. They're rubbing it in our faces, Peter says. It's deliberate disrespect. What does Pasco say? Jackie asks. Fuck Pasco, Polly says. You'll have a hard time repeating that with dirt in your mouth, says Jackie. There are things you don't say. There are things you don't even think. They sit quiet for a few seconds. It should be you, Peter says. On top, Jackie smiles. I'm in here, Pasco is out there, that's the way it breaks sometimes. What, you want me to talk to him? Yes, Polly says. No, Jackie answers. He's the boss, he's made his ruling, that's it. He wants us to sit down with the Irish, Polly says. Then sit down, Jackie says. You're on the goal line, don't cough the ball up. Pasco retires to Florida, then you do what you want. String the Murphys up by their skinny Irish dicks. Pasco's more concerned about his pinnacle hand, bocce ball, whatever. But you go against him now, he has you clipped and I give my blessing. On your own sons, Peter says, apparently forgetting his father's history. You have love for your family, Jackie says. And you have love for this thing. They're two different loves. But yes, your love for this thing comes first. Old school, their old man, Peter thinks. Old freaking school. They agree to the sit-down. Thirteen. Pasco sets the location at the last minute, then changes it. Danny understands that it's SOP to prevent either side from setting up an ambush, but the reality is, at the end of the day, Pasco Ferry is Italian. If he decides he has to yield to the Morettis and let them do something, the Dogtown Irish are walking into it. They're just trusting Pasco. Can we? Pat asks. Danny shrugs. A lot of clam bakes together, drinks and laughs. His old man says they can. Pasco Ferry is a man of his word, Marty says. If he says we're safe, we're safe. Marty has been invited to the meeting at Pasco's insistence. 
A reminder, Danny guesses, that it was Pasco and Marty who put together the Irish-Italian peace that has lasted for a generation, and that breaking the alliance is an affront to both of them. Marty dresses carefully for the meeting, fussing with Danny about getting his tie straight, a real pain in the ass. The old man's last glory day, Danny thinks. He's important again. They set the meeting for the Harbor Inn, a hotel and restaurant down in Gilead, just across the channel from Dave's dock. The restaurant has been closed to the public at four o'clock for the private party. Danny and Ned Egan walk Marty to the front of the restaurant. Jimmy Mack slides out from the driver's seat and stands there looking nervous, his pistol bulging under his sport coat. The Murphys pull up behind them. Pat's driving, his dad next to him. Liam slumped in the back seat like he'd rather be anywhere else in the world. Can't blame him for that, Danny thinks. Pasco comes out, flanked by two of his guys. Vito Salerno, his longtime consigliere, and Tito Cruz, a half Sicilian, half Puerto Rican who has done a lot of wet work for the family over the years. Serious people. A clear signal that Pasco isn't going to put up with any bullshit here. A good thing, Danny thinks. Pasco walks over to him. All hardware stays in the cars, Danny. Danny sees the flicker of alarm in Ned Egan's eyes. Pasco sees it too and adds, same with the Morettis. Danny walks back to the car and puts his gun in the console. Jimmy Mack does the same, looking almost relieved. It takes Ned a few seconds to adjust to the idea, but then he steps over and lays his forty-five on the front passenger seat. I'll stay with the car, Jimmy says. The back room of the restaurant has a fishing theme. Buoys and nets across the wall, a pretty bad painting of the harbor, some photographs of fishing boats. A long table has been set up in the center of the room with some plastic coffee carafes, pitches of water, cups, and glasses. Danny understands that Pasco is saying this is business, and business that he's annoyed with, so there's no expensive dinner and wine. Just work it out, get it over with. Fine with Danny. If this goes well, he's going to take the old man over to the other side to Dave's for some good fish and chips. If it goes bad, well, nobody's going to have an appetite. Peter and Paul Moretti sit on one side with Sal Antonucci and Chris Palumbo beside them. None of them look up as the Murphy party comes into the room and sits down across the table. They just stare into the water pitchers like there's some pretty tropical fish in them or something. Old man Murphy takes the chair nearest the head of the table with Pat beside him. Then Liam, then Danny, then Marty. Ned Egan stands right inside the door. Pasco comes in, sits down at the other head. Vito and Cruz close the door and then take chairs in the corner. Pasco pours himself a glass of water, takes a drink, and begins. There's been a tear in the fabric of our association. I've called this meeting to mend that tear. I would like to speak first. Danny's surprised when Marty lifts his hand. Proud of the old man when he says, First things first. One of our people has been killed. There needs to be recompense. Pasco looks at Peter. He had no family, right? This Hendrigan kid? Peter asks. No wife, kids? A mother, Marty says. Peter turns from the table and leans over as Chris whispers in his ear. Then he turns back and says, She has a candy store? Magazines, papers, that sort of thing? We have machines in it? That's right, Marty says. She keeps the full take from our machines, Peter says. We'll give up our cut. Okay, we done with that? We're done, Marty answers. Just like that, Danny thinks. An item of business. A few more quarters from some vending machines and Brendan is forgotten. Good, Pasco says. Next? My brother has been insulted, Peter says, looking at Liam. Our family has been insulted. Liam smirks like a kid and says, like it's rehearsed. I had too much to drink. My behavior was unacceptable. I apologize. You still drunk now? Polly asks. Why, you want it back? Liam grins at him. No, you can keep your sloppy seconds. The grin comes off Liam's face and he gets to his feet. That's my wife you're talking about. 
Sit down, Pat says. He, sit down. Liam sits down. You've had an apology, Pasco says to the Morettis, prompting them. We're not apologizing for the beating, Peter answers. He had it coming. Also, we need recompense for the insult. I think beating him half to death was sufficient recompense, John Murphy says. I don't, Peter answers. What do you want? Pasco asks. Three jobs on the docks, Peter says. Murphy looks to Pasco. Times are hard. I don't have three no-shows on the docks right now. You have city jobs in the 10th Ward, Chris says. Those are Irish, says Pat. Chris looks at John. Should I be talking to him now? Should I be talking to you? John answers. Pasco asks, is this something you think you could do, John? Murphy shakes his head, then lays his chin on his chest, looks down and thinks a little. I could do one job in the 10th, not three. Peter smiles. Split the difference, too. I don't have to, Murphy says. I have the blacks now, you know, to take care of. It keeps them quiet. Peter and Chris huddle again. What the hell, Danny thinks. Pete can't take a piss unless Chris holds his dick for him. It's a sign of weakness, something to be noted for the future. If you want to get into Peter's ear, you talk to Chris. Peter comes back and says, one city job, one doc job. Murphy looks at Liam, like, see what your dick costs us? Then he says, if that will keep the peace, fine, yes. Peter? Pasco asks. We're satisfied. Over, Danny thinks. Done. Peace in our time and all that happy bullshit. Until Paulie has to open his stupid trap. I got one question, Paulie says. Liam, does she still like it up the ass? Liam gets back on his feet. Vito grabs Paul as Tito comes around the table and stands behind Liam, ready to grab him. That was way over the line, Pat says. He was out of line, Peter agrees. But Paulie yells at Liam. What are you going to do about it? Huh, pussy? What are you going to do? You're a brave motherfucker when you got guys with you, Liam says. Let's see you run your mouth when you're by yourself. You got it. Outside, right now. Let's go. Pat says, Liam, you're in no condition to fuck that, Liam says. This is stupid, Danny appeals to Pasco. But Polly and Liam are already heading for the door and the rest follow. Danny's way in back. He has his old man's elbow and by the time he gets outside, Liam and Polly are in the parking lot, fists up, and then Danny hears the shot and Polly drops. He rolls on the gravel holding his leg, blood leaking out from between his fingers. Tito has his gun out, looking toward the boat stocked across the channel, because that's where the shot came from. Peter kneels beside his brother. Liam heads to his car, Pat striding behind him in confusion. Danny grabs his father tighter by the elbow and with Ned's help hustles him toward their car. Jimmy's already pulling it up to them. Hit it, Danny says to Jimmy. Get the fuck out of here. Thinking, please, God, don't let Polly die. 14. What did you do? Pat screams at his brother. He grabs him by the front of the shirt and shakes him. What the hell did you do? The bedroom door is open and Danny can see Pam sitting on the bed, watching the scene in the living room. He starts to get up and shut the door, then thinks, fuck it. Let her see the man she chose. Who was the shooter? Pat asks. Liam shakes his head. Pat slaps him hard across the face. Danny sees Pam flinch as she watches. But she watches. Liam says, Mickey Shields. Who? Danny don't recognize the name either. He's from the other side, Liam says. Fuck. Danny blows a sigh. Liam is always messing around with this Irish shit. Now he brought someone over to do a job? Jesus Christ, Liam. You knew you couldn't get anyone in New England to do this, so you went to the hard men in the north? What did you pay him? Pat asks. I told him maybe we could help them out with some guns or something. Danny feels like his head is going to blow off. On top of all the shit that's going to come down on us now, Liam makes promises to the freaking IRA about guns, which will bring heat from the FBI. 
So if the Italians don't kill us, we spend the rest of our lives in a federal lockup? Do you know what you've done? Pat asks his brother. Liam, do you know what you've done to us? Danny glances through the open door at Pam. She knows. Two hours later, Danny and Jimmy sit in the basement of Jimmy's mom's house down on Friendship Street. She's out at her bingo night. They're freaked. Freaked fucking out. The only good thing, the only good thing, is that Pauli Moretti is going to pull through. The bullet didn't strike the femoral artery or bone, but the piece is kaput, and Pasco Ferry has no choice now but to let the dogs loose. He's been personally insulted, shown up, and blood has been spilled. Now they're all in the shit, big time. Danny does the odds in his head. They have ten, maybe fifteen guys who can be counted on in a fight. The Morettis have at least twice that number. The Irish have no resources outside Dogtown to call on. The Morettis can bring in shooters from other mafia families. The Irish have a few councilmen from the tent and some of the police. The Morettis have the mayor, a handful of state legislators, and a bunch of cops, including two detectives from Homicide, O'Neill and Viola. The money battle is lopsided. The Irish have the Longshoremen's Union, the docks, and some small gambling and loan sharking. The Morettis have the Teamsters, the construction unions, the vending machines, cigarettes and alcohol, major gambling, major money on the street, strip clubs, and prostitution. That's the problem with a war. You have the challenge of trying to stay alive and at the same time make a living. Hard when you're being hunted to go out and make your collections or make a score or even get back and forth from work. You need a bankroll, a war chest, to last you while you bunker up and fight it out. And not many of the Dogtown Irish, Danny included, have a lot in the savings account. Jimmy stares at Danny. What do you want me to do? Danny asks. Liam's a worthless little prick, Jimmy says. You know it and I know it. He's my wife's brother, for Christ's sakes, Danny says. I've known him since he was a kid. I made him fucking peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Danny, what? Do you know where he is? Jimmy asks. Danny nods. I'll come with you, Jimmy says. Danny shakes his head. No, I'll take care of it myself. They have Liam stored all the way up in Lincoln, some old house out in the country down the end of a dirt road. Danny stops for some White Castles on the way up there. He drives up to the house, gets out of the car and knocks on the door. Liam, it's me, Danny. I brought you some food. He hears movement inside, then the door opens a crack. The safety chain is on, and Liam peeks through the opening, slides the chain off, and lets him in. The place is a dump. Old carpet, musty smell. Not what Liam's used to, Danny thinks. Probably not what Pam expected when she married the prince. Liam sits back on an old sofa watching TV. Danny hands him the white paper bag of burgers. Hey, thanks, Liam says. They're cold, but they're still good, Liam says. You want one? Wouldn't mind. Danny sits down on the couch. What's on? Some horror movie, Liam says. Take your coat off and stay a while. Where's Pam? Danny asks. Zonked out in the bedroom, Liam says. Valium. Can he see it in my eyes, Danny wonders? Hear my heart pounding? No, I won't take my jacket off because a thirty-eight is in the pocket? Probably not. Liam's too self-absorbed to notice anyone else's shit. You don't have like a Coke or something? Danny asks. Ginger ale? Go in the kitchen and look, Liam says. Danny gets up and goes into the kitchen, finds a Coke in the fridge, comes back into the living room and stands behind Liam, who seems absorbed with the horror movie. This is the time, Danny thinks. Right now. He grabs the gun inside his right jacket pocket and takes it out. Eases the hammer back. Hopes that Liam don't hear the click. He don't. He's devouring the fucking hamburger. Laughing at the cheesy monster that's crossing the screen toward the little fake Japanese city. Not a care in the world, Liam. It's his fucking universe and the rest of us are just renting space. 
Danny holds the gun low behind the back of the couch where Liam can't see it if he turns around. Hey, Liam. Yeah? You remember catechism? How could I fucking forget? Yeah, well, I was trying to remember the act of contrition. Jimmy and I had a bet and I couldn't remember it. Child's play, Liam says, his eyes not leaving the screen. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee. Do it now. To hell with his immortal soul, do it now. And I do detest all my sins. Danny lifts the pistol. Not because I fear hell, but because... Then he hears the toilet flush, the old plumbing whine. Pam's awake. Danny hears water running. She's washing her hands. Jamming the gun back in his pocket, Danny says, Hey, Liam, I better go. You just got here. Pam comes in the room. I'm going to give you guys a little privacy, Danny says. Privacy is what we've got, Pam answers. We got plenty of privacy, don't we, Liam? Danny goes back to his car. He don't think he could have done it anyway. Danny drives back to Dogtown, can only find a parking spot three blocks from the house, and has the heebie-jeebies as he walks. This is what it's going to be like, he thinks, for the rest of my short fucking life. Looking over my shoulder, hearing sounds that ain't there, scared of what's around every corner. He hears a car coming slowly up behind him and forces himself not to run. Jams his hands inside his pocket and feels for the thirty-eight. Grips it hard, then lets himself have a glance over his shoulder. It's a cop car. Not a black and white, but an unmarked crown Vic that the plainclothes guys use. It pulls up beside him and the front passenger window rolls down. Danny half expects a blast of bullets. His heart is in his freaking throat and he feels like he might piss his pants, but O'Neill says, Take it easy. While you're at it, take your hands out of your pockets for me, okay? Danny can see past him to where Viola sits behind the wheel. It's okay, O'Neill says. Someone just wants a word with you. Danny carefully takes his hands from his pockets. O'Neill gets out, pats him down, and takes the piece from him. I'll give it back after you have your conversation. He opens the rear door and Danny gets in. Peter Moretti sits there. Danny tries to get out, but the door's locked. The two cops stand out on the sidewalk and grab a smoke. I just finished visiting my brother in the hospital, Peter says. How's he doing? He got a fucking bullet hole through his leg. Peter says, his temper flaring. He takes a breath and says, but he's going to be okay. That's good. Fucking A, that's good, Peter says. Listen, Danny, I wanted to have a word with you, tell you that we got no beef with the Ryans. We already know you had nothing to do with the disgraceful action that occurred this afternoon. Peter, the Murphys didn't. Peter holds up his hand. Don't even bother. That train has left the station. There is no possibility of a peace with the Murphys, even if they dangle that little piece of shit motherfucker from the flagpole at the state house. What I came to tell you is the Ryan faction can sit this one out. The Murphys put you in a very difficult position. You have every right on the basis of that to opt out of this war. Pasco made him calm, Danny thinks, on his friendship with my old man. But it's also a smart move. Peter knows that if the Ryan faction sits on its hands, he's deprived the Murphys of me, Jimmy Mack, Ned Egan, and maybe a couple of other potential shooters. And Bernie Hughes, who was one of Marty's guys before the fall. He'll stick with the Ryans, and Peter knows that. What have the Murphys ever done for you? Peter asks. Hell, they took your old man's part of the business and they throw you some scraps from the table. Treat you like the red-headed stepchild. That's all true, Danny thinks. I'm not asking you to go against them, Peter says. I know you wouldn't do that, and I respect you for it. But if you just sit this out, when it's over, and you know how it's going to end, you're not a stupid person, we'd be prepared to restore to you what is rightfully yours. Your father would get the respect he deserves. You would be the boss. As Pasco, he signed off on this, of course, Peter answers but you need to know that he's going down to Florida. He's really going to retire this time. I'm the new boss of the family. Paul will be my underboss. So Dogtown's done anyway, 
Danny thinks. With Pasco out of the way, the Moretti's will take what they want and use this whole Liam mess as their excuse. The ship's going down, it's just a question if I want to go down with it. Peter Moretti is tossing me a big life preserver. Don't give me your answer now, Peter says. Think about it, get back to me. You can approach O'Neill or Viola there. Okay. But don't take too much time, Peter says. He nods to the cops outside and O'Neill opens the door. Danny starts to get out. Peter reaches over, touches his hand and says, Danny, I want you to know that we have nothing but respect and affection for you and your father. Please give him my personal regards. Sure. Good night, Danny. I look forward to hearing from you. Good night. Danny walks home, gets out of his clothes and slips into bed beside his wife. She's warm under the blankets. I'm light, Terry murmurs. Danny thinks she's half asleep. You mean I'm late? No, Terry says. I'm late. Must have been that night on the beach, she tells him. After Pasco Ferry's clam bake. Part two. City on Fire, Providence, Rhode Island, October 1986. Thus on the beachhead, the Achaeans armed, avid again for war, and Trojans faced them on the rise of plain. Homer, the Iliad, Book 20. 15. The phone wakes him early in the morning. Danny rolls over and answers it. Hello? Thank God. It's Pat. Danny, get the hell out of there. What are you talking about? The Moretti's hit and hit hard. Three guys dead. Who? Danny asks, his brain still a little cloudy. I'll run it down when you get here, Pat says. Just get the fuck out. Jimmy? He's my next call. I'll call him. Danny sits up, punches in Jimmy Mac's number. What is it? Terry asks, waking, irritable. It's not good. Danny says. Feels like he can't breathe, like there's this heart attack band around his chest as he listens to Jimmy's phone ring. Pick up the fucking phone. Pick up the fucking phone, Jimmy. Danny, the fuck? Danny tells him the news. Jesus Christ. Come heavy. Danny hangs up and punches in his father's number. Marty answers it on the first ring, says, I'm still breathing, that's what you're wondering. Pat call you? John. Ned with you? Yeah, I'll call you when I know more. Danny pulls on his jeans, a t-shirt, then straps on a shoulder holster with the 38 and puts a denim work shirt on over it. He goes downstairs, Terry's already in the kitchen. She's got the coffee going and has bacon in the pan for his eggs. Danny likes it crispy, almost burned. Doing the little things, keeping the routine. Danny knows it's her way of dealing with it. Just tell me. She says, not looking up from the stove. Is it Liam? I don't think so. Dad? Her voice quavers. Pat would have said. Then who? I don't know, Terry. I just know it's bad. Wants to tell her that he's safe for the time being, that he has the choice of just opting out of this thing. But he hasn't decided what he's going to do yet and don't know how to tell her anyway. Go to your parents, take care of your mom. The bacon starts to smoke. Terry takes it off and lays it on a folded paper towel on a plate, then cracks two eggs in the pan and fries them in the hot grease. Then she takes two slices of Wonder Bread out of the bag and pops them into the toaster. What are we going to do? She asks. About what? We're gonna have a baby, Danny. She has tears in her eyes. Unusual for Terry. She don't cry about a lot. Danny wraps his arms around her and she lays her head on his shoulder and cries. It's going to be all right, Terry, he says. It's going to be all right. How, Danny? She asks, straightening up and looking him in the eyes. How's it going to be all right? Let's just go, Danny says. You, me, and the baby. 
Where? California. California again, Terry says. What is it with you in that place? It's supposed to be nice. You don't just pick up and move, Terry says. It takes money to relocate. You don't have a job there. And we need your health insurance. She breaks away from him, goes back to the stove, flips the eggs and uses the spatula to break the yolks. Danny likes his eggs over hard with the yolks spread out. I'll get a job, he says, with benefits. How? Terry quit nagging me, all right? Don't yell at me. Well, don't yell at me. Make your own fucking eggs, jerk. She walks out. Danny turns the heat off on the stove, decides he doesn't have time for bacon and eggs, so he pours himself a cup of coffee, milk and sugar, and takes it with him. Go to your parents, he yells. He heads out the door. Walks down to the Glock. Head on a swivel just in case the Morettis think they didn't get their answer quick enough. Two unmarked police cars are parked out by the Glock as Danny walks up. Good thing to know, he thinks, we still have a few cops left. The Morettis aren't going to hit the Glock in daylight, not after last night, but it doesn't hurt to be cautious. He nods at the cops and goes in. Bobby Bangs is behind the bar, making fresh pots of coffee. Jimmy Mack is already there, watching the door. He takes Danny by the elbow and says, they want you in back. Yeah? What they said. Danny opens the door to the back room. They're gathered at the usual booth, John, Pat, and Bernie. You don't see Liam. Thanks for coming, Danny, Pat says. He walks over, puts his arm around Danny, and walks him to the booth. Now, Danny thinks, I get a seat at the table. Now. John nods to him, a gesture of respect, acknowledgement. Danny thinks he looks suddenly old, and maybe he is because it's clearly Pat who's running the meeting. You want something to fortify that cup? Pat asks Danny. Nah, I'm okay. All right, Pat says. Here it is, and it's not good. Brian Young, Howie Moran, Kenny Meager, all dead. Young and Moran shot from long range, single bullets to the head or heart. Meager gunned down at close range coming out of an after-hours club. No wonder John looks like an old man now. Danny ain't feeling so young himself. Brian and Kenny, both friends, guys he went to school with or knew from the neighborhood. Parties, pickup hockey games, weddings. Now it will be wakes and funerals. They must have been planning this for a long time, Pat is saying. They knew habits, cars. Pat says, it was Sal Antonucci. For the close stuff, maybe, Danny says. The others? Long range? That ain't anyone on Sal's crew, even Peter and Paul's. They brought someone in. You thinking what I'm thinking? Pat asks. Steve Giordo? Steve the Sniper Giordo supposedly got his nickname because he'd been a marksman in the army but Danny thinks it was more from the fact that a sniper rifle is his weapon of choice. Giordo is out of Hartford and takes jobs for both Boston and New York. Bad news on a couple of fronts. Giordo was very good, and Boston and New York would have to have given their nods for him to do a job in Providence. It's a grim situation. Boston and New York backing the Morettis, Sal Antonucci and Steve Giordo out in front, and three of the guys who might have matched up against them are already dead. It was well planned, Danny thinks. So was Peter's move to try to take the Ryan faction out of the lineup. Even while he was talking to me, his soldiers were out killing people. Planned, timed, and coordinated. Nothing he could have done in the space of time since the peace meeting. The Morettis were going to move anyway. Use the peace to lull us to sleep and then hit us. Liam just jumped first and gave them the excuse. Now Peter gets what he always wanted and he gets to be the aggrieved party, the injured innocent. Okay, Pat says, we're down but we're not out. If we can get to Sal and Giordo, we're still in this thing. Like it's a hockey game, Danny thinks. Bernie Hughes speaks up, blows on his cup of tea and says, Sal is one thing. Sooner or later, he'll pop his head up and we can take it off. Giotto's another. 
The man never surfaces except to kill, and that briefly. He's a world-class professional, and we don't have anyone to match him. How about Nat Egan? John asked Danny. Would your dad give us the loan of him? Ned likes close-in work, Danny says. Ned is your man for walking up to someone and popping him in the chest, but he's no sniper. They all know he's right. I'll do it, Pat says. Danny sees John flinch. You're out of your weight class, Bernie says quickly. Which Danny knows is code for John isn't risking one of his own kids, but can't say it himself. Pat ain't having it, though. Pat is a freaking hero, a stand-up guy. Plus, he feels guilty it's his brother caused all this and is hiding out while other people bleed for what he did. Pat thinks he has to redeem the family honor. And he'll die doing it. So Danny says, let me take a crack at it. Awkward silence, which Pat finally breaks by throwing his arm around Danny's shoulder and saying, Danny, I'm grateful, believe me but you're no killer. Danny Ryan is good with his hands, but he's never done the job on anyone, never mind a stone killer like Steve Jordo. I'll get in close, Danny says. You won't get close, Pat answers. None of us will. I know how, Danny says. Everyone in the room just looks at him. I know how, Danny repeats. 16. It's freezing on the beach. Freaking October and already cold. Wind blowing out of the north, the white caps look like the beards of sad old men. Even in his heavy pea coat, Danny shivers and stamps his feet, waiting for Peter Moretti to show up. Finally, a car pulls into the parking lot and Danny sees O'Neill and Viola get out, check to make sure that Danny is alone. They must be satisfied because Peter gets out of the car and walks onto the beach. Camel hair coat, but bareheaded because he's always been vain about his hair and won't mess it up with a hat. Danny, he has a wool toque on because fuck vanity. It's good to see that Peter feels the cold, though. Good to see him shiver. We couldn't have done this at the North Pole? Peter asks. If anyone saw me with you? I was beginning to wonder, Peter says. It's been what, almost two weeks? I've been busy, Danny says, glaring at him. Funerals and wakes. Peter shrugs. War is war. The fuck did you think I was going to do? You wanted this war, Danny says. You want the docks, the rest of the Murphy operation? Let's talk in the car, Peter says. Good heater in that thing. I like it out here, Danny says. And Cagney and Lacey over there take one step toward us, I'll shoot you in the gut. So why did you want to meet me, Danny? Because you're going to win, Danny says. Peter nods graciously, smug fucking smile on his face. See? This is what I mean. The Murphys always underestimated you. You're smarter than any of them. Here's what I want, Danny says. One, the Ryan part of the business comes back to my father and me, like you said, with me in the corner office. Two, nobody touches my father. Not now, not ever. Is there a three? Pat Murphy gets a pass. No fucking way, Peter says. Go enjoy your heater. Be reasonable, Peter says. Even if I was to give Pat a pass, he wouldn't take it. You know him. He won't stop coming. I admire it, frankly, but give him a pass? After what the Murphys did to my brother? Forget it. You haven't heard what I have to offer. You can offer what Liam... Peter actually looks stunned. He asks, you do that? I have a kid on the way, Danny says. My own family to look out for. But you have to give me Pat. Peter looks out at the ocean like there's an answer on Block Island. Then he says, you deliver Liam? I won't make a move against Pat unless he comes for me or mine. Okay, Danny says. So Liam has a piece on the side. You're fucking kidding me, Peter says. He's tapping that and he's going out for strange? Danny shrugs. He sees it Thursday nights, 58 Way Bossett Street. Who is this chick? Peter asks, suspicious. A working girl? 
She's a pro-am, Danny answers. Slings drinks at the Wonder Bar. Kathy Madigan. Check her out, you want. Liam goes over around nine, bangs her, leaves by 10 or 11, tells Pam he was out on business. He knows they'll check it out, and they'll find a Kathy Madigan working at the Wonder Bar. They'll confirm her address. They might even see her bring a John home. The rest of the story about Liam is bullshit. But he also knows that they won't approach the girl, won't question her for fear of scaring Liam off. Even if they do, Kathy Madigan's gambling problem has her underwater for over five grand plus the vig. She's scared to freaking death and will say what she's told to say. If this pans out, Peter says, you're gold. Don't fuck it up, Danny says. He walks back to his car, turns the floor blower on high. Good to get his feet warm. 17. Jimmy Mack likes the Dodge Charger because it has a V8 engine and good heavy doors, some muscle and some metal to get you out of trouble fast or at least give you a little protection. He flips a toggle switch rigged below the steering wheel and says to Danny, this kills the interior lights, and check this out. He points to a different toggle switch. I put in another oil pan and connected it to the tailpipe. Flip this switch and it leaves a cloud of black smoke behind. Real James Bond shit, huh? Does it have an ejection seat? You want to give me a couple days? Jimmy says. I step on the gas, this thing is gonna go, son. We do the thing, you jump in, we're in Vermont before your balls come back down from your throat. Jimmy's trying to reassure himself because this thing is risky. Danny's basically going out as bait, trolling for Steve Giordo and Jimmy don't like it. He thinks Liam should go himself, but old man Murphy ain't having it. Actually, it was Danny talked him into it being him. I'm about Liam's height, he said. I wear a hoodie, get out of his car in front of Madigan's building. It's dark, they won't know the difference. I can't let you do this, Pat said. Just make sure the shooter is good. Danny said. Thursday night, they drive up to Pawtucket to pick up the shooter. The Murphys have him stored in a second floor efficiency in the back of a building. They went out and bought him some tea and cans of condensed milk that he wanted, and some eggs, sausages, and bread so he could do a proper fry up. The shooter is from a provisional IRA brigade in Armagh. Danny isn't a believer in the cause thinks the maudlin patriotism for a country they've never seen is bullshit. Couldn't care less if the six counties stay British or become part of Ireland or Iceland, for that matter. The Murphys are big into it. Think they have responsibilities as Irish who have survived and thrived. What did Pat call it? The Irish diaspora? Whatever the hell that was. They'd get all weepy on the anniversary of the Easter Rebellion, hold a little ceremony, pass the hat for the men who still fight. It was after the Sands thing they started singing the Irish National Anthem at closing time, in Gaelic, no less, as if anyone understood it. Danny puts it down to guilt, that they hadn't died in the old country with grass in their mouths or been blasted to pieces by a Brit firing squad. The truth was, though, that a lot of the Providence Irish had come from the North Counties, from Donegal in particular, and still have family ties back there and connections to the hard men who need guns and are willing to trade personnel for weaponry. It stinks in here, Jimmy says as they stand in the hallway outside the door. The fucker must fry everything. Jesus, his arteries. The door opens. Danny doesn't know what he expected a provo man to look like, but it isn't this. He's short, in his mid-twenties, has a thin, small face, jet black hair, and a three-day growth of beard. I'm Mickey, he says. You'd be Ryan? I'm the guy you don't shoot, Danny says. This is Jimmy. You ready? Born ready? He slips the AR-15 rifle into a plastic case and slings it over his shoulder. I've killed a few Brits with this, I can tell you. Great, Danny thinks. Some poor kids from some shitty British slum have no other choice than enlisting in the army, get their asses sent to northern Irish ghettos little different from their own neighborhoods, and get killed by a long-range bullet shot by a guy they never see. For what, a change of flags? Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. They go back outside. Jimmy and Mick get into the work car. Danny gets behind the wheel of Liam's black BMW.
They know how Giorda will do it. He'll be in his own work car, maybe with a driver, maybe by himself, parked somewhere across the street from Kathy Madigan's building. He'll watch for Liam's car, roll down his window, wait for Liam to get out, do the job, and take off. That's the most likely scenario and the one they're planning on. The other is that the Moretti's got access to a second-floor apartment across the street, the old Al Capone shit, where Giorda will be up on a roof. If it's either of those, Danny is pretty much fucked. But he doubts it. Getting into an apartment means witnesses, and roof shots are tricky, even for the sniper. The Morettis know this could be their one shot at Liam, and they're not going to take chances. And Giordo likes to get in and get out fast. So it's most likely a car. Still, Danny's nervous. Be honest, he thinks, shit scared, as he drives over. He's not even sure why he's doing this. Maybe it's the three murdered friends, or that Peter fucked him or that he feels guilty that he considered his offer. Probably it's more he still has this loyalty thing with the Murphys, this connection he can't seem to break, like he's always trying to prove something to them. He's not sure what. But if they can take Giordo off the ice, it leaves Sal as the Moretti's main guy. Maybe Peter gets cold feet and asks for negotiations. Danny heads toward Waybosset Street. Probably the only time in my life, he thinks, I'll drive a BMW. In the work car, Mick says, I have some rules. When we get close, no unnecessary talking. I don't want a lot of nervous chatter. You lower the window when I tell you to, not a moment before, not a moment after. And don't get rabbit feet on the pedal. You keep the car stock still until I tell you to go. Then you go, got it, champ? I have a rule of my own, Jimmy says. That's my friend out there. You fuck up and he gets hurt? I take this pistol in my pocket and blow your brains out. Got it, champ? Danny turns on to Way Bossett. The street is full of parked cars shoved up against the dirty, sooty snow. Hard to know which one is Giordo's. The silver Audi, the black Lincoln, the old van. He finds a spot and starts to parallel park, which he sucks at. Normally, Danny would drive a half mile before he'd parallel park, and now his hands are shaking. He hears the back tire scrape against curb, figures he's close enough, and shuts off the engine. He's wearing an old gray Providence College sweatshirt under his peacoat. He checks that the 38 revolver is still in the jacket pocket, buttons it up, pulls the hood over his head, and gets out. Danny's pissed that his legs are shaking, and he's having a hard time breathing. The feet in his work boots feel like lead as he steps out onto the sidewalk. Takes a deep breath, jams his hands into his pockets, and starts walking the 30 or so feet to Madigan's building. If the shot's going to come, it's going to come now. Then he sees Jimmy in the work car coming up the street. The passenger window rolls down. Mick sticks the rifle out the window and lets a full clip go into the silver Audi. Danny ducks into Madigan's doorway as muzzle flashes come out from the Audi. The bullets hit Mick full in the mouth, cleave off his tongue, and shatter his jawbone. The Irishman slumps onto the door handle. It opens, and he topples into the street. Jimmy guns the car and flies down the street. Giordo, a patch of blood on his shoulder, gets out of the car, looks to see where Liam went, and then spots Danny in the doorway. Danny will never know what happened, but something takes over in him and he pulls the pistol from his pocket, pulls the trigger over and over again, screaming in rage and fear as he charges across the street at Giordo. Every shot misses. Giordo backs away, though, as he fires. Danny feels a punch hit his hip. The blow spins him around and he can't stay on his feet or hang on to the pistol as the world seems to pull him down to his knees. He props himself up on one hand and sees Giordo aiming the rifle at him. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I do detest all my sins. Jimmy roars backward down the street, putting the car between Danny and Giordo. Leaning down, he opens the passenger door, grabs Danny's wrist, and pulls him into the car. Giordo's bullets smack the car like hail. With Danny still hanging half out of the car, Jimmy hits the gas and flips the toggle switch. The cloud of smoke shields them from Giordo's aim. Danny blacks out. He wakes up in a hospital bed. 
crisp clean sheets and distant pain. A woman sits in a chair beside the bed, beautiful woman with long red hair. At first, Danny thinks she's a nurse, but she doesn't have a nurse's uniform on. She's expensively dressed and her perfume is enchanting. He gets scared for a second because he thinks maybe he's dead and this is heaven. He flashes on the shooting, the searing pain as the bullet struck his hip bone. Maybe I died out there, he thinks. Maybe I'm dead. Who are you? He asks groggily. You don't recognize me? Now he looks at this woman and remembers a photograph in his father's dresser drawer. It's her. His mother. Madeline. Get out, Danny says. I didn't need you then, I don't need you now. Danny, she says, beautiful green eyes wet with tears. My baby. Out, he repeats, like talking through cotton, a cool silver mist. Just let me go back to sleep. When I wake up, you'll be gone like you were always gone. You're going to be all right, baby, Madeline says. I got you the best doctors. Go to hell. I don't blame you, Danny, she says. When you're older, maybe you'll understand. When you hurt, I hurt. 18. It started young. Madeline McKay's own mother opined that the girl was born already 14 years old because she seemed sexually aware, even as a toddler. And what a beautiful little girl she was, with a perfectly symmetrical face, high cheekbones that seemed carved from calicata marble, sparkling emerald eyes, vibrant red hair. Young Darlene, she wasn't Madeline yet, was aware of her beauty, precociously sensual, seductive in a way that made adult women passively hostile and grown men actively uncomfortable. She knew it. She used it with a glorious absence of shame. She discovered her body early, its potential for pleasure. She played with it as a marvelously joyful toy, a gift from God. In truth, few other gifts have been given to her. Darlene's family was poor, even by the modest standards of Barstow, California. Her father, Alvin, never met a job he couldn't lose, but at the same time insisted that no wife of mine is going to work. Outside the home, anyway. Alvin had ample spare time to knock Dorothy up and fill the revolving door rental homes and trailers with five kids, Darlene being the oldest. She had no childhood. She was too busy being a mother to two brothers and two sisters because after baby number three, Dorothy checked out. Call it postpartum, call it plain depression, call it fatigue. The steady erosion of poverty, the unrelenting assault of landlords seeking past due rent. But she pretty much gave up. Spent most of her nights on the sofa washing down cheap pills with cheaper booze, her days in bed with the covers pulled over her head. Alvin, that paragon of Puritan work ethic, once described her to Darlene as useless as tits on a bull. So it was Darlene from about age eight who got the kids up for school, made their lunches, washed their clothes, who showed up ludicrously but earnestly at parent-teacher conferences, gave them baths, dried their tears. Darlene shed few of her own, comforted herself instead with the consolation of her body. Her best companion was her image in the mirror, her imagination of what she would become. She wanted to be Marilyn Monroe. She carefully cut photos from Dorothy's magazines and kept a scrapbook under her bed. She tried to fix her hair like Marilyn's, followed her changes of style, her manner of dress. There was no money, of course, for new clothes, but Darlene had a flair, a knack for making the frumpiest frock look fresh with just a ribbon, a used belt, an unconventional slice of the scissors. In adolescence, her body developed differently from her idols. She had M.M.'s bust, but her legs grew long and lean. Her face took on a sculpted sharpness as opposed to M.M.'s softness. Her lips were thinner, her mouth wider. She wasn't disappointed. Darlene marked the looks she got from boys at school, men on the street, the envious glances from women. She knew she was attractive. 
that she could have any boy she wanted. Darlene didn't want any of them. Not in Barstow. Darlene wanted Hollywood. What she didn't want was to get knocked up. Darlene didn't want to sleep with some boy in Barstow, get pregnant, become her mother. She maintained an iron discipline with the few boys she dated. She would go parking, but only in the front seat. She'd allow them to touch her breasts, but only over her sweater and never anything below the waist. She would French kiss, once rubbed a boy's crotch over his jeans. But no matter how they begged, how they whined about blue balls, she wouldn't jerk them off, never mind give them blowjobs. It was as frustrating for her as for them, and after a night of frantic fumbling and rigid resistance, she would go home, get into bed, and satisfy herself. Of course, her reputation for promiscuity rose in direct inverse ratio to the reality of her chastity. In revenge for her refusals, the boys bragged about what they did to her, what she did for them. They called her Darleezy and Horlene. She had no friends. The other girls were either jealous or judgmental. The boys either tried to screw her or stayed away because they knew they couldn't. Her siblings were more her children. Darlene was lonely, but in a personality as strong as hers, loneliness becomes self-sufficiency. She was enough for herself, saw herself as alone in the world, that the only person she could rely on was the girl in the mirror, and was okay with that. The girl in the mirror wasn't Darlie Z or Horlene. She was Madeline McKay, rich and independent, glamour girl, movie star, she went the other way with it, literally. In those days, the chief reason for the existence of Barstow was as a halfway point between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. The former lay to the west, the latter to the east on Highway 15. When she was 17, Darlene looked into the mirror and took stock, a cold-blooded objective inventory. She was 5 feet 10 inches tall, too tall to be a movie star. That this was unfair occurred to her only briefly. She dismissed the sexism as reality and decided that the road to her future was to the east. In Las Vegas, the longer the legs, the taller the girl, the better. If she couldn't become an actress, she would be a showgirl. It wasn't her dream, but it was better than being a waitress, a mother, or a housewife. So one night, Darlene dutifully bathed her brothers and sisters and put them to bed. She arranged their clothes, fixed their lunches for morning, and put them in the refrigerator. Then she packed her few things in a small bag, walked out the door to a truck stop just off Route 15, and stuck out her thumb. She was picked up immediately. In some of the first good luck of her life, the driver only wanted a little company, even bought her a burger when they made a stop in Baker, and delivered her on the Las Vegas Strip unmolested. His name was Glenn, and she never forgot him. In Las Vegas, pretty girls were like flecks of metal and magnets were everywhere. High rollers, low rollers, pimps, gangsters, managers, agents, talent scouts, and combination plates of all of them. Darlene was lucky again. Stuffing herself at the buffet in a cheap casino hotel, she was spotted by a relatively honest, relatively non-predatory agent manager by the name of Shelley Stone, who approached her with his card in his hand. Are you looking for work, young lady? Yes. What's your name? Shelley asked. Madeline McKay. She picked the name because it sounded like Marilyn, and besides, it was French and classy. Nice name. He pretended to believe her. How old are you? Twenty-one. He pretended to believe that, too. She certainly looked twenty-one, like an adult anyway. Can you dance? Yes. This he didn't even pretend to believe. But for the starter jobs he had in mind for her, she didn't really have to dance. All she had to do was walk and hold her head up, which wasn't as easy as it sounded, but the girl had a confidence about her that he liked. If I get you a job, I get 10% of everything you make, Shelley said. I pick up your paycheck, I give you your money. No, Madeline said. I pick up my paycheck, I give you your money. Shelley laughed. This girl was going to make it. He got her a decent motel room and told her it was an advance against her first paycheck. The next morning, he took her to an audition at one of the lesser shows in town, where the director, whom Shelley had known since Christ was a road guard, 
looked her over like a piece of meat and liked what he saw. You're a gazelle with boobs. What experience do you have? None. Good, he said. I won't have to unteach. You come every night, you watch the show, first girl who gets sick or noticeably knocked up, you fill in. Richard Hardesty taught her a lot. Do you know why I am such a good director? He asked her one night as she watched the show. Because I have no interest at all in what's between your legs. I only care that they move in perfect coordination. Another night he asked, Do you know the difference between a stripper and a showgirl? And it has nothing to do with the relative amount of clothing or lack thereof. A stripper sells a visceral fantasy. A showgirl sells an ethereal dream. One night he asked her, Do you know why men bring dates to these shows, often their wives? Because it titillates both of them. When they get back to the room, Mrs. Iowa becomes you. Two weeks into this Socratic tutorial, Madeline got her chance, thanks to some bad shrimp at the buffet. She put on her costume, a sequined two-piece, a tall feathered headdress and high heels, and appeared in Venus in Vegas. A week after that, she got a regular slot and a raise when Richard fired a girl for gaining three pounds. Madeline worked steadily after that. She shared an apartment with two other girls from the show. When it closed, Shelley moved her to a bigger show at a better hotel, and she was on her way. Well, it's an exaggeration to say that every guy in Vegas tried to fuck her. It wasn't much of an exaggeration. She was a sensation, the beauty among beauties who really stood out, a fresh look, and just about every single guy, and a lot of married ones, who saw her made a move on her. She was impervious, literally impenetrable got a reputation as an ice queen. Just about drove a high-stakes poker player out of his mind one night in his comp suite when she wouldn't give it up. I don't want to get pregnant, Madeline said. Jesus, he said. Haven't you ever heard of rubbers? They're only 90% effective. I'll stop before 90 times. How about that? He asked. If you think that's how odds work, she said, you should find another profession. Okay, how about a blowjob? She went down on him. It was okay, it was fine. He thought it was better than fine and told her so, but Madeline said, I'm glad, now you do me. What? Fair is fair, she said. I'm your lover, not your hooker. He was okay, not great. She didn't stay with him for long. Being a gambler's girlfriend was not in her plan. Neither was being a showgirl the rest of her life, or until she gained a few pounds or wrinkles and they kicked her to the curb. There was no future in it. What she wanted was security, which boiled down to money. But how does a girl with no high school diploma make serious money, security money, the kind of money that makes her safe in this world? The answer was plain. If a woman can't make money, she has to make a man who makes money. This is how the most beautiful woman on the strip married the ugliest man in Las Vegas. Manny Maniscalco was the undergarment king of the world. His factory outside of Las Vegas made heavily structured wired brassiers, girdles, corsets, and belts designed to make busts stand out and waists suck in. His was a unique kind of engineering genius, and his company expanded to make lingerie that could never be accused of being overly subtle. His creations were a Las Vegas staple for all the big shows. His undergarments could be seen, at least discerned, in Hollywood films. His lingerie was particularly ubiquitous all over the third world. Manny spent his life creating his own vulgar version of beauty, which made sense because he himself was ugly as they come and knew it. How could he not, with his club left foot that dragged behind him as if he wore a ball and chain, shoulders that stooped over his six-foot-four frame, and a heavy head that some likened to a St. Bernard's, only ugly. He had a big head and a big heart. When Manny loved, it was with the intensity of an angel, and he loved Madeline McKay. A denizen of the shows, ostensibly to check on his creations, but in reality to bask in beauty, he was well known to every chorus girl as a regular at the front row tables. Manny's out there became a standard line in the wings, some of the girls were amused, others dismissive. None would meet his gaze, even with his reputed fortune. But one night he spotted Madeline, and that was it. 
He sent flowers backstage, baskets of fruit no man in the know would ever send a showgirl candy, bottles of perfume, samplings of his products and what he accurately surmised were her sizes. The accompanying notes were never pushy, always signed simply, from your admirer, Manny Maniscalco. The other girls filled her in on Manny and his millions, laughed about the gifts that were piling up, sympathized with her. The man came to the show every night and sat there staring only at Madeline. It was creepy, they said, embarrassing for her. Madeline wasn't embarrassed. One night, Manny arrived at his regular table to find a very nice bottle of red wine waiting, with a note from your admiree, Madeline McKay. He sent back a note, could we share the wine over dinner? If a note could have stammered, it would have. They had dinner after the show the next Saturday night and married two months later. Somewhat to her surprise, Madeline found Manny to be intelligent, thoughtful, charming in his own hesitant way, and the possessor of a deep strength that can only come from perfect self-awareness. The only reason, he said without a trace of rancor at that dinner, that a young woman as beautiful as you would date a man 20 years her senior, as ugly as me, is my money. Am I wrong? It certainly was the reason I came, she said. It would only be part of the reason I would stay. But a major part. Of course. They came to an equally frank understanding. If money was the main currency, as it were, of their relationship, she would only be a purchase, not a rental. If he wanted to take her off the stage, he had to set her at the altar. He would marry her, give her a luxurious life, settle an independent fortune on her. In return, she would give him her beauty, her wit, her companionship. She couldn't promise her heart. He accepted that. The gossip columns called the match inevitably Beauty and the Beast, reveled in printing photos of the statuesque bride and the hunched-over groom. The bridesmaids composed a virtual chorus line, giving the ceremony an erotic charge. His groomsmen were mostly his cousins. Shelley walked the bride down the aisle. You don't get 10% of this, Madeline joked. But I should, Shelley said. I'm losing a lot of income here. Are you sure you want to do this, kid? It's not too late to run. I'm sure. Out of respect for Manny, and there was immense respect for him among the smartest and most powerful Las Vegas operators, every important person in town attended the ceremony and came to the lavish reception. Madeline and Manny spent their wedding night in the bridal suite of the Flamingo. Madeline took a long time in the bathroom, making sure her hair was quaffed in a stylish updo, that her makeup was perfect. She slipped into one of Manny's less cheesy negligees, filmy black silk over one of his red corsets lined with black lace, black mesh stockings and garters. Nothing she would have chosen for herself, but she knew it would please him. She came out and struck a pose in the bathroom doorway, one long leg bent and extended, one arm raised, her hand along the door frame. He lay on the bed in a set of blue silk pajamas, an effort that did nothing to improve him nor mask his erection. What do you think? She asked, shifting her hips. So lovely. Madeline walked over to the bed and stood in front of him. You know you're my first. No, I didn't. Am I yours? No. Good, she said, lying down next to him. You'll know what to do to me. He didn't. Not really. His prior experience had been entirely with hookers, simple commercial exchanges to satisfy a physical need. So he climbed on top of her, pushed up the hem of the negligee, fumbled with the rubber and put himself between her legs. I don't want to hurt you, he said. You won't, although Madeline wasn't so sure. She wasn't wet, not even a little turned on, and he was big. Putting her arms around him, under his pajama shirt, she felt his back. It was hairy like an animal's and sweaty. In her best breathy Marilyn Monroe voice, she said, Take me, darling. Make me yours. It did hurt. It got a little better, not painful, even slightly pleasurable as he thrust into her mechanically, like one of the machines in his factory, proceeding with rhythmic precision to produce a set result. 
for him. Out of affection for him, she moaned, wriggled and whined, whispered naughty nothings into his ear, shut her eyes to block out his ugliness and feigned orgasm moments before he came. A few moments later, he said, it will get better. It was wonderful. Don't lie to me, Manny said. It's beneath you. They honeymooned in Paris, stayed in the best hotel, ate in the finest restaurants, shopped in the most exclusive boutiques, and he looked painfully out of place in all of them. Madeline gave him everything she had in bed, dressed provocatively, screwed him in every position she could imagine, sucked him off, let him go down on her. That was part of the deal. And an honorable woman, she honored it. She gave him immense pleasure. Her own was mild at best. Toward the end of the two weeks in France, Madeline told him, this has been wonderful and I'm truly appreciative, but Manny, I don't need all this. What I want is a nice home, a steady, quiet life. They went home to his mansion outside of town, a one-level neo-Spanish colonial on acreage, a large swimming pool outside a slider from the living room, a garden of citrus trees, a circular driveway wrapped around a fountain. Manny put $50,000 in her bank account. She was 19. Being married to Manny was pleasant. She got up early in the morning with him. Their cook made them breakfast. He went to the office and she did calisthenics to keep her showgirl figure. She spent most mornings growing her portfolio. Manny introduced her to stockbrokers and financial advisors, and she studied the market assiduously, making conservative but incisive investments. One of the companies she bought shares in was Maniscalco Manufacturing. In the afternoons, Madeline might play tennis with the hired coach or swim in the pool or go into town to have lunch with old show friends or shop. She was most often home before Manny, would sit on the terrace and read. They would have dinner together, watch a little television, and go to bed early, making love once or twice a week. Madeline came to have genuine affection for Manny. He was kind and considerate, had a quiet but sharp sense of humor, never chased other women, was totally devoted to her. He would patiently answer all her questions about business and finance, and when he didn't know the answer, would refer her to someone who did. And he didn't mind that she wanted to keep her own last name for professional purposes. They didn't go out much. When they did, it was for business social functions or fundraisers. Although he did take Madeline to see any of the big performers she wanted, so she saw Sinatra and Dean Martin and the rest of them on opening nights, and the Maniscalcos were always invited to the after parties. She stayed faithful for almost two years. Might have been longer if Manny hadn't been a fan of boxing. He had ringside seats at all the big fights and finally persuaded Madeline to come with him. Jack DiBello was a brutal middleweight out of Jersey City with a body forged from iron and a heart made in hell. He used to say that he hated early knockouts because he wanted to bust the guy up first. That he never minded getting hit because it was nothing compared to what his old man used to give him. He spotted Madeline during the introductions. She spotted him back. First round, he worked his opponent, a talented Venezuelan contender, into the ropes in front of Madeline and pounded the hell out of him. Blood and sweat flecked on her dress. As he spun away, Jack took a second to glance at her. Knew that she dug it. The fight went seven rounds, a bloody affair, before Jack got tired of slicing up the Venezuelan, went low for a paralyzing liver shot, and then upstairs to the jaw for the knockout. His man dropped face first like a felled tree. Jack raised his arms and looked straight at Madeline. She didn't look away. You probably don't want to go to the post-fight party, Manny said as the crowd started to leave. No, Madeline said. I'd like to. DiBello was run by the Chicago outfit with an investment from the New England mob, so the party in the suite at the Sands was full of wise guys. They all knew Manny, they all respected him. Most of their gumars wore his creations, gratis. He was welcome at the party, especially as he brought with him a woman as stunning as his wife. No one was happier to see them than Jack. His face was flushed and puffy, his left eye black and his swollen jaw didn't diminish a crooked grin. 
He alternated holding a cold beer bottle against his cheek and drinking from it while looking across the room at Madeline. Now she avoided his eye. It was getting too obvious, and she was feeling too much. Jack waited until she went to the bathroom and stopped her on the way out. He got right to it. What are you doing with that mutt? Excuse me? What a waste. Get out of my way. Come see me tomorrow. He told her his room number. His manager tried to warn him. Stay away from that trim. Her husband's connected. He's not made, though. No, but he's connected, Jack. The wise guys wouldn't lay a hand on me, Jack said. I make them money. You make them tens of thousands of dollars, his manager said. Manny Maniscalco makes them millions. So if he asked them to break your hands or splash acid on your face or cut off your guinea dick, they would do the math. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? I know, but look at her, Jack said. She'd be worth it. The next afternoon, Madeline said she was going to have lunch with some of her old show friends and do some shopping. Her feet took her straight to Jack's room. He might have had the decency to act surprised, she thought, when he opened the door. Instead, he grinned and let her in. Jack didn't make love to her. He fucked her. She fucked him back. Dug her fingers into his thick, curly black hair, ran her fingernails across his broad back, bucked against him like she was trying to bounce him off. He stayed with her, plunged into her like he was punching her, going for the knockout. Madeline got the first orgasm of her life that she didn't give herself, and the second, and the third. She didn't even like the guy, arrogant, rough to the point of brutality, crude and foul-mouthed, but she was crazy about him. He felt the same way. Jack had never fucked such a beautiful woman. Then again, few men had. Don't give me bruises, Madeline said one day. Manny might notice. You still fucking him? He's my husband, she said. The old bastard's so grateful, Jack said. He wouldn't notice my jizz on his dick. You're disgusting. Then why do you keep coming back? I come back to get off. She kept going back. They started to take precautions. Didn't meet at his hotel, but rented rooms away from the strip. Two or three days a week for the next three months. Madeline came home one evening, she really had been out shopping with friends, and Manny was sitting on the living room couch, a glass of scotch in his hand. I want you to look at something, he said, patting the cushion beside him for her to sit down. He opened a folder on the glass coffee table and Madeline saw black and white photos, some taken from a closet, others from outside a window, of her and Jack in bed. They were graphic, Jack kneeling between her legs, Madeline with his dick in her mouth, her on all fours with him behind her. These were taken by a gossip rag, Manny said. Fortunately, we have a friend there who offered them to me first. I paid $20,000 to see my wife with another man. Do you love him? No. But he does for you what I can't, Manny said. He was calm, didn't seem angry, not even hurt. Madeline nodded. Yes. I knew you could never love me, Manny said. Not in that way. You were very honest about that. I know I don't meet your needs. Manny, be quiet now, he said. I just want you on my arm when I go out. I want to see you when I get up in the morning and when I go to bed at night. You have needs, they should be met, I accept that. What I will not accept is a scandal. I will not be embarrassed. This thing with DeBello stops now. No more famous men, no celebrities, no long-term affairs. They're too risky. I expect you to be discreet in the men you choose and careful in the way you conduct yourself. Do we have an understanding? Yes. I'm sorry, Manny. Sorry is for children, he said. Later, lying in bed, Madeline heard him drag his heavy foot into the room. A while later, she felt his weight on the mattress. Then she felt him crying. Madeline heard the next day that Jack DeBello had moved to New York. She and Manny limped through the paces after that, polite but distant. He was still kind and considerate, 
They slept in the same bed, but he never touched her and she never made the first move. Manny was right though, she had needs. Madeline found her lovers in restaurants and bars, at blackjack tables and roulette wheels, on tennis courts and golf greens. They were never Las Vegas locals, always tourists or traveling businessmen. She met them once and only once, summarily dismissed them, and then went home to shower them off her. It went on for two years. The last one of these men was Marty Ryan. The son is so much like the father, she thinks now, looking at Danny lying in the hospital bed. The same reddish-brown hair, the same eyes, the same delicate pride, the same wounded dignity. She met Marty in the bar at the Flamingo and knew before the ice had melted in the first drink that she was going to do him. He was so handsome with that boyish, mischievous smile and that looking for trouble glint in his eyes. And he had the worst, corniest pickup line so bad it was charming. It's a shame for someone so beautiful to be drinking alone. Maybe I'm waiting for someone, she said. Now I was talking about myself. She laughed out loud and didn't object when he sat down next to her and signaled the bartender for another round. I'm Marty Ryan, Madeline McKay. He saw her wedding ring and the big rock Manny gave her when he proposed. Didn't seem to faze him at all. Where are you from? Madeline asked. Providence, that's in Rhode Island. What brings you to town? Taking care of some business, Marty said. I'll just be here a couple of days. Do you like it here? I do now. Marty, Madeline, do you like to fuck? Now, he said, I love to fuck. He really did. She gave him the name of an out of the way motel and they spent the afternoon making love. And that's what it was, making love. She felt something with Marty that she hadn't felt with Jack or Manny. Madeline broke her rules, saw him every day for a week. The last day when she got up to put her clothes on, he asked, when can I see you again? That's not going to happen. He looked stunned, angry, hurt. The hell you mean? Marty, it was wonderful, she said, truly. But there can't be anything more between us, ever. I'm in love with you. Don't be ridiculous. No, I am, Marty said. I'll move here if you want. I don't, she said. I'm married, Marty. You didn't seem so married a few minutes ago. It's complicated. It's simple, he said. I love you. Well, that's too bad. She kissed him lightly on the lips. Goodbye, Marty. And that was it, as far as she was concerned. Except it wasn't. Her next period was late. Then it didn't show up at all. A doctor confirmed she was pregnant. Get rid of it, Manny said. I know a doctor, he's discreet. I'm not going to do that, she said. Don't expect me to raise someone else's bastard, Manny said. Everyone will know it's not mine. Get the abortion or... Or what? We had an agreement, Manny said. You weren't going to be careless. You weren't going to embarrass me. You've done both, so the agreement is void. So I'm just a bad business deal? That was your choice, Madeline, not mine. The man is absolutely right, she thought. I made this business, so why shouldn't he? I'll go away and have the baby. No one will know. I won't contest the divorce, and I don't want anything beyond what you've already given me. She left in the morning and flew to New York. Had the baby at St. Elizabeth's and listed Martin Ryan as the father. Madeline tried to be a mother, she really did. She did the diapers, the feedings, the sleepless nights. It was hard being a single mother in those days. It was a scandal even in the Bohemian Village and the neighbors in her building on 7th Avenue pretended to believe her story about her husband being a longshoreman who was out at sea. Madeline had cared for children before when she was herself a child. It wasn't that. It wasn't the difficult present that caused her to abandon her son, Danny. It was the future. 
Madeline couldn't picture it. What was she supposed to do, saddled with an infant, then a toddler, then a little boy? She had some of her money from Manny, had invested it wisely, but it wouldn't last. She would have to go to work. Doing what, though? And who would look after Danny? She knew one thing. She wasn't going back to Barstow. To throw herself on the mercy of her parents, to face the humiliation of being a single mother, to see the sneers of the men she had rejected and hear the snickers of jealous girls. Madeline took stock of her assets, decided that she had two. Beauty and brains. But she couldn't use either, with a kid in tow. So one day she got up, wrapped Danny in a blanket, and caught the train for Providence. It wasn't hard to find Martin Ryan, everyone knew him. She walked into some dingy Irish bar, handed him the bundle, and said, Here, here's your son. I'm not cut out to be a mother. Then she walked out. Went to Los Angeles. Madeline knew her assets and used them to her best advantage. Men loved to look at her, loved to be seen with her on their arms, loved to fuck her. It's not that she was a hooker. It wasn't a cash on the barrel head proposition. But she let it be known that she was a girl who required gifts. And not flowers and candy either. Clothes, furs, jewelry, vacations, cars, apartments, houses. Stock tips, stock options, inclusion in real estate development deals. Her looks wouldn't last forever. She started going to parties with headline comedians, singers, and then movie stars. Through the movie stars, she met politicians. Through the polls, she met the Wall Street types. Madeline never fucked down. When she went with studio heads, she quit the actors. When she started banging billionaires, she left the studio heads. It was her simple rule. All the men understood, they didn't resent her for it. Men like that know the pecking order. The only guy she ever felt bad about was the son she left behind. But she couldn't have done it, couldn't have lived in Dogtown as the wife of an Irish dock boss, even if he was connected. Didn't see herself doing laundry, cranking out kids, going to confession on Saturday afternoon, the dreary pub Saturday night, mass on Sunday morning. It was death. But her only regret was her baby, her boy left behind with an angry drunk while she fucked her way from Hollywood to Washington to New York. Now she was back in Vegas again, with a real estate and stock portfolio. No need to worry about being in her 50s and losing her looks. Even if she was still stunning, still good in bed, still a charming companion, she knew that her sell-by date was fast approaching and it didn't worry her. She had money. In this world, money keeps a woman safe. Money and influence. She used it when she heard about Danny. An old friend in the Justice Department made the connection and called her. Your son is hurt and in trouble. Another friend provided a private jet and she was in Providence the next day. She made calls on the flight, got the story and pulled on some cords of memory. Nobody from the Strip to Sunset to Pennsylvania Avenue wanted Madeline McKay writing her memoirs. A protective net was thrown around Danny Ryan. Her son, who hates her. 19. Danny's left hip is destroyed. The ball joint is shattered, the tendons torn away. Without the best doctors, Danny will have a severe limp the rest of his life, maybe be on crutches, certainly headed for an early wheelchair. This is what Dr. Rosen tells Danny when he's well enough to listen. Lucky for you, Rosen says, you have me. Turns out he's the head of orthopedics. Has done surgeries on a few of the Patriots and the Bruins. Guy is the best. Now he tells Danny, I'm going to take you through three procedures. You have an infection going on in there. I have to go back in. Back in? When you first came in, the trauma guys took out the bullet and the bone fragments, Rosen explains. Lucky for you, they're good and didn't fuck you up permanently. But you have an infection going on. That's why you're feverish. That I have to clean up. When that looks good, I'm going to go in and give you a new ball joint. A couple of weeks after that, I go back in and repair the tendons. You'll never be a threat for Olympic gold, but if you work hard in rehab, you'll walk just fine. I can't pay for all that, Danny says. Your mother is picking up the bill, Rosen says. 
The hell she is. You tell her that, Chief, Rosen says. I don't want to end up as my own patient. The first day or so, Danny goes in and out of consciousness. Madeline is there by his bedside. Her or Terry or both. If Danny has a resentment against Madeline, Terry doesn't. She likes her, is grateful for what she's done for her husband. Danny doesn't much care one way or the other that first day or so. He just goes in and out. Out is better because his hip hurts like a motherfucker. The juice of the poppy is sweetness itself, sweet relief, sweet dreams, floating in liquid warmth. Yeah, but he comes out of it, sees her face, and it pisses him off. Now she wants to be part of my life. Now she loves me. Now she cares. Where was she when... 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 So the first few days are a blur. He only wishes the next few were. They're in all too sharp relief. The doctors don't want him getting hooked, so they step down his morphine, let him feel pain that sets his teeth on edge. Then infection comes back and fevers, and they have to leave the wound open to drain it, and every minute in that bed feels like an hour. Nothing to do but lie there and worry. Am I going to fucking die? Am I going to be a cripple? What he doesn't have to worry about is the cops. No detectives come in to smirk and harass him, get drug-induced statements that would take him from the hospital to the cell. Danny Ryan was an innocent bystander in a drive-by shooting, end of story. The Murphys didn't arrange that. His mother did. When the infection subsides, Rosen goes in for the surgery to reconstruct the hip. The operation goes well, but Danny's immobilized for long days and nights. Jimmy Mack comes to see him. Thanks, Danny says. For what? Jimmy asks. Danny lowers his voice. Saving my fucking life. Jimmy blushes. He's a little embarrassed because he panicked at first when Mick's face got blown off and he hit the gas to get out of there. Like anyone would, Danny thinks. But he came back. He could have got away safe, but he came back for Danny, right into Steve Giordo's gun sights. You would have done the same for me, Jimmy says. Danny nods. It's true. Your father come around? Jimmy asks. Danny shakes his head. He won't come. He says he won't be in the same building as, you know. Jimmy grins. Jesus, Danny. I saw her in the lobby. She's a looker, your mom. Work it out with Angie. It's okay with me. Hey, I didn't mean. I know. The next day, Pat comes to visit. You took one for the team, he says. Sorry it didn't work out like we'd planned. Giordo's on the sidelines for a while, Pat says. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. It's awkward between them, like it never has been before. Pat doesn't know quite what to say, and Danny doesn't know how to deal with his silence. They do the usual bullshit, the families, the kids, and they're both relieved when the nurse comes in and kicks Pat's ass out of there so Danny can get his rest. He wakes up when he hears Terry saying, The hell are you doing here? Peter Moretti is standing there with flowers in his hand, smile smooth as his silk tie, Terry glaring at him, Madeline fixing him with a calm, hard look. I came to see my friend Danny, Peter says. Terry spits, get out. It's all right, Danny says. Peter comes over to the bed, sets the flowers down on the side table, leans in and still smiling whispers, you're dead, Danny. As Soon as you get out, you're a dead man. They all know that a hospital is off limits. Last thing in the world you want to do in a war is piss off doctors and nurses because you might be seeing them in a trauma ward and they let you bleed out because you've exposed them to gunfire at their place of work. Ditto with priests who might be giving you last rites. You don't want them to be nervous and fuck up the words that stand between you and hell. Peter straightens up and turns to Terry. Anything I can do, anything you need, please let me know. Get out. I don't know why you're being this way, Peter says. I had nothing to do with what happened. You want to know what your husband was doing down there that night? Ask him. I don't need you to tell me what to say to my husband. Of course not, Peter says. I overstepped. I'll leave you alone. I'm sure Danny needs his rest. Madeline follows him out of the room. Mr. Moretti, do you know who I am? Peter's smile edges toward a smirk. I heard. 
Then you've also heard what I'm capable of, Madeline says. If you hurt my son, or even try to hurt my son, I'll put you where your father is. You were right to leave Providence, Peter says. You should have stayed away. And you should stay out of this. Perhaps your father would be more comfortable in Pelican Bay, Madeline says. 23 hours a day in solitary and no pretty little Puerto Rican maricones satisfying his baser desires. If I make one call to a certain federal judge. You know, Peter says, whether a whore blows a guy for a dime bag or a million dollars, she's still a whore. But she's a whore with a million dollars, Madeline says. I happen to have a lot more. Take me on, Mr. Moretti. I'll string your balls on a necklace and wear it around town. A few mornings later, Danny gets into a fight with Terry when he finds out that Madeline paid their month's rent and bought groceries. What am I supposed to do, Danny? Terry asks in tears because he yelled at her and she was so stressed out about his shooting anyway. You're not working and the bills still come. Even though he's run out of sick days, they're still punching him in down on the docks, but money is tight. Regardless, the thought of his mother putting food on his table makes him furious. You do not take her fucking money, Terry. Terry throws up her hands and looks at him, mouth agape, like who the hell do you think is paying for this room? Danny doesn't have an answer. He's aware of his hypocrisy. All the more so when Rosen says that the best thing for Danny is six weeks at a special rehab facility up in Massachusetts, which costs about what it sounds like. Danny's insurance with the union is pretty good, but it ain't private out-of-state facility good. It's local outpatient clinic good. Is there that big a difference? Danny asks him. The difference is a cane, Rosen says. The local place gets you the next 30 years on a cane. The private place gets you the next 30 without one. Madeline insists on springing for the private clinic. Money is not my problem in life, she tells Danny. No, what is your problem in life? Right now you are. You're my son acting like my child. Terry tells him pretty much the same thing. Think about me, she says. Maybe I'd rather have a husband who doesn't need to set down his cane to pick up his baby. Maybe I'd still like to get laid every once in a while. Terry, they're nurses, Danny, she says. They've heard laid. How about I'd like to take long walks on the beach with you? Maybe get on a bicycle, ride around Block Island or something. Maybe I'd like to dance with you again. You don't let your mother do this for you, for us? I'm done with you. My hand to God, pregnant and all, I'll leave you. You can be a bitter, lonely old man like your father. Danny goes up to Massachusetts. 20. Peter Moretti isn't happy. The deal he thought he had with Danny Ryan turned out to be a double cross. So the hit on Liam Murphy ended up as a hit on Danny, which wouldn't have been so bad considering the circumstances, except that Ryan survived it and his putana mother won't let Peter go at him again. Danny's jacked up, off the board for the foreseeable future, but so is Steve Giordo, who departed with the sentiment that he ain't gonna walk into another ambush because the Moretti brothers can't tell one mick from another. He has a point, Peter thinks. Worse is that New York and Hartford are less likely to lend out any of their people anymore because they don't want to waste an asset on some outfit that gets suckered by a cheap leg breaker like Danny Ryan. So now Peter really isn't happy when he's just trying to eat breakfast at the Central Diner and Solly Weiss walks in, plops his ancient ass down across the table and starts in before Peter can even have a look at the sports page. Peter, my store was robbed. Peter don't need the newspaper to know this. It isn't news. Two of his guys, Gino Conti and Rennie Bouchard, hit Solly's jewelry store last night and took at least 100,000 in diamonds and some other pieces. That's too bad, Solly. Haven't I always made you a deal? Solly asks. That necklace for your gumar. I didn't rob your store, Solly, which Peter thinks is technically true. Peter, please, Solly says. Do not treat me like a child. I was in business before you knew what business was. Solly has a few strands of white hair that remind Peter he needs to stop at Rite Aid for dental floss. He says, you're insured, right? You're gonna make a profit off this thing. These particular pieces weren't insured. If you brought them in from overseas and you didn't declare them, that's not my problem, Peter says. Then he gets to the point. 
Anyway, I thought you were under the Murphy's protection. If you was with us, this wouldn't have happened. I want my rocks back. I want a 12-inch dick, Peter says. I got shorted by an inch. What can I tell you? Solly goes into this whole song and dance. He has to put his sister in a nursing home. His wife has a condition. The roof needs repairing. Basta, Peter snaps. With all due respect. I'm glad to hear you say respect, young Peter Moretti, Solly says, because that's what this is all about. I showed respect to your father. I showed respect to Pasco. They showed respect to me. They showed respect for my business. His voice is shaking. My father is in the joint, Peter says. Pasco is in Florida, and I'm in charge now. I didn't come empty-handed, Solly says. If these pieces are returned, I'll establish the same relationship with you that I had with John. Which was what? Solly lowers his voice. An envelope first Thursday of every month. 30% discount, off wholesale, during the holidays. And of course, if you ever have a special need. It's one of those if moments. If Peter were in a better mood, if Peter had had a second cup of coffee, if Peter had got a chance to look at the sports page, if Chris Palumbo had got his ass out of bed in time to have breakfast with Peter, if Solly's hair didn't for some reason annoy the shit out of Peter this morning, then maybe Peter accepts his offer and none of the horrible shit that follows happens. A lot of ifs people will look back on. None of them matter because Peter says, I have a special need now. Solly smiles. He's going to get his rocks back. Tell me. I have a special need for you to get the fuck out of here, Peter says. You want to see your rocks? I'll let you watch them bounce up and down on my guma's tits while I'm fucking her. Look, just don't piss me off, okay, Solly? It's safer for you that way. Peter's already given one of the pieces to his guma, and he's not about to go in there and tell her she has to take it off her neck. Solly looks at him sadly, shakes his head, gets up and totters out the door. Old Jew, Peter thinks, going back to his paper, lives up John Murphy's ass for 30 years, now he wants to swap me 100K for 30% at Christmas? Fuck that. End of story. Not for Solly, it isn't. He goes home, gets right on the horn to Pasco Ferry down in Florida, and plays Remember When. Remember when you proposed to Mary and you had no money for a decent ring? Remember when your son was in the same position with his fiance? Remember when you needed a contribution for the rides on St. Rocco's Day? Remember when you were running that legislator and needed to wash some money? Remember when... I don't have the Alzheimer's, thank God, Pasco says. What's going on, Solly? Solly tells him about the robbery, tells him about how he was treated by young Peter Moretti. He told me to come watch him fuck his girlfriend. That was out of line, Pasco agrees. He's getting a little tired of the Moretti brothers causing him agita. First it's a war over a damn titty, now it's this. Maybe it's time the Moretti's got taken down a peg or two. I have friends, Solly is saying. Friends in the mayor's office, friends at the precinct houses. I know you do, Solly. I made him a respectful offer, Pasco, Solly says, reflecting the new situation, and he treats me like some Schwarzer he caught with a hand in the till? I won't have it. Solly, do me a favor, Pasco asks. Let me take care of it. Peter's at American Vending when he gets the call from Pasco. Peter, what the hell? Solly Weiss? Peter gets defensive. Technically, he wasn't under our protection, so he was fair game. There's a long silence, then Pasco says like he's real tired. You ever think about making friends instead of enemies? I have a right to earn, Pasco sighs. The ring on my wife's finger. Pasco, with all due respect, Peter cuts him off. You're retired, God bless. Don't stick your nose in. When Peter hangs up, he turns to Paulie and says, That old kike went crying to Pasco, do you believe that? Shit, I should rob him again. Chris Palumbo looks at him. What? Peter asks. Maybe you should return the old guy's shit, Chris says. Sully goes way back with Pasco and all those guys. He's given prices to every cop in town. You might want to show him the respect, Peter. Paulie says, I agree. You agree? Peter says. You want to pay him out of your pocket? No. Then shut the fuck up, Peter says. 
Anyone remember we're in a war here? It costs money. Chris tries again. You really want to piss on Pasco's shoes? Pasco has to be retired, Peter says, or not be retired. I can't run this thing if everyone thinks they can go over my head every time they disagree with one of my rulings. Upstairs to the booth, Paulie says. What? You know, like in football, Paulie says. Instant replay, up in the booth. Yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah, okay, whatever, Chris thinks. But it worries him. The bodies of Gino Conti and Rennie Bouchard are never found. Those two guys are just gone, and everyone knows they aren't coming back, and everyone knows why not. It's not just Conti and Bouchard, which is bad enough, but in the nine days since Peter told Solly Weiss to take a walk, two of his card games have been busted, three bookies have been popped, and every girl has been chased off the streets, all shit the cops would usually have left alone. Solly Weiss has friends, all right. But Peter gets his feet dug in even deeper. Over my dead body. That's not outside the realm of possibility, Chris answers. Come on. As Gino and Rennie, Chris says. Oh, that's right, you can't. That was the Murphys. Bullshit. It's classic Pasco Ferry, Chris thinks. Peter disrespected him and he doesn't whack Peter. He whacks a couple of underlings to teach him a lesson. A lesson Peter better learn before we all get clipped. Peter. I don't want to hear any fucking more about it, Chris, Peter says and walks away from him. So now Chris goes to Sal Antonucci, finds him down in Narragansett looking at a house by the shore just two blocks from the beach. It's more than we can really afford, Sal says, but I can put a big down payment on it. No shit he can put a big down payment. Word is that Sal and his crew did an armored car thing up in Manchester, New Hampshire and scored big. Chris says, it's a buyer's market. I figure I can knock them 20, 30 off the ask, Sal says. He stands back and looks at the house. Never thought we'd be able to do something like this, but... Anyway, Judy and I thought it would be nice for the kids, looking down the road, grandkids. Some place for the family to gather, you know? Otherwise, they scatter, Chris says. What I mean, Sal says. What brings you down here? Because Chris don't do nothing for nothing. He never comes just to shoot the shit. There's always an agenda. This Solly Weiss thing, he says. Sal frowns. You're Peter's consigliere. Did you talk with him? Until I'm blue in the face, Chris answers. He doesn't want to listen. I'm afraid if I bring it up again. Chris leaves it out there. Sal should go make Peter see the light on this one. Peter will listen to him because Sal's been doing most of the heavy lifting in the thing with the Murphys, and Peter needs Sal to keep doing what he's doing, especially with Giordo gone. Sal takes the bait like Chris knew he would. I'm not afraid of Peter, Sal says. I'll talk to him. What do you think about the house? I don't know, it's a lot of money. Interest rates being what they are, Chris says. I don't see how you can afford not to. Sal goes to see Peter. Give the rocks back before we all end up in a landfill. What, you giving me orders now? Peter asks. I'm the boss of this family. Good. We can put that on your fucking headstone, Sal says. I'm not giving you orders, but shit. Shit what? Forget it. No, Sal, Peter says, pushing it. You got something on your chest? Get it the fuck off. Okay, fine, Sal says. You and Paulie sit in here in your office drinking coffee, eating donuts, while it's me and my crew doing all the work. And now we got two guys dead because you don't want to give back something you shouldn't have in the first place. You do not tell me what I should, shouldn't have. Guys, come on, Chris says. Yeah? Sal asks, standing up from the table. What would you have, Peter, if my crew and me weren't out there getting it for you? You have who gots. Paulie says, you are talking to the boss. Of this family, Sal interrupts. Yeah, I heard. So maybe he should start acting like the boss of this family and do what's best for this family and not just the Moretti brothers. Cocksucker, Paulie says. Come on, bring it, Sal says. Guys, Chris steps in between them. Even Frankie V gets up from his chair and steps in to calm things down. You want me to give the jewelry back? Peter says. Fine, I'll give it back. Good, Sal says, settling down a little. But you're going to kick to me on that Manchester job, Peter says. What? You think I didn't know about that? Peter asks. You think I wouldn't find out? That's my fucking money. What? Peter asks, I'm supposed to walk away empty-handed? 
Everyone eats but Peter Moretti? Fuck that. You should have been kicking to me from moment one, 50%. I was going to let it slide, but if we're going to play by the rules now, we're all going to play by the rules. I want it all now, not 50, 100. A tax for not doing the right thing in the first place. Sal turns to Chris. You believe this fucking guy? Chris shakes his head. He's the boss, Sal. He's within his rights here. Sal's hands flex like he's ready to go. Frankie V reaches inside his jacket for his piece just in case. But Sal just slowly nods, then looks at Peter and says, Fine, you got it. You want the money, you got it, you greedy fuck. But take a good look at this face, Peter, because it's the last time you'll see it. What do you mean? I'm out of your war, Sal says. Me and my crew. I don't even know why I got in it in the first place. The Murphys never did anything to me. I never had a beef with them. I got in out of loyalty to you, but loyalty is a two-way street, like respect. You want it, you have to give it. You took an oath, Peter says. It's for you to show respect and loyalty to me. I have, Sal yells. I'm going to hell for the shit I've done for you. I'm going to hell, Peter. What more do you fucking want? Go ahead, Peter says. Run away, you're scared. You're waiting for me to beg you to stay? Don't hold your breath. Who needs you? We do, Chris thinks. But he doesn't say it. Sal, he smiles at Peter, nods, and walks out. Make sure you get that money, Peter says to Chris. Thanks for taking my back, Sal says to Chris when the consigliere comes for the money. Sal, you're a two-faced son of a bitch, you know that? Sal, you can't just walk away. No? Sal asks. Who's going to come after me, you, Chris? Chris doesn't say anything. What I thought. Tony comes out of the back room with a duffel bag and hands it to Chris. That was my house, Sal says. The house I showed you for my grandkids. I'm sorry, Sal. Between you and me, Sal says, one of these days I'm going to put that motherfucker in the dirt. Chris doesn't have to ask which motherfucker he means. 21. Danny lets go of the metal bar and steps forward. Hurts like a son of a bitch, but it's a good hurt because if he can put any weight on the left leg, it means his hip is healing. He's still a little afraid, though, that he's going to hear some awful snap and the hip joint is going to come popping out of his skin. By the time he makes it all the way down the length of the bar without grabbing it to balance, he's tired and sweating hard. Ten whole feet, he thinks reminding himself that it's progress. Also reminds himself that he's an outpatient now. After three grueling weeks, they let him leave the clinic and move to the nearby residence inn with Terry, with Madeline staying in a room down the hall. His wife and his mother have become as thick as thieves. They have long days on their hands while he's doing his rehab, and they go shopping, go to lunch, go to the movies. Danny don't like it. What do you want me to do? Terry asked when he brought it up. Sit in the room all day, watch TV? No. Well? Danny didn't have an answer. She's nice, Terry said. We have fun. Good. He means it, sort of. It's good for her to have company and also to be away from her family and Dogtown with everything that's happening. Danny follows the war in the papers and on TV. The media loves it. They haven't had a full-out gang war to cover in years, and it makes for great headlines and photos. Film at 11. Readers and viewers following it like they'd follow baseball. Get up in the morning to read the box scores. Dante Del Monte, one of Paulie's crew, shot in his car after making a collection in South Providence. And two more of Moretti's guys, Gino Conti and Rennie Bouchard, are gone. Although it's Pasco who's reputed to have given the order. Which is very interesting, Danny thinks. Maybe Pasco's decided it was a mistake to give Peter the top job. Maybe he's looking around. If that's the case, there might be a possibility of making a favorable piece. What he doesn't get in the papers, Jimmy Mack fills him in on. Jimmy comes up about once a week, brings him all the inside news. Now he watches Danny take his first tentative steps. He hands Danny his cane and they go down to the little cafeteria. Sal Antonucci and Peter are at odds, Jimmy says then tells him about the shit that followed the Sally Weiss job. Sal says he's going to sit this one out. Shit, Danny thinks, that's big fucking news. 
Maybe they can do better than Sal just taking a knee. Maybe get Sal in the game on their side. The offer would be simple. Hey, Sal, if you decide to go up against the Moretti's, we'll back you. Danny thinks a few moves ahead. Sal's nowhere near as smart as Peter Moretti, never mind Chris Palumbo. If Sal took the throne from the Moretti's, he'd be easy to manipulate, especially if we're the ones who helped him take the big chair. Where does Chris come down on it, I wonder? Danny muses. Chris will go with the winner, Jimmy says. But the word we're getting is that Sal's wicked pissed with Chris for taking Peter's side on this thing. Pissed enough to do something about it? What are you thinking? What Danny's thinking is that Chris is Peter's brains. Without him, it would be just a matter of time before the Morettis do something fatally stupid. Danny says, get word to Sal that if he decides to go for the corner office, we'll back him. If he takes the crown on Monday, we make peace on Tuesday. He killed three of our friends, Danny. I know, Danny says. But he also knows that at the end of the day, you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. Let the dead bury the dead. Shouldn't we run this past John or Pat first? Jimmy asks. Yeah, probably, Danny thinks. But he also thinks he wants to be the one to make a difference, maybe get taken seriously. Let's wait and see how it goes first. Then we'll bring them in. Jimmy asks, how do we get to Sal? Tony Romano, Danny says. Him and Sal are joined at the fucking hip. If Sal is interested, great. If not, no real harm done. Neither the Murphys nor Sal would lose face. And if Sal says no, Jimmy asks. Danny's ahead of it. We work it the other way. We make the approach to Chris. Maybe he's tired of cleaning up the Moretti's messes. Maybe he wants to be the number one guy. Jimmy grins. What? Danny asks. When did you start thinking like a boss? I got no ambitions, Danny says. Except we all survive this thing. Sal Antonucci pulls his pants up, zips his fly, and buckles his belt. Sits back down on the bed to put his shoes on. Tony's still naked. Just lies there on top of the bed, his body stretched out. No shame or nothing. He's a beautiful fucking man, Sal thinks. By the way, Tony says, Jimmy Mack came to see me. By the way, Sal says, that's kind of big for by the way. Why didn't you tell me this right off? Tony grins. I had other things on my mind, bigger things. What did he want? You, Tony says. Sal smiles down at him. I'm taken. I know. Tony says, clasping his hand and then letting go. He wanted me to sound you out. About what? Hitching your car to the Murphys. Sal bends down to tie his laces. Oh shit, what did he say? Just that Danny Ryan would be open to talking. Sal runs it through. Ryan speaks for the Murphys. It doesn't take a fucking genius to figure out their move. I join an alliance against the Moretti's, we put Peter and Paul at the bottom of the Narragansett Bay. I take over and it's back to business the way it used to be. But holy fuck, whacking the Morettis? You'd have to get the nod from Boston and New York. Never mind the old man down in Florida. Christ, would Pasco give his okay? Peter really jerked his chain on the Sally Weiss thing, but Conti and Bouchard picked up the tab for that. Still, what do you think? He asks Tony. Tony says, I think it's worth checking out. So do I, Sal thinks. He finishes lacing his shoes and sits back up. A lot of spade work to be done, though, a lot of pipe to be laid. And even that's dangerous. Someone will have to approach Pasco, sound them out. And even just doing that could get them all killed. Pasco don't like what he's hearing. But if he does, Pasco takes care of Boston and New York. You are the balance of power now, Tony says. The Murphys are coming to you. Peter will have to come back to you sooner or later. It's really a matter of taking the best offer. But Peter won't offer me what the Murphys are, Sal thinks. His position. The safe move would be to go back with Peter, finish off the Irish, and then deal with Peter later. The gutsier move would be to join the Murphys, get rid of the Morettis, and then put the Irish back in their place. 
The worst thing, Tony says, would be if the Murphys won without you. Then you're fucked. Out in the cold, Sal thinks. Can they win? He asks. Outmanned, outgunned, Danny Ryan on the sidelines. With us on their side, maybe, Tony says. The balance of power. The balance of power, Tony smiles. I can't take a chance being seen with Pat, Sal says. Not until all the ducks are in a row. If we have a meet, it will be you. You good with that? Of course. Go back to Jimmy, Sal says. Tell him I might be interested in sitting down, but not before certain roads are open in Florida. This works out, you're my consigliere. He looks down at Tony, who's still lying there, the lazy fuck that he is. The lazy, beautiful fuck. Jesus, Sal says. What? If my wife, my kids. You don't think Judy already knows? Tony asks. Hey, I give it to her good. She knows, Tony says. She just doesn't want to say. Other guys have their gumas, Tony bristles. I'm not your fucking guma. I know, I didn't mean. Sal gets up, puts on his coat, goes out the door. 22. Her perfume precedes her into the room. Danny, resting after his rehab session, smells her before he sees her. Madeline sweeps into the clinic looking all cool and lovely, and it just pisses him off. I want you to talk to somebody, she says. Who? Oh. He's out in the parking lot, she says. Danny, please, for your family's sake, just hear him out. He follows her out to where a car is parked. Madeline opens the passenger door for him and says, Just keep an open mind, Danny, please. Then she's gone. The guy in the car says, Danny, I'm Philip Jardine, FBI. No shit, Danny thinks. Jardine looks like FBI because the feds have a look. Short hair, dull ties, bland wasp faces. This fucking Jardine fits the bill. Razor cut blonde hair, clear blue eyes, a real Eagle Scout. Except Danny knows the fed Eagle Scouts get badges in throat cutting but he gets into the car. Because if someone he knows pulls up and sees him talking to someone they don't know, they want to know who and why. Make it quick. I want to help you. Yeah, right, Danny thinks. Famous first words. I want to help you fuck your friends, become a rat, go into the witness protection program and sell chicken feed and east bum fuck somewhere. What feds mean by I want to help you is I want to help you help me. Danny knows the federal pitch. Friendship? Fuck friendship. I know you were boys together and all that happy crap, but now it's time for you to grow the fuck up. You have kids, you want them to know their father? Or you want to see them once a month over a metal table, you're not allowed to touch them. How about the wife? No offense, but is she going to wait? How long is she going to toss and turn in an empty bed before she finds a new man she teaches your kids to call uncle? Help me do what? Danny asks. Have a life, Jardine answers. I have one. For how much longer, Jardine asks. You're losing the war. You know it, I know it. Everyone on the street knows it's just a matter of time. You have a wife and a kid on the way. A family that loves you. Danny feels a flash of anger. What do you know about my family? Jardine shrugged. If you love them and you have a chance to give them a life, you'll take it. What, you're offering me that chance? That's right, Jardine says. You finish your therapy up here and you go. You and Terry and the baby she's carrying. Into the program, Jardine nods. But I'd have to testify against my friends, Danny says. Your friends, Jardine asks. Which ones? The Morettis? They want you dead. The Murphys? You think you're one of them? One of the family? You're not. They may let you eat at their table, but they'll never give you your own chair. Fuck that, no. No way, no fucking way in hell he's testifying against his friends, against Pat or even John. Jardine smiles. I told your mother that's what you'd say. She should have listened to you, Danny says, fumbling with his cane, reaching for the door handle. There's a middle way, Jardine says. 
you'll give me a little information now and then. If a hit's planned, maybe you tip me off. Just trying to keep the body count down here, Danny. And you do what for me? Things go south, Jardine says. The bureau steps up, goes to bat for you. In court, in judges' chambers, in the DA's office, we take care of our own. If we were to hear about a threat to you, we'd give you the word. You're not there when the event is supposed to go off. That's what you really want, Danny thinks. You want to snitch and play on the streets. You made the program offer to keep my mother's fuck buddies happy, but you'd really rather have me out there as long as I'm useful. Soon as I'm not, fuck me. The FBI uses snitches like Kleenex, jerks off on them, tosses them away. If a snitch gets whacked, it's like, oops, next. Don't answer now, Jardine says. Think about it. Think about go fucking yourself. That's not the answer to your problems, Danny. The fuck you know, Danny thinks, about my problems. Madeline's waiting for him in the lobby. You have a family to think about. You should talk. I'm here now. Yeah, now. 27 years too late. Where will you be tomorrow? That isn't the question, Danny, she says. The question is where will you be tomorrow? Where will Terry be? Where will your child be? They'll be with me. She tries a different tack. You could have a life somewhere. I have a life here. What life, she asks. You're a shift boss on the docks and a collector for the Murphys. And you would be a murderer except that you screwed it up. If we're being honest here, that's what you are. At least I'm not a whore, Danny says. He sees the hurt in her eyes. Sees that he hit his target, but can't help adding. If we're being, you know, honest here. I've done the best I could with the cards I was dealt, Madeline says. It sounds practiced to him, like a line she's told herself a thousand times, waking up beside men she didn't love. And I could say the same thing, Danny thinks. I've done the best I could with the cards you handed me. So this is what you want? She asks incredulously. You want to stay in Dogtown? It's where you left me. Where you left me. If you want me to go away, I'll go away. She walks past him to the door, then turns around. But don't hurt your family because you hate me. He's back at Residence Inn, half asleep a couple of hours later when he hears Terry come in, set some bags on the counter, and walk into the bedroom. How was rehab? She asked. Good, I walked. Really? Yeah, Danny says. Your husband's a two-year-old. She looks down at him and says, I don't think a two-year-old has that. I must have been dreaming. It better have been about me, she says, unzipping his fly. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah, she asks. Was I doing this to you? Jesus, Terry. Or this? Her mouth is warm and wet. Her tongue flicks. He knows he ain't gonna last long. Sensing this, she stops and starts to straddle him. Can you do this? He asks. I don't want to hurt you or the baby. It would feel good, she says. But will it hurt you? You're not that heavy. Are you kidding? I'm a whale. I don't know if I can. I'll do the work. Terry moves on him with surprising grace, rocks back and forth, closes her eyes and takes her pleasure. It's been a long time. He struggles to hold back, but when he hears her come, feels her grip him, he lets go. She rolls off him carefully, lies on her back and falls asleep. Danny don't. Usually he does, but he has too much on his mind. A potential deal with Sal, or maybe Chris, and an end to the war. Then there's Jardine's offer, or offers, plural. Become a rat, go into the program, or become a snitch, an informant. He listens to Terry breathe and for the first time really considers it. Maybe I do owe that to her, to the baby in her belly. A fresh start somewhere, a legit job. She'd be torn because it would mean turning on her family but on the other hand, she'd be relieved to be safe. But could I do it? 
I could flip on John, but on Pat? He chews on it, and somehow it all gets mixed in with his mother's abandonment of him and his dad. It becomes all about Dogtown and loyalty and all that shit, and it just goes sideways, like a boat drifting into the rocks. 23. Peter Moretti has to eat serious rations of shit. He knows he's starting to lose the war and has to make moves to turn things around. Painful, humiliating moves. First, he had to give Solly Weiss his stones back, and the old prick was so sanctimonious about it, Peter would have liked to shoot him in the face. But he had to go, hat in hand, apologize, and hand over the stones. Not before he had to take that necklace off his guma's neck, which didn't exactly make her horny for him. That was bad enough, but then he had to extend a hand to Sal Antonucci, because without Sal and his crew, the war with the Murphys was swirling the toilet. Truth was, he needed Sal. He needed Tony. But Peter couldn't go himself. He just couldn't make himself do it, so he sent Chris. Chris argued against sending anyone to see Sal. It's a mistake. He's an egotistical motherfucker in the first place. And now we go begging him? It will only make his head swell up more. Anyway, believe me, he can't help himself. He'll get back in the fight. Yeah, but on which side? Peter asked. They sit down across a table at Fury's, Chris and Frankie V on the one side, Sal and Tony on the other. Technically, Sal is the host, even though Chris asked for the meeting, because this is his turf and the restaurant is under his protection. So Sal orders a good bottle of wine, sips it for approval, and pours a glass for Chris. Chris gets right down to it. Peter is prepared to give you back the tax he took from the Manchester thing. Why? Sal asks. Why is that? Come on, Sal, you going to make me suck your dick? I promise I won't come in your mouth. Peter knows he was wrong, Chris says. He knows that and he's sorry and he wants to make amends. Then why isn't he here? Sal asks. I advised him not to, Chris answers. If he comes in person and you spurn his overture, he loses enormous face, you know that. If we can come to some kind of arrangement here tonight, if I can take that back to Peter... I know he'll be eager to come over himself. I could hardly hold him back tonight. But you managed, Tony says. Chris looks at Sal. He talk for you now? He's free to speak his mind, Sal says. And let's be honest, Peter didn't have no change of heart. He didn't wake up one morning and it hit him. I was a dick to Sal. You're losing the war. You need me and my crew. Chris doesn't answer, but he dips his head in a way that says this is the case. Always the fucking diplomat, Sal thinks. You could take this money, buy your house, Chris says, and then sees from the look on Sal's face that this was a mistake. The house got sold, Sal says, his voice low and angry. There are other houses, Chris says, trying to recover. Not like that one, Sal says. I wasn't finished, Chris says. You come back, after this thing is over, you get the Longshoremen's Union. It's big, far more than the Manchester job was worth. A big chunk of the Murphy business, a big piece of Moretti's potential income. It's a real sacrifice by Peter, a real offer. I don't want it, Sal says. What? Frankie V asks. He sure as shit wants it. I've been thinking. Sal says, about this thing of ours. It's changed, not like the old days. There used to be rules. Now, Peter can come in and jerk my money from me just like that? What says he couldn't do it again? He gives me the union? Fuck that, I took the union for him. He gives me shit. And then he can just pull it away with the other hand when he feels like it? He lets that sit in the air for a second, then says, Nah, I have businesses. The restaurant, the parking lot, the linen, my family eats. Maybe I just sit back now, be content with that. Because I'll tell you, looking around the last few years, everyone ends up dead or in the joint. I'm thinking of dying at home. Frankie V goes old school. That's not how it works. You took an oath until you die. Who's going to enforce that, Frankie? Sal asks. You? 
Frankie turns to Chris. The fuck we wasting our breath for? He doesn't give a shit his friends are getting killed. His family eats, right? Fuck this, I'm out of here. Chris looks across the table at Sal. So what shall I tell Peter? Finish your drink, Sal says. Then take Peter's money, his union, and his saris, and tell him he can stick them up his ass. What happens when the Murphys come for you, Sal? Why should they come for me? I wouldn't leave you on the board. Well, thanks for telling me that, thinks Sal. If I don't come back into the fold, you're gonna take me out. But he says, they come after me, I'll deal with them. Until then, I got nothing against the two of you. Buy a little time, maybe get them debating if they really wanna go up against them. When they go out the door, Sal says, the next time they come, they're coming heavy. Chris will ask for a sit down just between me and him. Frankie V will be there to take me out. Then you'll be next, Tony asks. So what do you want to do? Make the meeting with Murphy, Sal says. Tell him I'll take the deal. Go now. Because it's urgent. Soon as Peter gets his no answer, he's going to answer back, and it ain't going to be with words. I don't have my car, Tony says. Take mine. Jimmy Mack drives Danny over to the Glock. When Danny walks back in, he isn't using the cane at all. He limps a little, but otherwise you wouldn't know that Steve Giordo shot the shit out of him. Everyone in the neighborhood knows it, though. Everyone knows that Danny Ryan was the bait in the botched hit on Liam. That the mother had swept in and pulled him out of the shit. That this sent his father on a bender of epic proportions. Marty Ryan hitting the bottle like a speed bag. I'll wait out here. Jimmy says. The Glock is decorated for Christmas. Well, as much as it ever is. A scraggly fake tree with a few bulbs and tinsel that looks like it's left over from World War II. The sound system squeaks some Irish band doing Santa Claus is Coming to Town, which Danny thinks is a really bad idea. John and Pat are in the back room. Pat comes up and wraps his arms around Danny. I'm sorry I didn't come up and see you more, Danny says. Pat, we need to talk. They go off to a booth. Danny tells him about the potential deal with Sal. You did that on your own boot? Pat asked. I wish you'd checked with me first. I gotta check with you, Pat? Danny asks. He knew he should have, and the old him would have. But there's something about getting shot that makes him want to be his own man. With something like that, yeah. It's a chance to end this thing, put it to bed, Danny says. If Sal and his crew come over to us... Peter's going to ask for peace, especially if Pasco isn't backing him anymore. He patched up that beef with Pasco. He hasn't patched it up with Sal, Danny says. We can end this war, Pat. Stop the bloodshed. Pat shakes his head. Italians are Italians. End of the day, they believe in blood. End of the day, they're always going to side with each other. Anyway, it's too late. You don't have to worry about Sal Antonucci anymore. What are you talking about? Nothing you need to know. Nothing I need to know, Danny asks. Shit, pal, I took a bullet for you. Now I'm Johnny Jerkoff? Because what, my last name isn't Murphy? I'm just protecting you, Danny, Pat says. You can't testify about what you don't know. Open yourself up to charges. You don't trust me. I trust you. Pat says, you're my brother, but this thing with Sal, I wish you hadn't done that. Things are already in motion. I sent a message to the man, Pat. And you shouldn't have, Pat says. You look tired, Danny. You shouldn't push it. Go home, get some rest. Dismissed, Danny thinks. Out of the back room. Come on, Danny says. Jimmy sets his beard down. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. They go out on the street. The car comes at them fast. Roars up the street and Danny doesn't hesitate. Doesn't stop to think or try to see who's behind the wheel. He just pulls his gun and empties it into the windshield. The car goes out of control and slams into the back of a delivery truck parked along the sidewalk. Danny and Jimmy get the hell out of there. Smash Danny's gun up and leave parts of it in the river, in a dumpster, in a ditch. Sal looks out the window, watches Tony walk to the car. 
He's a beautiful creature, Sal thinks. A beautiful fucking creature. Like a noble racehorse. Sleek, muscled, and proud of his strength. Tony opens the door and gets into the front seat. He looks out the window, sees Sal looking, smiles, pleased to be watched, his teeth white as new snow, and turns the key. The car erupts in flame. Sal sees Tony open the door and lurch, screaming out into the street. He's on fire, arms in front of him like a blind man. He takes two steps, then twirls, then falls. The irony is that Tony had always said he wanted to be cremated when his time came, and the joke, although no one repeats it to Sal, is that he sure as shit was. Anyway, they put what's left of him in an urn and they have a mass and a memorial service and a reception that Sal springs for. But Sal, he's inconsolable. Peter, he's just happy that Pat Murphy accomplished what he couldn't, bringing Sal back into the Moretti fold. It doesn't happen right away. Sal goes into a deep depression, just closes the door to his den and won't come out. Peter Moretti comes over personally with a suitcase of cash, the tax from the Manchester job, but Sal won't even see him. Peter leaves the money with Sal's wife and takes off. Car bombs? Danny yells in the back room of the Glock. That's who we are now? Jesus, Pat, what if his wife and kids were in the car? They weren't, Pat says, but he knows that he's taken things to a place they shouldn't have gone. Danny's furious. They had Sal out of the war, maybe even ready to come over to their side, and now it's a dead solid lock he'll come back in with the Morettis. Fucking Irish, always looking forward to our next defeat. We can't get out of our own way. That old saying, if it was raining soup, the Irish would run outside with forks. Pretty much what happens now. Danny would think about it in years to come. The what if of it. What if Tony had his own car with him? What if Danny could have persuaded Pat to sit down with Sal? But none of that happened. God's way of fucking with you. The Providence cops pick Danny up, put him in the back seat of their unmarked car. Viola slides in beside him and asks, What do you know about the car bombing? Nothing. Same old Danny Ryan, O'Neill says from the driver's seat. He never knows nothing. I suppose you don't know nothing about those two guys gunned down in their car the other day either. The DeSalvo brothers? I only know they tried to kill me first, Danny thinks. He doesn't answer. Tony Romano burned to death, Viola says to Danny. He's angry. You fucking donkeys did that. I don't know anything about it. You burned to death in the chair too, Viola says. Did you know that? I'd like to put you there. I'd flip the fucking switch myself. We done here? For now, Viola says. Danny opens the door and gets out. Pasco calls. Danny is surprised when the phone rings and he hears the old man's voice. Jesus Christ, Danny, what the hell is going on up there? I don't know, Pasco. We can't be having this shit. Pasco says. Cars blowing up? You know what kind of heat this is gonna bring down? There's nothing I can do to stop it. Danny knows. Someone getting whacked is one thing. The public almost expects it. But car bombs? Where innocent people could get hurt? That's another story. That's Northern Irish shit and the public isn't going to put up with it. I don't want to know who did it, Pasco says. Everyone knows who did it, Danny thinks. You know how Sal is going to react to this? Pasco asks. He's going to go crazy and we can't have that. We have to keep this thing contained. Yeah, how's that going to happen? Danny wonders. Pasco tells him. What I want you to do, Pasco says, is I want you to go to Sal and tell him that you and the Murphys had nothing to do with it. He ain't going to believe that. Lie through your ass, Pasco says. Make him believe you. He's more likely to shoot me. Are you afraid, Danny? Pasco asks. God damn right I am, Danny thinks. You know, Sal, when he gets in a killing frame of mind, whoever is in front of him gets killed. I don't want that to be me. 
You're the only one on your side of this thing that can make the approach, Pasco says. Sal respects you. He hates me, but he respects you, Pasco says. I'm expecting Marty Ryan's son to do this. So that's that. What Pasco Ferry expects, Pasco Ferry gets. So Danny drives down to Narragansett, parks down the block and across the street from Sal's house, and waits. Word is that Sal's been holed up grieving, but he has to emerge sooner or later. The fog comes in first. When a heavy mist blows in off the ocean here, it can arrive in a hurry. One second it's a clear dusk, the next it's a silver blanket thrown over everything. The temperature drops as suddenly, so it's cold and thick when Danny sees Sal come out of the house, carrying something under his arm. Danny gives him some space, then gets out of the car and follows him three blocks down to the ocean. A seawall runs above Narragansett Beach for most of its length. A sidewalk runs along the wall, popular in the summer but deserted now in the cold and fog, except for Sal. He's walking in the opposite direction from the towers, the remnants of a casino that stood here in the 1880s when the town was a thriving resort for the rich people coming up from New York. The two towers, each with a shingled conical peak, stand on either side of Ocean Road. An arched walkway with a central cupola spans the road. On a clear night, the towers are iconic, but now Danny can barely see them through the fog. He follows Sal, who seems oblivious. Danny doubts it. Sal knows he has a target on his back, knows he dodged a close call with the car bomb. One hand is around the package, the other is in his jacket pocket, and Danny has to assume it's clutching a gun. Sal keeps walking in the direction of Monahan's, a clam shack, closed for the season, that sits on the base of what used to be the Narragansett Pier. Danny feels the pistol he has in his jacket pocket, closes the distance and calls out, Sal! Sal stops, turns around and peers through the fog. Ryan? Danny raises his hands. I come in peace, Sal. Fuck you, peace. I just want to talk. Get away from me, Sal says, before I put one in your head. It wasn't us, Sal, Danny says. I swear to God we had nothing to- Lying motherfucker, Sal says. He takes the gun out of his pocket and points it at Danny. Danny runs. If this were a movie, he'd say something clever or pull his own gun and shoot it out, but it's real life. More critically, it's real death, and Danny takes off as fast as his hip will let him. With a gun pointed at him, threatening to go off with ill intent, his legs feel like telephone poles. They're that stiff and heavy. Then he hears the blast and feels the rush of air whoosh past him as the bullet misses his head. He doesn't think the next one will miss. The killer and Sal will settle him down and he'll take the next shot into Danny's back. So Danny vaults the seawall, drops the five feet or so onto the rocks and almost topples on the seaweed slick stones. But the sea gods are with him and have given him a low tide. He crouches down and presses himself against the wall. Maybe it's Danny's imagination or maybe he can really hear Sal's footsteps stalking him. Danny feels like his pounding heart is going to give him away, but his head knows that the waves hitting rock farther out are making more noise. Still, if Sal sees him, he's a dead man, trapped between the ocean and the wall. Like any Rhode Islander, Danny has spent many hours cursing the fog, been lost in its soup out at sea fishing, terrified that the boat will run against the rocks. He's blessed the lighthouses at Point Judith and Beavertail for cutting through the fog and leading them home. He's been on the highway at night, or worse, on one of the small roads nearer the beach, when he had to open the window and look down to see the yellow line in order to stay on the road. But now he blesses the damn fog pouring in from the ocean. Crouching, hiding, he hears Sal yell, Fuck you, Ryan! Fuck all of yous, you hear me? Danny hears him. He's not tempted to answer, though, to affirm his comprehension or shout defiance. The ocean has saved his life. He's not going to spurn that gift. He waits a good half hour before he dares climb back over the wall. Peering up and down the seawall, he doesn't see Sal. His shoes soaked, Danny sloshes his way back to his car and drives home. 
With the urn containing Tony's ashes in his hand, Sal walks down to the jetty where the old Narragansett pier once stood, opens the urn and tosses the ashes into the offshore wind, and then follows them. Sal Antonucci jumps off the rocks, where every other summer some tourist drowns because he doesn't know better, into the swirling ocean because he wants to die. Nobody is down there in winter. Nobody sees him. The water is killing cold. The sea, hungry, reaches up and takes him. Sal struggles in the waves as he changes his mind and decides that he wants to live. But that's now the ocean's choice, not his. The sea gives back only what it doesn't want. It throws him back and he hangs on to the slick rocks until he has the strength to pull himself up. Decides it's worth living to kill Pat Murphy. Then Liam Murphy. Then Danny Ryan. You gotta get out of town, Danny tells Pat. But Pat won't go, even though John, his mother, even Sheila urge him to leave. Go to New Hampshire, Vermont. Go down to Florida. Just get out of Dogtown. But Pat, the captain of the football team, the hockey team, the basketball team, Pat, the born leader, won't go. Then lay low, Danny tells him. Keep your head down and on a swivel. Tells him this even as he knows it won't do any good. Pat has a death wish now. It's in his blood, the Irish martyr thing. They walk to death like it's a beautiful woman. Pam comes to the door. Where's your useless husband? Pat asks. In the bedroom, she says, jutting her chin toward the back. Fucking Liam, Pat thinks, still hiding. Well, that's going to come to a screeching halt. I know what you think of me, Pam says. Do you? Same thing I think about myself, she says. I'm a whore. I never said that. No, I did, she says. I'm a whore. I'm the bitch that caused all of this. I wish I'd never come here. I wish I'd never met him. That makes two of us, Pat thinks. No, that makes all of us. You want to come in? She asks. Liam walks out of the bedroom, notching his belt, his hair disheveled. He's barefoot and he hasn't shaved in a couple of days. Seeing his brother, he says, To what do I owe the honor? Go fuck yourself. These days I pretty much have to. Liam glances at Pam and smirks. He walks over to the kitchen counter, picks up a dirty glass, pours in two fingers of scotch and holds it up to Pat. Slancha. Pat's in no mood. You started all this, baby brother. It's time you got back into the game. That's funny, Liam says. My dear little wifey here was just saying the same thing. Sal will come back into the war now, Pat says. He'll hit back for the Morettis. We could use more boots on the ground and it would be good for the guys to see you out front. You ought to feel, Commander, Liam says. Just tell me where to go and I'll march. You could start by showing up at the Glock. Yeah, Liam says. He finishes his drink. Just let me get my shoes on, my gear, and I'll drive right down. Shave first. Yes, sir. Liam salutes him, sets the glass down, waves behind him, and walks back into the bedroom. You want a drink or something? Pam asks Pat. No, thanks, Pat says. I need to go see my wife. Hurry this guy along, huh? Don't let him go back to bed. You want me to tell him I won't fuck him unless he goes out and pretends to be a man? Pam asks, sort of Lysistrata in reverse. I don't know what that means, Pat says. Doesn't matter, Pam says. Hey, Pat, for whatever it's worth, I'm sorry. Yeah, Pat says. We're all sorry. So what? Sheila isn't home when he gets there. There's a note on the kitchen table that she's gone grocery shopping and taken the baby with her. Pat goes to find her, but when he gets out there, she's walking back up the street pushing a stroller. Pat reaches down to lift up his son. The baby screams so loud it's funny, and both Pat and Sheila laugh. He doesn't know you. Sheila says. I haven't been around enough, Pat says, handing the boy back to her. Sheila doesn't argue with him. She holds the baby to her chest, 
makes cooing noises and the crying stops. It'll be over soon, Pat says. He sees tears well up in her eyes. Strong Sheila, tough Sheila, hard ass Sheila, it's wearing her down all this. Then it comes out. Pat, let's leave, get out of here. I can't do that, Sheil, Pat says. I have to think about the rest of the guys. You think more about them than your own family? She asks. Your own wife? If you won't think about me, think about your son. Do you want Johnny to grow up without a father? No, of course not. Well? Nothing's gonna happen to me. What, because you're invulnerable? She asks. You're the man of steel, leap tall, build.